Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, the great Brian Last here, you there, and we are back with another of our very popular omnibuses here during omnibus season, and this one is a big one, a long one, a multiple-part edition of the omnibus. CM Punk in AEW Volume 2, Year 2. And of course, joining me, the leader of the cult of Cornette, Mr. Jim Cornette. How are you, Brian? I am ready to go. You know how I am? No. I'm just great. But anyway, it is the bus season, and boy, have we got a long ride. This is a cross-country one, because we wanted to go back, and we're starting right as, uh, this is volume two of Punk's Adventures in Lilliput. We start right about the time he came back to to uh, to brawl out. No, before that, Rocky Three. Well, let's see. He was coming back for the brawl out. Well, he and, didn't come uh, back for the brawl out. The brawl out just happened to happen. We don't well, want to yes, get him I, sued. You know, all right. But anyway, <laughs> nevertheless, we're sp we're splitting hairs here. He, that's when he came back, and then we end up when A Steel was fired uh, after this, uh, you know, this whole episodic thing took place, and because we present it in its chronological order and we didn't want to leave anything out. Not only do we not want to mislead any of the cult of Cornet out there listening, but also we want to show who were the prognosticators and who were the bullshitters, who were the truth tellers and who were the verbal fellatio artists that were characterizing all of these events with what we know now in the present modern day, almost 2024. So that's why we're doing it all in order everything that we said and the people can decide who knew what to fuck they were talking about. That's right. Again, a lot of things to cover here. This is year two. It is CM Punk's return from injury. It is the John Moxley match, which we would later learn a lot more about. It is brawl out. It is a steal debuting in a promo on TV and then brawl out. And we will end this omnibus with a steal being fired by AEW after CM Punk was fired by AEW, and that's where we are today. CM Punk, sad and down and out, looking for work. We don't know what'll happen to this poor guy. Poor fella. But this is now our Omnibus special, Jim Cornette's Omnibus, CM Punk and AEW Volume 2, Year 2. And finally, Jericho gets the belt, the title belt, and they hold Moxley up. And they hold Moxley up. And they hold Moxley up because the sound man's trying to find that button. And finally, like Mussolini, thank fuck he's back. Because if I had to watch any more of these shows without him, I was going to crack. Here comes Punk. And for 45 seconds, again, we were transported back to a wrestling program. Because here comes CM Punk, the returning champion, the conquering hero. He's running down the ramp. The people are blowing. It's a big pop. He makes a big comeback. All the heels bump for him. It's laid out perfectly. Old Cool Hand Luke meets him in the entranceway. One shot and a big bump. And Sammy tries to plunge over the ropes. And Punk sidesteps him and grabs him and shovels him into the stairs. Rolls into the ring, backdrops Hager over the top, lays waste to with the other guy with the fat face or whoever the fuck it was, and then Jericho takes two bumps and he bails out. So he went up the pecking order, and finally Jericho's gone, and Punk rules the ring, and the heels are backpedaling, and that part was great. It was executed well, it was laid out well, it got a pop. It got the people up after all this dreariness. And then there's the little matter of the current interim champion sitting in the fucking ring. And except I don't understand why Moxley was, while Punk was keeping an eye on the heels, Moxley is behind Punk, not looking at Punk, but acknowledging that he knows Punk is behind him and making faces of some dude, like, yeah, I know what's going on, whatever, like, uh, uh, uh. 
I think he was trying to kill the deal. I don't think he likes having, I think since Moxley believes he's a blood drinking vampire and a goddamn crazy pain freak lunatic. I will come to your house and there'll be glass and I'll, blood I'll, everywhere. Yeah. I'll come to your house and stick thumbtacks in your elbow. I don't think he liked the idea of being saved by a bigger star that's more popular and draws more money and is more accomplished performer because he was making faces behind it. And that didn't fucking set well to me because it looked like he was diminishing or making mockery of what was going on instead of trying to get it over. But nevertheless, he stands up, he turns around, they go face to face, Punk and Plumber Moxley, and Moxley gives Punk the finger in his face and walks off. If we hadn't seen six or seven other fingers on this show alone from Moxley and others, it would have meant something. But as it was, the end of the show was Moxley slunk off to snake a drain and Punk got a standing ovation in the crowd who is now has reason to live because Punk is back on television. Your thoughts on this whole deal, Brian Last? The match was really something, and I want to ask you a question after we're done to a review that relates to all this, but, you know, it started with a gruesome match and it ended with a gruesome match. I don't know if CM Punk saved... There's another thing. Why in the world would they do the fucking blood in the first segment when they knew they were going to have, even though part of the blood in the last segment, the world title match wasn't planned, they still had some planned. Why the fuck? Why can they not control themselves? I, I, I'm i just going to say one more thing, and I'll let you have it. I'll be goddamned if I was going to, if there was a, a wrestling show in history where another manager on the card was going to bleed, I'll be goddamned if I would have got juice. I mean, I don't understand why they, why they don't have a problem with going out there and cutting themselves open when somebody else has already done it, so it doesn't even mean anything. Go ahead. What the fuck? I don't know if CM Punk saved Moxley from Jericho as much as he saved all of us from this show. When he came out there, the pop, the reaction, it was like a real star has finally returned to the show. Based on the way they left the ring, it makes me wonder if they're setting up Moxley and Claudio and that group as heels which can only be better than them as baby faces. I'm glad Danielson's not there because at least he's not a part of their thing. Is he hurt again or where was he? I think they're getting over that he got choked out by Garcia, right? He's going to speak on the Friday show. Oh, good God. That should be best left never spoken of again to where people would forget it. Punk being back makes me look forward to hearing what he's going to say next week on the show, thinking he probably is going to have to say something. FTR appearing on the show randomly again this week makes me hopeful that maybe they'll appear randomly next week as well. <laughs> but there's been a lot of crap on these shows. It's been a rough slog for a while now watching AEW TV. Let's get to the, to the uh, other side of the street here, the AEW program this past Wednesday night, because there's big news going on. None of it's on television. Not a lot of big news on TV, but there's big news going on in the company. And uh, there was an element of tip off of that in the first segment on the TV program with uh, our returning champion. Finally, he's back. Luck Mussolini with an annoying hangnail. Here comes Punk straight out of the box. And he's got a live interview and he gets the big CM Punk chance there in Charleston, West Virginia. The, uh, the home of Tudor's Biscuit World, that people are up and they're ready to go. And there was not a lot of time wasted on this, Brian, because he took the microphone, he gave the initial happy talk, connected with the audience, and then sat down cross-legged in the middle of the ring and challenged hangnail Adam Page to a rematch right here, right now. Let's go. And nothing happened. And no music. And Jim Ross is like, do we do we know if Hangman's here? And Punk waits. And nothing happens. And then Punk gets up and says, that's not cowboy shit. That's coward shit. 
And then he says, let me give you some advice that I suggest you take. And that was a very key word. Let me give you some advice that I suggest you take. The apology must be as loud and public as the disrespect. And if anybody else back there has a problem with the champ, come on down. No takers. It was not written in the format for there to be any takers, and nobody got froggy and jumped. Should we talk about the rest of the promo, or should we delve deeper into this now, Brian? What do you think? The punk hangman stuff? Yes. Yeah, because I guess the second part of the promo is a whole different thing, so we should probably, if we're going to talk about it, talk about it here. Okay, so apparently, from what we are now hearing from a variety of sources, including people on Twitter and even Uncle Dave, who we know has the the pipeline over there in that company, a lot of people started out, well, what, what the fuck was that? And they, they heard that Punk went into business for himself, that Paige was never scheduled to come out, that everybody was shocked and amazed that... Uh, that he had said that because nobody knew anything about it. And as well, they were starting to say, well, he's unprofessional for doing that because it buried old hangman, buried Adam Page. But then some more details started coming out, and I started seeing this yesterday on Twitter, and then Uncle Dave has a report on it in this week's Observer, I guess. I'm not going to... They're long sentences with not a lot of punctuation, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but summarizing and the Reader's Digest version is apparently, remember, Brian, when Page and Punk were in the main event of the pay-per-view earlier this year, Punk was about to beat Page and win the title, and they had a live interview on Dynamite, And at the time, we said, what in the fuck was this? Did did they have something that they thought Paige was going to just be great at delivering and and he just melted down and botched it all? Or did he, was he turning heel in the middle of the ring, accusing Punk of, you know, being all of this and that, and we got to protect AEW from you? It was something that, the shit he was saying had no bearing on any of the way that this match or any of these people had been presented, and it was speaking in riddles and one of those deals where the smart fans are going to know, but everybody else thinks this guy's a raving, you know, just gibberish. And we even said, was was he trying to turn heel or did he just not realize he was doing it because he sounded like such a whiny little bitch? Yeah, even the smart fans didn't know. Yeah, well, apparently. That was Paige doing the same thing to Punk. Going off the the beaten path, off the topics that had been discussed in order to take up for his company and his friends and the people who started this revolution because there was also, there was something, Paige did an interview somewhere recently and it was excerpted on Twitter and on the internet where they asked, well, with all of the veterans and the great stars of the past and the, you know, the people who have so much experience in this business, like Jim Ross and Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard and Mark Henry and this guy and that guy, does Paige ask them for advice? And he said, well, they may, uh, yeah. they may give me some advice every once in a while. Yeah, I guess I'll listen. But really, I don't think I need to ask for advice from these people because. I'm part of the movement that started this company and this revolution, and I've, we've done just fine, so do we really need that advice? Yeah, you butterfly jean-wearing dipshit, you really do need the advice, or elsewise, if you'd taken it, you might actually be over now, instead of a whiny little bitch. So he said that, And Punk's verbiage was, let me give you some advice I suggest you take. So apparently, not only does Hangnail tell everybody he doesn't like to take the advice of people that are smarter and more experienced than him, but maybe he hadn't been taking advice from the guy that's trying to get him over working with him because it's not the opposite. I believe I'll paraphrase a line from Mr. Punk. 
Punk didn't have to work with Paige. Paige needed to work with Punk to get in the main event that he deserved. And then if we find out that Paige was doing the same thing that they have accused Mr. Punk of here this week, being unprofessional by going into business for himself. And that was before this was a TV promo where Punk expressed a few opinions and then went on to the meat of the matter, his opponent, John Moxley. When Paige apparently went to business for himself with his inexplicable rambling that he wasn't talented enough to pull off to where anybody would get it. That was before the main event of a pay-per-view. As I recall, that was one of the bigger houses, gates, and overall revenue-producing nights in the history of the company. And this fucking jack-off is out there trying to make up his own shit that he's, let's put it this way, not as he, not only is Adam Page not a lyrical wordsmith, he can barely fucking read the cue cards. So he didn't need to try to be jousting with Punk anyway. And that's why I think Punk looked so confused when he was doing it, because they had to have a plan when they went out there, and it had to make sense, or elsewise they wouldn't have gone out there until it did, as long as Punk was involved. But when old Hangnail bows up and starts doing a bunch of shit that doesn't make any sense, how is Punk that is he going to be unprofessional and say, you know, you just you just said a bunch of shit that I don't understand and you're not supposed to say, so I don't know what to say back to you because you're a fucking idiot. What's he supposed to do? He's trying to sell a pay-per-view. They're lucky enough to have a mainstream wrestling star that hasn't degenerated into a parody of himself doing song and dance routines over dinner and constantly changing his gimmick and latching on to other people to help buoy his sinking career they've got a money generator cm punk and they've got a entitled whiny fragile not susceptible to advice or criticism little cowboy cowboy want to be a cowboy baby with my butterfly jeans and my pink t-shirt cowboy baby they're grading on each other is what we're trying to say and there's no leadership in this company. We've talked about that every week. Tony will not put his foot down because Tony don't have a foot. He's got a couple of chicken feet. He's got claws. So now it's all breaking down. And you got the people who are in the business to do business and make money and get over and or fucking sell tickets or whatever. And you've got people they got in business to take a billionaire's money because they think they're talented for some unknown reason. Somebody has convinced them they know what they're doing and they now want to get all their friends' jobs. And if their friends don't have jobs or jobs that they want them to have, then they get mad and then they hijack the program to petulantly fucking protest. Have I summarized this approximately from what we're hearing now from Uncle Dave and a variety of people about this situation that now has come to a head, but has been simmering for a while. I guess so, and I want to make a statement, so I'm going to just reiterate it for a second. The go-home promo, the face-to-face -face promo before the pay-per-view, where Punk won the AEW championship, Adam Page decided on live TV, with the biggest star in the company opposite him, to whatever you want to say, go off script, even though there's not really a script, but he decided to go into business for himself. He went rogue. He was the rogue cowboy. <laughs> and CM Punk, to his credit, played it off perfectly. I don't understand what you're so mad about, because he didn't understand what was going on at the time. Right. We're now led to believe, we'll talk about this in a little bit, that it was apparently Adam Page taking up for Colt Cabana. <laughs> But let me ask you this, a, a bigger thing I'm thinking, and maybe I'm just thinking as a businessman here, even though I'm not a promoter, but Adam Page, right before this big pay-per-view, does this on TV live to the biggest star in the company. He's lucky Punk would do business with him at the pay-per-view. I wouldn't have. Yeah, well, here's the thing. When you double-cross somebody on live television to try to get the advantage, whether it's verbal or physical, 
how do you ever trust that person again? And so, yeah, I, if, if that's the case, if Punk had wanted to make a fucking issue out of it, he could say, well, you know what? The motherfucker, the little Weasley bastard that nobody ever heard of two years ago, he double crosses me on live national television. Who's to say he's not going to double cross me on live national pay-per-view? So fuck you, Tony. Get a replacement for me. Because I'm the money match, not the fucking idiot that you thought would be a good champion because he spent two years tap dancing with Twinkle Toes. So that, again, what? where do these guys get their balls from? Who do they think they are? They don't have a firm grasp of their status in the community or in the wrestling pecking order. They think they're over because Tony Khan doesn't tell them what to do. But when they get talent out there that does know what to do and they can't follow instructions, they need to either follow or get the fuck out of the way. But I guess we got Paige out of the way for right now. So apparently we'll we'll see what happens. If, if, if Paige is a cowboy, let him bulldog Punk. You know, a lot of people say, well, Punk proved he couldn't fight in the UFC. Well, he's had two more fights in the UFC than Adam Page has, which is two. And he's done the training. And he's got a little bit of the fucking technique. So if I was just going to place some money on somebody's head in a fight between Adam Page and CM Punk, I'm not betting on the guy wearing butterflies on his crotch. He's lucky Punk didn't kick his ass in the back right after that segment. Seriously, because Punk could have. Well, he could, he could, here's the thing. There's not a lot of goddamn Gracie family members in AEW. There's a few of them there that have the credentials and have the fucking capability, and they're mostly fucking decent people. But all the goddamn assholes couldn't whip cream with an outboard motor and couldn't say suey if the hogs had him. So I think Punk's UFC fucking record would uh, trump the goddamn time they told the guy off at the indie show in, in Pomona or Reseda or wherever the fuck they're at. Anyway, let's get on to John Moxley. Oh, God, I can't believe I said those words. Punk goes on and turns his attention to the money match coming up at the pay-per-view, or at least so we thought still at this time. And this was fucking great. He said, uh, John Moxley, and they cheer. Yeah, he's number one in your heart, but not in this ring. Moxley is the third best guy in his own group, and that's a reoccurring theme in his career. Holy shit. They, they, you could have you shaved a gorilla on the sharpness of these comments. He said, Moxley says he breaks bones, but only one of us has broken a bone in the last few months, and that's me. It was mine, but still. I mean, because he's making fun of this fucking guy. This Dracula that drinks blood and breaks bones and grinds them to make his bread. The third best, and Eddie Kingston, I guess just because of whatever, Eddie Kingston is the third best Eddie and the second best Kingston he's ever worked with. And he said that Moxley was not even the first John he was going to beat for a title in Chicago, talking about Cena. So, after that onslaught, they play Moxley's music, and here come the plumber. And Punk actually says, I think I've got time before he gets here. I'll do some snow angels. And he lays down in the <laughs> ring and does snow angels in the ring, waiting for Moxley to do his fucking. How long is it going to be before somebody? That was tremendous. somebody. Can somebody just give John Moxley a locker room inside the building? It's been years now. And then, I mean, Brian, it, it was. It was honestly like you see an independent show where you have a star that's got his shit together and is recognized and people know who he is and he's coming to work with the local indie guy. And they're trying to work with each other, but one guy looks like a star that's together and composed and articulate and the other guy looks like he's fucking trying to do a promo for smart fans and talk himself into it. And he did, Moxley did the spooky voice indie style stuff. And then Punk said, well, you, you can be the heart and soul of AEW. I'll be the dollars and cents. <laughs> and, just, God. Uh, and there was some more of the fighting spirit horse shit from Moxley. And he bows up at Punk and Punk says, I'm afraid if I touch you, you'll just bleed all over me. God damn, I lost it. And then, of course, Moxley kisses Punk and then they have the fight. and. 
Jesus Christ, for a guy who literally likes to pummel people into jelly with his bare hands, according to him, Moxley can't throw a punch to save his life, can he? You know, his elbows in the matches we talked about, those have looked really bad, but he's in the middle of a brawl, and that was the thing that kind of took me out of the whole thing, was immediately, you know, okay, this part is, now they're working together, because his punches look so shitty. They look yeah. so bad. And conversely, when he gets hit with somebody, with a punch, he doesn't move his head at all, so everybody else's punches look like shit. And and then Punk, also, the way Moxley got in there and was throwing the back and forth Punk, is it, they couldn't have a decent one-two. Punk's having to kind of lean over the top and throw him down at him. I don't know. But uh, the security hits, and they pull him apart, and they come back together, and they pull him apart again, and Moxley leaves, and then he comes back, but then he leaves again. And that was so that wasn't a bad way to start out the show. And at least we know Punk is back. And now we've established, okay, now we know our main event for the pay per view for another three segments. Um, and at least they had some excitement. People were into it. Forgive me for not remembering. Was this the part or was it later in the show when Claudio came out and manhandled Moxley like a little bit? That's kid? the second time. Okay. That's the second. <laughs> he picked him up around the waist and his feet were going wee, 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 wee off the ground. Um, but anyway, uh, closing thoughts on this segment, or have we gone too long already? I mean, it just depends on if you want to talk about any of the other things about the backstage stuff in AEW, or you want to save that for later, because... Well, let's save it for the individuals involved. They'll be back out. Uh, but speaking of the title, so last week on the program, we had that rather uh, uh, heated exchange between Punk and Moxley. And then they came out and got in a fight again, and we forgot to mention that um, that they had announced toward the end of the program last week, fuck it, we ain't going to wait for the pay-per-view where you might have to pay to see this. We're going to put the interim title versus the real title on the line between Moxley and Punk next week on free television. And everybody at that point thought, what if what is the matter with these people? And we did too. Because why would you give that away? Except it it's not like anybody wanted to see it anyway. We've talked about the fact that this was botched horribly when Tony decided to put the belt on Moxley, the interim title, when Punk was out. It should have been a heel. It should have been the hottest heel you could get that could crow and fucking brag the whole time that Punk was gone and take advantage of people so that Punk would have a dragon to slay, a wrong to right, a hill to climb, something to come back for and triumph that people would universally be on his side rather than a split audience dueling chance like they had here in this match. Let's go Moxley, CM Punk. Some of these idiots were actually saying all the words together. Let's go Moxley, CM Punk, because it's just a thing to do. They don't care who wins now, especially when you split their fucking affections. So he has an idiot for an interim champion that is totally doesn't fit what Punk needed to come back to, and obviously he had, Punk had to be aware of that. So then they they shoot an angle, and then they decide to bring the pay-per-view main event ahead a week to free television. And I'm thinking, what the fuck are they thinking? There's somebody's lost their mind somewhere. But then I realize if this is what they intended to do, they couldn't have made this the main event on pay-per-view because people would have set seats on fire in three minutes. And at the same point, a lot of people have been waiting to hear me say, oh, he's going to tear this apart. And I might still tear it apart a little bit here, but they're doing something, and it's it involves CM Punk. So unless one of two things happen, unless CM Punk just said, you know what, I made a fucking mistake, you guys are fucking hopeless, I don't want to be involved in this, I didn't want to come back and do bad television, stick this belt up your ass and I'm going home. Then in that case, it makes sense they did what they did. There's one other way that this makes sense with Punk being involved in it if he doesn't want to tell them to stick it up their ass, if he still wants to try to help this company, then I don't want to break the, the bubble. I don't want to come out and say this is what they're going to do because if they do do it, then what they did on television 
makes perfect sense. But let's just say this. Let's just say if Punk has re-injured his bad foot, he probably ain't going to be wrestling at the United Center in Chicago. Now, that's going to hurt their live crowd in Chicago because those people wanted to see CM Punk because it's his hometown. And that's probably the one place where the dueling chance would have been reduced to a minimum because even Punk would have been the raging favorite over Plummer Moxley, but it still wouldn't have been like an actual real heel to come back and beat. And you had to think that that had to set sideways with Punk to begin with that he was going to be put in a position to come back in his triumphant debut in his hometown. He's wrestling an alleged babyface, even though Moxley has no idea how to be a babyface. He's presented as such. So, you get, you rip the Band-Aid off the scab or whatever, get it over with. Nobody gave a shit to see Punk versus Moxley, so get it over with on free television and figure out some way that you don't have to have that match on pay-per-view. And then I don't know. Maybe if the plumber was to run his fucking yap and issue an open challenge, then some heel with heat that makes people feel something could come out of nowhere and win that fucking belt during Punk's absence while he's re-injured on his bad foot. And then Punk would have something to come and win back and right a wrong and take away the most prized possession in the company from some asshole who was only using it for his own selfish gain and didn't deserve it. Then you might have a wrestling story to sell tickets and pay-per-views and things. But if only Punk was involved in the decision-making, I would think that's maybe where they're going. But since these other amateur dipshits are involved, I don't know what the fuck's going to happen. Because it was this fucked up to begin with. So so there's what we think. Either Punk said, you know what, fuck it, I've tried. You people aren't worth it. (laughs) I can't teach you anything. You're going to run this thing into the ground. I'm going home. Or he said, you know what, you have fucked this up massively and we need to take control over it somehow. And if we have to piss people in Chicago off, Mama says it bees that way sometimes for the sake of the future. Because otherwise this made no sense. For the people who've been living under a rock, they have the interim title versus title match. They introduce Moxley and Punk. They lock up. Moxley gets a little on Punk. Punk gets a little on Moxley. Punk goes to throw a roundhouse kick, sells his left foot, which was the one that he injured, I guess, and got operated on, goes down, Moxley sees what's happening, Punk staggers to his feet, Moxley clotheslines him, gets on top of him, and hits those shitty, phony, stupid-looking elbows. But apparently, even though they look bad, they also hurt, because at one point, Punk had to get his hand in there like, you fucking idiot! You just hit me in the jaw! And then Moxley gave Punk two of his double arm, are they suplexes, are they DDTs? They started out as a DDT, then he he puts Minoru Suzuki down like a Fabergé egg. This was kind of in the middle. And one, two, three in three minutes. And the Twitter blew up, and it's like, what is this, the end of the company? This is ridiculous. What are they fucking doing? And it doesn't make any sense unless they're just deciding we've completely fucked this thing up and we're going to start from scratch and we're going to re-rack everything. So they maybe they just got it out of the way. But otherwise, I have no thought what the fuck is going on here. Do you? Let me first apologize. Julio and the gang are outside taking care of their duties. But... I believe this is part of a series of events leading into the pay-per-view. I have faith in everything CM Punk has done in AEW so far has been great. So I have faith in CM Punk. I doubt this would be the way it was if there wasn't a meaning behind it, whether or not we recognize it yet or not. But I'm going to go with the belief that they're building up to something. He's doing business with Moxley. This is different than everything with the drama with CM Punk and 
you know, the whole Cucamonga camp. And or and or hang nail page. Well, he's part of he's part of. I mean, look. Yeah, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't around here the other night, was he? No, he wasn't there. Who knows if he's suspended? But you know, it's Omega, the Bucks, Adam Page, Excalibur, and various flunkies all over the place who got jobs for no good reason. That's the group. CM Punk's not really dealing with that. He's dealing with Moxley. He's friends with Moxley's wife. I'm sure CM Punk was doing business here. Whether or not this was the right thing or the right way, right way to use CM Punk, I guess time will tell. I am dead against the way John Moxley's used. I know they have fans who like him. And I've brought this up before. It's ironic that CM Punk comes out the cult of personality because John Moxley's really the one who <laughs> capitalizes on there being a cult of personality because his work in the ring ain't good. I'm sorry. There's no excuse. People are going to go, oh, I like his matches. They're not good. The blows, whether it's the punches, which we saw in the brawl with P- CM Punk, or the elbows, which we've seen over and over and over again, look like shit. And if they're hurting the guy, too, there, there's a double negative. And his promos just, they come across to me as phony baloney, to use a Roddy Piper phrase. <laughs> they come across to me, uh, or actually, I think I was Tony Clifton I'm thinking of. Uh, it comes across to me as just, I don't believe him. I don't believe in John Moxley, and he does the fucking Bez walk from Happy Mondays. I don't believe in him, and I, I know they have a lot of fans who really like him, and they were chanting for him and Punk, and like you said, the same people were chanting both, which is, if there's any example of what the modern wrestling fan who goes to AEW is like, that's the perfect example right there, the fan chanting both. But I'm not a big fan of Moxley as the world champion, but I think this, is all, this all has to be building to something more than likely at the pay-per-view, I would imagine. We shall hope. Uh, but then before we get to the main event of and the And where did Regal go? Regal walked in. They showed Moxley. This time when he was walking in the bowels of the building, Regal was next to him. And then yeah. by the time Moxley got out there, Regal was gone. Where did he go? He got lost in the parking lot <laughs> when Moxley had to go outside so he could come back in. Maybe he got picked up by an Uber. I'm not sure. He's my least favorite wrestler in wrestling right now because he's all over the TV and his matches are always terrible and his personality just... I just don't think... Eh. I know a lot of people like him, but I don't get it with Moxley at all. At all. And then... Like Mussolini! Saving the booking! Giving it the best try he can! Here comes Punk. And he enters subdued, his hands in his pockets. If you notice, he is always out with the appropriate emotion. If he's happy to be there or should be happy to be there, then he's happy. If he's wrestling, then he's got his game face on, but he's confident. If something like this has happened, he comes out, you can almost see the tears in his eyes. And that's something that used to be standard in wrestling and is no longer even thought about which is why bianca belair you can burn her house down the next day she's going to come out on tv skipping and smiling twirling her hair so he did the promo and he started talking about the damage to his foot three plates 16 screws i have a feeling that he didn't make that up so apparently this was worse than we thought it might be And one smartass started to chant Cold Cabana. Actually, that's usually the Cold Cabana chants usually consist of one smartass, but... Could you hear it at home on TV? You heard it? Actually, I had to go back and replay it because as soon as Punk pointed at the guy and, and said what he said, which I'm about to mention, that's I said, what was that? And then you can... You can hear if you're listening for it, because it was it bled over somebody's microphone. But right. it was a very faint cold cold. But Punk heard it because the guy was in the front row. He had just talked about his three plates and sixteen screws. The guy goes cold cabana, and Punk immediately says, "Which, by the way, is sixteen times more than this fat guy's got screwed in his life," and gets a big pop from the people. And then he explained he probably came back too early. And he just got beat up in Cleveland, and he doesn't know if his new 100% is good enough. But he came back to wrestling because he loves the business and the fans, and it hurts to feel like I let you down. This is great stuff. This is the baby face. This is the hero actually being conflicted on whether he should 
return or not and whether he'll be good enough, but not like really like some fucking mental incompetence. Oh my God. No, this is out in front of the people. So they'll know that he supposedly feels this way. So it will play into the story. God damn it. I can't believe I have to say these things at this point. And then he breaks down. Maybe he's not good enough anymore. This is classic shit. If he really felt that way and wanted to fucking quit, then I'd say he's goddamn nuts. But for the story, it's brilliant. And then here comes a steal out. And he again identifies himself in a conversational way, and they refer to what happened earlier just briefly, and he gives Punk the pep talk, the Rocky and Mickey speech, the corner man. This is classic psychology. He is Punk's old mentor, his old trainer. And legitimately, Ace came first. He was already established in the, in the Chicago area in the 90s. And he gets him fired up, and then he slaps him. And he says, you fucking get up. He got carried away and he fucking said fucking after they'd had the meeting. And this was reported on the internet immediately when he went through the curtain, he held his hand up and said, it's my fault. I slipped. He fined himself, I think, or paid whatever fine Tony Khan wanted him to fucking pay. But it worked here. He was firing punk up. You're better than this. You can do it. Get up. It's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get up. You fucking get up. Sign this contract. And the fans were screaming. And he says, have you forgot who you were? And the fans chant CM Punk. CM Punk. And now Punk cuts the fired up promo. He's been convinced. He's seen the light. He starts firing them up. He goes into the crowd. He goes out in the audience. He rouses Chi-Town behind him. He runs for the mayor of Chicago. You can't break my bones or drink my blood, Moxley, because we are Chicago. And he signs the contract in the middle of the people. Brian, did you see? They literally did throw a baby in the air. Well, they raised him up, at least. They, they didn't raised let go him of him. Yeah. But they raised him up. They offered up a baby to the god of CM Punk in Chicago. Don't throw your babies, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Don't throw the baby or kick the baby. But no, and, and everybody tweeted that picture of the guy holding the baby up. The babies are in the air in Chicago. This was fucking perfect. I didn't see it coming. And I realize now how much sense it makes. If they'd have had this match, two baby faces, one a phony champion, interim champion, the other the real champion, Moxley had not been on a reign of terror. Moxley had not taken advantage of anybody in Punk's absence or done anything that needed to be gotten even with. They had to do something or it was just going to be a blase fucking baby face match for fucking marks of goddamn wrestling moves. And there's a lot fewer of those than ever before. They needed to have some emotion in this. There needed to be a heel and a baby face. And now, at least in Chicago, there's going to be a heel and a baby face because Moxley is shit on the town at the same time as Punk just ran for mayor and was offered up babies as sacrifices. So now we got something. Now there's going to be a fucking atmosphere. Now maybe people might buy the pay-per-view to see what's going to happen. Do you think Moxley will threaten to either eat the baby or drink the baby's blood? I think the, I know I think he's going to grind the baby's bones to make his bread. Um, this is the first time I've ever heard Ace Steel do a promo, to the best of my knowledge, and he was fantastic. He well, nailed the tone that it had to be, and the look on Punk's face after he got the slap. You mentioned how Punk comes out there, he always has the right look on his face. 
I remember someone years ago saying, David Bowie's amazing. He's always in the perfect pitch. And CM Punk comes out there, his face tells the story, but you don't know what the yeah. whole story is. And then it all unfolds. So uh, again, this, this segment and the previous segment, the, the first one with Moxley, this sold this cold ass fucking blase match. And since all of a sudden, the entire direction, complexion, and inflection of this thing changed as soon as Punk showed back up, I have a feeling we know that is this was not a Booker of the Year fucking uh, inspiration. Well, you know what it was time for now? Because it was past 11.30 on the East Coast, Brian. You know what it was time for? Trying to stay awake. Like Mussolini! It's almost Monday, and I'm so tired. I hope they don't go long. So after all the back and forth and happenings of the past few weeks, Punk does make his entrance in Chicago. And honestly, again, Tony, you squandered. This was not a CM Punk ovation in Chicago. And it's not because that he's any less over because of the angle with him dropping the thing to Moxley in three minutes. He's probably more over because of the Ace Steel promo and the whole thing they did last Wednesday night. But here it is going on midnight when these people have been in the goddamn building for six hours at least. And they were happy to see Punk, but the babies weren't going in the air because these people are fucking tired. For anybody. And then, you know, they play Wild Thing, and here comes Plummer Moxley through the crowd. And the Chicago fans are are probably not Plumbing fans because they didn't, not only did he just switch heel on them on Wednesday, but for the same reason I've just talked about, it's fucking late. And the bell rings, and they're almost five hours into the show. But they opened the thing hot and they started to do a little play on a quick match because Punk was all over Moxley and giving Moxley his own elbows and hit the go to sleep and got a two count. People were like, oh shit. And then uh, they fought into the arena just enough. It it looked like it was Punk uh, said, oh, all right, John, yeah, we'll go out in the arena because I know that you have to do that in every match so I won't die on this hill. And then they come back and Mox, Moxley sends Punk in the post and busts him open. And now he can, he can, he actually did his blood drinking bit. He was able to punch the cut and then lick the blood off his hand for all the people who want to see that type of thing. But Punk sold his ass off. He was a big baby face. Moxley was the full heel, both in terms of the crowd sentiment and that he was in control, starting to work on Punk's bad foot, blah, blah, blah. And again, I, when Punk started coming back and they started going back and forth, I said, this would they, the babies would have been in the air if this was a normal wrestling promotion where the main event... <laughs> came on two hours and 45 minutes after the bell time. And they're still enjoying it, but it's not over the top. Punk went for the elbow off the top. Moxley catches him in a choke. Punk comes out, goes for the arm bar. Mox comes out, gets the choke. Then an ankle lock, a German flips off the crowd. Punk hit a roundhouse. Moxley hit a clothesline. They're going back and forth, folks. It's dog eat dog. Where's Larry when you need him? And finally, um, you know, Moxley hit his DDT and got a two count, and he was doing the elbows, trying the choke, but Punk comes out, hits the go to sleep, and Moxley bounces off the ropes and falls on top of Punk, who is crumpled there, but he's knocked out, so Punk is under him, powers him up again, hits another go to sleep, boom, one, two, three. And they not only got the belt back in the right place, but they got the main event finish in six minutes before midnight Eastern. But the show was not over because then suddenly the lights go out. 
and a voicemail from Tony Khan plays. And you can tell it's Tony's voice. And he's saying, all right, you know, we've, we've got to do this deal. This is the last offer. You can come back and be, a, and be it all out. I'll put you in the casino ladder match. I'll pay you bleep dollars. <laughs> and, but this is it. It's a final offer. And then they play the clip of Punk and Ring of Honor. Somebody on Twitter said, well, see, it shows what a great investment it was because they got this clip. I love everybody involved. I don't know if this clip was worth a couple million bucks, but the video library would be all right. But the clip of Punk doing the Jake Roberts line, what was it, you know, you silly ass, you, you knew I was a snake. And then here comes the masked Joker fellow that was in the ladder match who comes out and unmasks as MJF. And everybody went ballistic over this because they've been wanting to see MJF back. And I have too. And I love MJF. And if it's MJF and CM Punk, I'm all there for it. But I've made my feelings known that I thought the ladder match finish was just caca. Just fucking horse shit. And I, I know everybody's just so happy to see MJF back. And the thing is, I think they milked it a little long. And I know that, you know, plans have been changed because of all the injuries. I don't know what was originally going to happen. Was he going to come back at Forbidden Door? That was the last pay-per-view. I don't fucking know. But it's been a while, and now they're so happy to see him. If they're not careful, people are going to start cheering it a little bit. So MJF, he... I would have wished that he would have made a more heelish statement rather than just a reappearance on this show, but he's got time to do that, but he needs to do it quick because they'll start liking him because now the people have seen what this rotten television program is like without MJF on it. So now they're going to be glad to have him back just so it's going to be more watchable. And there's going to be the danger they're going to want to start cheering for him unless he does something heinous, uh, you know, fairly quickly. But they did the stare down with Punk. MJF gives the fingers to the crowd, which we've seen him all night, including from Tourette Moxley. Um, so they should have saved. That's another thing they should have saved. But nothing happened at the end. There was no physicality. MJF didn't make a statement. Like I said, who knows what they might have done originally, but at least they've got him back. I was not as thrilled as everybody else was with the manner. I'm just thrilled that he's back. What do you think? Uh, I'll talk about the match first. I thought this was one of my favorite John Moxley matches in AEW, and I think it's because he works so much better as a heel. Yeah. Not as a... I'm in a combat club, I'm a rough, gruff wrestler heel, but just I'm a fucking dirtbag and I'm going to fight you heel. I'm an assholeish dirtbag that looks like that I fucking grew up in a cardboard box under an overpass in Newport. That's a heel. I find him a lot more tolerable like that. It seemed like he was having a lot of fun playing with that. I don't know if he can get that reaction everywhere just because of the way he's been used and he's coming out the wild thing and everything. <laughs> But I thought that brought out the best of John Moxley. I'm sure Punk was a big part of that just because he was working with him. But the fact that he was a heel in Chicago made it a better John Moxley. The MJF stuff, I don't know. I'm happy he's back. I'm not a big fan of the cinematic aspects of a lot of this stuff. Maybe I'm an old fuddy-duddy. I'm 42. I've only got another 50-something years left. But I don't hey, like, wait a minute. What kind of shit are you on? Give me some. I'm on that Billy Gunn shit. Listen, I didn't like the whole playing the fake voicemail. And then, because I mean, clearly, I mean, it wasn't a real voicemail from Tony Khan. And then the whole dramatic, I don't know. I didn't like it. I, I didn't think it was necessary. I thought it could have been a lot more evil and a lot more sinister and less the big pop for a big moment. And I think that's what MJF should be a little more, is just the sinister heel as opposed to the people got a big moment to pop for him. 
and that became part of the talk after the event. The idea, I mean, Jericho, <laughs> fuck, it, it, Jericho just basically demanded he become a babyface. <laughs> what? Scrum. You, you'll hear. <laughs> but the idea that people pop like that for him, you know, a lot of it's because he's a guy returning and a guy that made the show better and he's back. But I don't know. I think, I think it should have been something less stagey, even though it wasn't like crazy stagey, but I think it should have been something a little more Hardcore, a little more uh, sinister. A little more straight to the point, a little yeah. more violent, a little more underhanded. Yeah, too dramatic for me. Well, that was the dramatic close to the all-out pay-per-view, where they are literally all out, all out of ideas, all out of patience, all out of civility. <laughs> no, there are, there are plenty of patience. What's her name? Uh, Ruby? Yeah. Ruby Soho broke her nose. Oh, yeah. yeah. All, all of the patients on us. And, and also, we didn't even mention that, of course, Adam Cole is still gone somewhere, hurt somehow. Kyle O'Reilly's just had surgery. We're not sure what happened there. It, basically, anybody that you don't see fairly regularly, you've got to assume in this company they're hurt. Even if you see him regularly. Did you know Christian Cage was Well, gonna- yeah. Yeah, we didn't know that. <laughs> Cover this. I mean, with the, everybody's with silk. waiting. <laughs> everybody's waiting for us to talk about the media scrum. But yeah, here's the thing: at one point, uh, everybody was saying going into this weekend. Well, you know, the WWE's got momentum. They do the clash at the castle in front of sixty-five thousand people, or however many, and uh, who knows what we can trust in. Cardiff, the first UK stadium show in 30 years. And they thought, wow, this will be a big deal. And by the next day, <laughs> that is an afterthought, not because of why Tony Khan wanted that to be an afterthought, because his show was so much blow away better, but because his media scrum was the most entertaining thing that that company has ever done, where somebody actually finally came out and grabbed the bull by the tail and faced the situation. And so should we do the scrum first, even though it came second, or how do you want to handle it? It's your show, Brian. Well, this is the topic that everyone's talking about, so why don't we do this? Why don't we do the CM Punk portion of the scrum first, and then we'll do the pay-per-view, then we'll do the rest of the scrum. You don't even know what else was going on during the scrum. There was all sorts of... I, I, I scrammed after Punk's scrum. It was fucking one whatever the fuck in the morning, and I knew nothing was going to top that. So I I departed at that point. We've had very little sleep. I may be a little slappy today, but this, the, uh, just the sheer ridiculosity of this whole situation is what's keeping me motivated today. So go ahead. And this is an amazing situation that developed here after the pay-per-view CM Punk with Tony Khan the owner of AEW, his boss in AEW sitting next to him. The new, once again, the new reigning and defending AEW World Heavyweight Champion of the World, CM Punk. Is it a unified champion or is it just undisputed now? What is it? Well, it's just the the real belt that he had all along before they decided to put something on Moxley so he could stink the joint out on the indies. And you know, one thing notable here before we play into this audio is we know there have been plenty of wrestlers, more than people realize, who have had issues at various times with that entire camp. The Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, let's put Adam Page right there at the top, even though he's kind of like second tier, he's their guy. CM Punk, I think, is the first one to ever publicly verbalize any of it. You know, we hear yeah, stuff. So, uh, well, yeah, we've, we've heard a variety of these types of comments, accusations, however you want to put it, for some time from different people. But but here's the thing. I see a lot of people on Twitter today and wherever on it go, oh, how dare Punk do something like this? Well, I believe the instigating, motivating factor in all of this was when old Hangnail Page did the exact same thing, only not as good. And in more, what do the kids call it? A passive aggressive way, which is more of a way of what the, the Cucamonga kids and all of their little buckaroos do things. They like to just run their dick lickers behind people's back and in quiet instead of doing it out in front of them or in public. But 
if you're if we're talking about unprofessional behavior and or telling the truth, imagine that on television, then Paige crossed that rainbow bridge first. Uh, what was it a few months ago with this promo? That, and remember, at the time we heard it, and we talked about the show the next day on our show. We said, "What in the world?" Did he just forget everything he was supposed to say because none of this made any sense? Or was he... That's what you thought, tr- yeah. Well, yeah, I said, or was he trying to uh, do a shoot interview of some kind, turn heel, or just because he sounded like a whiny little bitch? Um, what was going on there? We didn't know, and then we find out that he was trying. Problem is, he's not articulate enough to be able to do this and still make it legible to the general viewing public he was trying to do a shoot interview as a shoot on punk in front of punk in the middle of the ring on live tv before their big pay-per-view match so i think that if you're gonna do something like that then at a media scrum where everybody's talking to the media and Tony's so open about everything, and that's where all the opponents come out and hug and kiss on each other and say how much they loved being able to express their art with each other that night. That punk ought to come out and tell the truth about what happened. How is that unprofessional? They did it to him when he wasn't ready for it on a television show that was not supposed to be for the media. It was supposed to be for public consumption. Well, now here we'll, we're talking to the press. So here's what's going on. How is that in any way? What is, as I think he asked one of the journalists in the room, what did I do to get this guy to go into business for himself on me without any warning on live national television? So. I don't see how they're blaming Punk for coming out and telling the truth. It's what we've been saying. It's what a lot of other people have been saying. There's two camps. There's the people that are serious about the wrestling profession as a profession and a business. And there's these jack-offs that got their heads so far up their own asses and love the smell of their own farts so much that they still think that they're temporary Mass amnesia on a certain segment of the wrestling fan population is actually still going and that they're still the stars of this thing. And that they can act any way they want and they can talk to people any way they want and they can treat them any way they want. And if they're in the little click, they even stole the click. If they're in the little click, they're good. They don't have to have talent or ever have been heard of or go anywhere or do anything. They just got to be friends from school. And then there's a group led by, if you want to be honest, Punk is the guy who has drawn them their million people ratings on television. Punk's the guy who's been on top in their million dollar gates. Punk's the guy that's been on top in their million, multi million dollar pay per views. And as a matter of fact, I would hesitate to say what um by every metric that you can say punk has been the one to generate the business so and remember you know this reminded me remember some of the spin we were seeing a few months back when it was punk versus mjf one of the most coherent and well thought out storylines they've done on tv we were told that wasn't the draw for the pay-per-view. The spin was, it was Adam Page versus Adam Cole. <laughs> there has been a version of AEW that's based in reality, and then there's another version coming out of the, as Jim Cornette would say, the chicken lips of various people and their various friends that has been bullshit. And CM Punk, I said before, he's the first guy to verbalize these things. He's the first guy that can. They're guys afraid of their jobs. You know, EVP, they're bullshit EVPs. I mean, they're EVPs, you know, the way I can make Swami an EVP right now of Arcadian Vanguard. They're not fucking EVPs. But they're playing that role right now. And I think it's going to be a harsh reality that you can call yourself an EVP, but if you can only play with your friends and you're upsetting the biggest star the company has ever had, you're in a lot of trouble. 
So it is going to be interesting to see how it plays out. But before you and I go on any further and bore everyone, let's get some audio. Jim, this is the very beginning. Now, AEW's audio feed was terrible. It sounded like everyone was a robot. But also, it kind of began abruptly. We didn't get to hear what got CM Punk going. We have some audio here. Let's give credit to the source. Denise Salcedo on YouTube. Here is CM Punk from the very beginning of the press scrum. We'll stop it at various points to discuss your thoughts on this. Just say your name and you're cool. Hi, uh, Nick House with Wrestling Inc. I'll uh, start, Nick. Um, show of hands, who here fancies themselves as a journalist? You're a journalist, Nick? All right. I try my best. Okay. Um, um, no, real, real quick. Go ahead. Um, you still do improv? Uh, no, not a little bit. No? No. When you did improv, who'd you do improv with? Uh, I did it with uh, uh, Scott Colton. Mm. Okay, so you fancy yourself a journalist. Would you say you're friends with Scott Colton? Uh, no, I haven't talked to Scott in some time. Mm -hmm. So you're not friends with him? Uh, no, no, Scott and I do not see eye to eye. Oh, wow. Well, that makes two of us. <laughs> My point is, if you fancy yourself a journalist, even if it's for the silly world of professional wrestling, and you have journalistic integrity, people who report things mostly that are bullshit and slanderous lies against myself. If you are friends with somebody, you blew my spot. If you're not friends with them, I apologize. It's okay. But you should probably disclose who you're friends with. I'm not friends um, with you. I haven't had Scott. anything to do with Scott Colton in almost a decade. Probably wanted nothing to do with him even longer than that. It's fucking unfortunate that I have to come up here and speak on this when I'm on my time and this is a fucking business. Uh, let me stop it there for a second, because there's already a lot that's happened. And, and by the way, I, we didn't paint the visual picture for those of you just listening to the audio. But Punk is sitting, he's still in his tights. He's bleeding. He's wiped it off, but he's bleeding from his match. He's not showered yet, but he's sitting there and he's eating muffins. Little uh, the, the muffins from his uh, favorite muffin place there in Chicago. And I'm sure he'll he'll plug the name of it. Uh, and it's just, and he's licking his fingers and asking these or answering these questions and just eviscerating people all the while sitting there and eating bits of muffin and licking his fingers. It's fucking classic. Well, he also has some sort of beverage here. I don't know if it's seltzer or what, but the other thing you want to set the visual, Tony Khan is sitting right next to him. Yes. And 18 inches. It's worth watching the video. Just, you know, again, I, you know, you feel bad for Tony in a sense. But it's a real awkward situation because Punk is very free in the moment. You could tell he's just speaking his mind freely. And Tony doesn't know where it's going to go and when it's going to end. Well, I guess with that said, yes, let's get more audio <laughs> let's go here. Back to it. Why I'm a grown ass adult man and I decide not to be friends with somebody is nobody else's fucking business. But my friends, if I fall backwards, will catch me. Scott Colton, I felt never would have my problem was i wanted to bring a guy with me to the top that did not want to see me at the top okay you call it jealousy you call it envy whatever the fuck it is my relationship with scott colton ended long before i paid all of his bills i have every receipt i have every invoice i have every email i have the email where he says and i quote i agree to go our separate ways i will get my own lawyer and you do not have to pay anymore that's an email that I have. The only reason the public did not see is because when I finally had to counter sue him through discovery, we discovered he shared a bank account with his mother. That's a fact. Let me stop it. I don't know if that's the L train or if <laughs> Subway is going by. I don't know what that is, but let's go back to this. And as soon as we discovered that fact and we subpoenaed old Marsha, he sent the email, oh, can we please drop all this? Now, it's 2022. I haven't been friends with this guy since at least 2014, late 2013. And the fact that I have to sit up here because we have irresponsible people who call themselves EVPs and couldn't fucking manage a target, and they spread <laughs> lies and bullshit and, and put into a media that I got somebody fired when I have fuck all to do with him. Want nothing to do with him. Do not care where he works, where he doesn't work, where he eats, where he sleeps. 
And the fact that I have to get up here and do this in 2022 is fucking embarrassing. And if y'all are at fault, fuck you. If you're not, I apologize. But what did I ever do in this world to, go, to deserve an empty-headed fucking dumb fuck like Hangman Adam Page to go out on <laughs> national television and fucking go into business for himself? For what? What did I do? Dave, what did I ever do? You tell me. Didn't do a goddamn thing. Good comeback, name, Meltzer. Dumb Let me stop this for a second because he's about to go to another question here. Because again, okay. there's a lot that he covered there. And here's the thing. We now know what happened that Paige, it's already come out. Paige, when he went mad, insane in that interview and tried to verbally go toe to toe with the fucking expert, he was in some way or another in their, as we said, whether, whether it's passive aggressive or just their mealy mouthed way trying to take up for their friend Colt Cabana that they have been telling everybody far and wide that punk's the reason why that Cole Cabana, the guy who stood as, as a background fucking mannequin in an underneath heel group that became baby faces through no efforts of his either way for two fucking years, suddenly is switched over to another non-existent company, Ring of Honor, even though he's getting paid the same amount of money, Tony just shifted him over to the side, probably because Tony Khan was even smart enough to realize, well, now that I got this guy coming in to draw money and this other guy, they hate each other, I'll just get him out of the way. He's lucky he was renewed at all or whatever's going yes. on because before Punk got there, when Punk had zero to do with AEW, it's not like Cabana was tearing up the world. He was barely being used. That's what I'm saying. They could have fucking blown up a goddamn one of Kenny Olivier's ex-opponents. Could have blown her up and stood her back there and it'd have been the same fucking deal. It's another one of Tony's early acquisitions that he had buyer's remorse on and never made a, you know, any kind of difference. But the point is... He was another of the friends. That's he why. He was one of the friends. And because he was one of the friends, the friends in all friends wrestling got their panties in a bunch and decided to go do their thing where they whisper and they fucking me, 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 and they run me, 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 me over the corner. He did this and he did that and he did the other thing. And finally, old Hangnail was stupid enough to bring it out on television. And now he's opened himself up to Pug. You can tell there's some things been building up. I'm not talking about Punk being mad at Colt Cabana for 10 years. By God, he knew him for 20 years. That's enough to be mad at him for 40 years. But I'm talking about this has obviously been building since that happened a couple months ago, and that wasn't the first of it. And he probably hasn't got a suitable explanation or apology from either of the Cucamonga kids or anybody else in their little treehouse that uh, has been spreading all this shit. And so he thought, well, okay, I'll just mention this. What are they going to do about it? I know a lot of people that don't like Punk because, oh, well, he, he got whipped in the UFC. Yeah, well, old Matt and Nick fucking hardly, I don't know if they are tall enough to buy a ticket to see the UFC. So who are you going to take there? What about Twinkle Toes? They say he trained a little bit. He's got a bunch of injuries, too. I bet if he tried that V-trigger, Punk would fucking take that leg and fucking bend it south and fucking shove it up his ass. So what are they going to do about it? They want to fucking run their fucking mouths. Well, somebody that now has the cachet in the industry and the platform to fucking say what he thinks about them is willing to do it. So, as Bobby Eaton used to say, fuck around and fuck around, see what happens. There's more audio, and I can't wait to hear yeah, it. Yeah, there is, and I just want to say one thing. This is what they did to you. It just so happens that you have this forum, and your voice didn't go away, and you could fight back. Most people couldn't yes. do that, but they lied. They made up stories. Yeah, there's real shit where they had problems with some of your criticisms of their work. That's one thing. But they made up agendas and stories and tried to demonize you. The Bucks, Cabana way back, Omega, all of these fucking guys. Here's Punk, and I'm not saying Punk agrees with everything you say, but Punk obviously sees wrestling 
a very different way than they do. He's a threat to them because he's a bigger star than them. He doesn't need an EVP like Jericho. Jericho's not an EVP. He doesn't need it. He realized Punk doesn't need it. He's higher than that. So now what are they going to do? Now they start their whisper campaign and they start spreading rumors because it's Punk's fault that a guy who's never been used on TV is not being used anymore. They started all this kind of stuff. It's just Punk's going public. They're still over in the corner whispering and looking for friendly wrestling journalists and air quotes that they could talk to. And look, Punk's been there for a year before he finally decided, you know, I've had enough of these smarmy little fucking douchebags because they they specialize in douchebaggery. So it's it's not like you get ticked off at them, boom, 100% right in the same day. It's like the douchebaggery builds up. But I I knew from the start, I didn't want to be in the fucking building with any of them. And now, you know, Punk's had enough. But anyway, let's go back to the deal. Fuck the Pittsburgh Packers. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you I'm doing? Pittsburgh. <laughs> I made it really clear in Forbes, and I just want to make it clear again. Nick, it's what? not his position to make it very fucking clear. There's people who call themselves EVPs that should have fucking known better. This shit was none of their business. I understand sticking up for your fucking friends. I fucking get it. I stuck up for that guy more than anybody. Okay? I paid his bills. Until I didn't, and it was my decision not to. Yeah, but I shouldn't have no commented when Nick first said it. It's my I, fault, and I if I hadn't, it's my that. fault. It's my I appreciate. Fault. That. I should have but just I'm, taken a head on because you never but said But I'm trying anything. to run a fucking business, and when somebody who hasn't done a damn thing in this business jeopardizes the first million dollar house that this company has ever drawn off of my back and goes on national television and does that, it's a disgrace to this industry. It's a disgrace to this company. Now we're far beyond apologies. Right? I gave him a fucking chance. It did not get handled, and you saw what I had to do, which is very regrettable, lowering myself to his fucking level. But that's where we're at right now. And I will still walk up and down this hallway and say, if you have a fucking problem with me, take it up with me. Let's fucking go. What's your question, Nick? Uh <laughs> All right, here's another thing, and it was... It was an awkward position with pa because that's where Punk had to win the belt from Page, right? But here's the thing: it uh, you look back at the old days since Punk has somewhat of an old school mindset. If that had been twenty or thirty years earlier with a Harley race, for example, and the guy goes into business for himself on live TV, tries to bury the guy uh, Harley race on a promo, then. Harley Race may have walked back and asked Tony Khan, said, well, who am I wrestling in the main event on your million-dollar house now? Just like Steve Austin called Vince McMahon up that time about Mark Merrow after he got powerbombed by Sable. That's what he's talking about, Jeff, because if, if the guy double-crosses Punk on a promo on live TV, who's to say he's not going to double-cross him when he's fucking laying there and the jack-off's going to come off the top rope? Yeah, really. I like Cabana enough to sabotage this on live TV, but I don't like him enough to punch you in the mouth when you're not ready for it. Yeah. So, and then what's Punk going to have to do? He's going to have to fucking defend himself, which probably, and again, with Paige, yes, he's a fine-looking young athlete. But I'm just, uh, since he's a goddamn, obviously, a mealy-mouthed little fucking butt-muncher uh, that head. has to... Yeah, empty head that has to, you know, do shit like that instead of coming up and getting a guy's face. So I think I still bet on Punk against Page, but that would mean that Punk would have had to fucking take him down and applied some of that UFC training in the middle of a live pay per view. And who wants that? So I, I'm surprised. I do. You know, I do. Well, <laughs> I you know what I'm saying. That. I know what you're saying. Well, let's get a little more audio, Nick. Finally gets, and we always compliment Nick Houseman. He always asks good questions. It just so happens that he's from Chicago, so Punk knew who he knew. And he picked the wrong week to quit sniffing glue. But Nick Houseman goes to the next question about MJF, but it comes back to this because Punk has never talked about this. I mean, there have been so many things that people have thought about the falling out of him and Colt Cabana because publicly they were so close for so many years, but we've never heard anything from CM Punk about it. So now that those floodgates have opened, he has more to say. You'll hear it here. First of all, you're always very nice to me, and thank you. Um, 
I wanted to ask about MJF. Obviously, uh, he played a, a voicemail from you before he came out. Obviously, confronted you, uh, Punk. Um, why now? Why, why, why is MJF back in the fold now? How do you both feel about him being around? How do you feel about the time he spent away? All of that. Well, if I may, I'm the one who asked him to come back because uh, MJF's a big star in this company and this is a, one of the biggest events. A year ago, CM Funk debuted here and I thought it was right for the fans. And like I said, for the fans, I thought the best thing that we could do as a company was bring MJF back. And he wants me to work with pricks constantly. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, two of the top wrestlers in the world, MJF and CM Punk, could be oh. a big match down the line. Sorry to keep bringing this fucking up, but I've never spoken his word and I don't know how long, so I'm a little fucking pissed off about it. That's fine. When it came down that he was going to sue me, I asked to talk to him. He refused. I asked for mediation. It was denied. I offered him money. He said it was not enough. He went ahead with the lawsuit and sued. It's his fucking funeral. I don't care. He shares a bank account with his mother. It tells you all you need to know about what kind of character that is. <laughs> you were always very nice to me. Thank you. I appreciate it, Nick. I'm sorry if I'm a little fucking snippy. That's fine. That's I'm fine. hurt and I'm old and I, I'm fucking tired. I totally, and I work with fucking children. I respect the situation. <laughs> I regret not answering your question. And the first I time only asked it because I have some familiarity and just wanted some clarification on the story. Yeah, I, didn't break I the should story. have just taken a head on like I did with Blake and Forbes recently. We're all learning here, Tony. It's okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, guys. This is from Mindy's Bakery, by the way. It's a great place in Chicago if you like pastries and baked goods. I suggest you go there. They're closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. Though. <laughs> All right. Well, there's the plug for Mindy's I'm like, Bakery. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired. I'm old. I'm hurt. And I'm cranky. And I work with children. That's fucking hilarious. Oh, my God. I would, Where is Punk from? He's 40. I guess he would... No, it would have been a little too early. I I did spend some time in in the Chicago area, but it would have uh, it would have been a little too late for him. But he sounds like we're some kind of blood relation. All right, I'm just trying to find the next audio snippet here that we're gonna play, and I'm trying to do that live on the air here. But this next one, uh, I'm not sure who asked this question, but it I guess gets Punk going again. <laughs> The question is about if Punk MJF will headline Arthur Ashe, and Tony says no comment, and here's what Punk says. I'm not going to comment on it. You don't know. Oh, thank you. I'll tell you why I'm upset about it, is because if you're an EVP, you don't try to middle your top baby face. Try to get your niche audience that's on the internet to hate him for some made-up bullshit rumor. It really pisses me off. Stepping on your own dick, trying to fucking, <laughs> you know, make money, sell tickets, fill arenas. And these stupid guys think they're in Reseda. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Living in Reseda. <laughs> That's where they still are in their minds. They're in their little self-started promotion where for 400 people, they could do anything they wanted to do and live out their fantasies of being worldwide wrestling stars. But now that they've got the opportunity to actually be worldwide wrestling stars, we find out that they were the understudies. And remember that we used to hear we used to hear from wrestlers in California who were not part of their clique and not part of the pro wrestling gorilla clique with Excalibur and Joey Ryan. I mean, let's talk about this whole group that if you didn't play the way they wanted to, you couldn't play at all. There were guys that at the time felt they had to do the Joey Ryan stuff because they wouldn't get booked by Joey's friends if he didn't do it. It was an entire little click, and they took the majority of that click and brought it to AEW, and now that things aren't going the way they want, and let's not even forget about the fact that two weeks in a row, I think they lost 200,000 viewers for the six-man main event with Kenny. Well, yes, and that's, a, and that's another point that, that Punk is making without saying those exact words, but when he talks about this little fucking pretend wannabe cowboy that bows up to him on television, again, punk is the draw for the ratings and the pay-per-views and the Zabada, and that's been proven the last couple of weeks when punk's activities, whatever they may have been, have drawn over a million viewers, and then they saved the main event spot for Harpo and the kids. And they come out and immediately 200,000 people say, fuck this. Because it's exactly what 
He termed it a niche audience. And uh, Punk's just the vocal one there now, but it's not like that, you know, other people haven't said this. I'm not even going to go into what we say. The people who are serious about wrestling as a business and a big business and a real business do not identify with or want to mollycoddle or placate or put up with or go along with the fucking trampoline cowboy crowd, except they're afraid they might lose their fucking job because they're EVPs. Because Tony was crazy. Instead of giving the illusion of having wrestlers having a say in his company, he actually gave it to them. And the wrong ones. And again, CM Punk saying this stuff publicly. Lots of other people have said it privately. We never got to hear what Cody Rhodes had to say because there are NDAs in place. And Cody, quite frankly, is more of a political kind of guy, so he's not going to say what he really thinks. But this is not new he stuff. He just left. <laughs> yeah, this is not left. new stuff with the behind-the-scenes stuff in AEW with these people. But let's go back to CM Punk because, again, he still has some stuff to say. Let's go to this. Last time we were here last year, I asked you about like Terry Funk and his influence, like yeah. the legacy going on. Kind of, uh, and this is for you too, Tony. I kind of like, they're, they're, you do, you've done a great job with incorporating legends throughout you know, the course of AEW and as it goes on. I kind of want to see uh, what you feel about how a lot of the modern talent today can kind of utilize some of the advice and take advice from like guys like William Regal and uh, even like Jim Ross, Tony Schiavone. Um, I know I'm missing, Jake Roberts, plenty I'm missing, I'm sure. But I just kind of want to get both your perspectives on that and how that can kind of go a little bit more to, to help you guys out grow as a company. We have a, uh, a, a locker room full of pretty brilliant minds. You know, Jerry Lynn, Dean Malenko, Mark Henry. You know, I, when I came back and I cut my promo my second week here, I thought it was, I thought it was pretty decent, you know what I mean? Kind of blur the lines a little bit. What's he doing? How oh, crazy Phil. He's going into business for himself. And really, I was just defending myself. But, you know, you, you, you mix that in with attacking Moxley and mention, um, you know, Kingston being the second best Kingston, which is a pretty great line. Um, you know, uh, but our locker room, for all the wisdom and brilliance it has, isn't worth shit when you have an empty-headed idiot who's never done anything <laughs> in the business do public interviews and say, no, I don't really take advice. Who the fuck do you think you are? <laughs> you know, that's stupid. I'm on a team with Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, and I, I, don't, need to, I don't need to work on my swing. You don't, I'm not going to listen to these guys. They're going to tell me how to swing a baseball. Fucking go fuck yourself. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. I, I, I dare you to fucking say that to Terry Funk's face. I don't need to listen to you, Mr. Funk. I know what I'm doing. Fucking grow up. Well, there's oh another one God. from CM and Punk. The, the facial expressions were great. And of course, he's <laughs> referencing what we talked about a couple weeks ago. That Hangnail Page did an interview Say, well, I guess I... You know, some people try to give me, but I don't really think I really need to take advice because, you know, we've started this revolution and we've done pretty good, so I don't really need to take advice. <laughs> oh, God, no, yes. No, Mr. Funk, I don't need to listen to you. Oh, my God. Can you imagine the frustrations, though? I mean, if well, you know, here's what, you know, this is the kind of media scrum you would have got from everybody in Crockett Promotions in 1986 if you'd have kept the guys after a long show till two o'clock in the morning to talk to a room full of six reporters. This is probably what you would have got. Well, let's get a little bit more audio. I think the only other thing of note, I'm trying to scan through our notes here. Again, the wrestling news at the wrestlingnews.com or wherever you find your favorite podcast. We have a great news team. Jason Nakarado and everyone else helping out. But let's go to this. This is towards the end of the scrum. CM Punk getting ready to leave, and he has a few more things to say. Thank you. Alvarez, Thank you. <laughs> I saw that video, man, and you were so incredulous that I went into business for myself, and I was just like, No, no, man. I, I made sure to say that some people were upset that you had done that, and other people said that you were defending yourself, which is what you said, that you were defending yourself. I... And the reason I've never defended myself is because when you do, it just sounds like you're being defensive. But I've eaten shit on this subject for a very, very long time. 
Um, and it, I am, I'm very sad today that I had to get up here and, and, and say his name. He doesn't fucking deserve it uh, and talk about it. But facts are facts, you know. Name two people that have made the most money off the name CM Punk. I don't think you're there yet. The first one's Vince McMahon. The second one's Scott Colton. I hope you all have a good night. Please be more responsible with the news you get from certain people. And uh, just remember, we're human beings. Thank you. Wait a minute. <laughs> he was getting standing ovations in the front and in the back last night. Um, again, fuck around with a guy that doesn't give a shit about hurting your feelings or not and knows that he has the whether it's the pull or the gravitas or whatever to be able to tell the truth and speak out about something without having to worry about getting fired and find out what happens they're used to playing with children because they are children themselves mentally and in some cases physically and some people in the wrestling business don't want to play like children. And not too many people have been able to speak out because again, not everyone is in a position where they can feel comfortable that they could do something like this. They can't fuck with CM Punk. He's kind of invincible, but they can fuck well, with everyone else. And that was, that was part of the problem with that. The WWE couldn't fuck with him either because he had, the the power, the privilege, the inclination to just say, fuck you, I'll go home until I want to do something else that I want to do, which he did. And you can't fuck with that. You know, we've been saying it for a while. And we'll say it again so people aren't completely shocked. There are going to be more and more stories coming out of A&W. Coming out of A&W. A&W? <laughs> yeah, the, wait till you find out how they make their root beer. Chimpanzee piss is a fucking secret ingredient. And that's actually going to be the name of this episode, but there's going to be stories coming out of there in the years ahead about the behavior of the executive vice presidents, about the behavior of Kenny. And don't be surprised. The guys that went out of their way to try to present their version of things to a lot of people, that they were the good guys and everyone else is wrong, that these are the bad guys. The guys who are full of shit and the guys who try to fuck over anyone who's not in their clique. Don't be surprised when you hear more about this. We've been telling you about it for a while, sometimes with laughter, but we've been telling you about it for a long time, and now it's out in the open. Now no one can deny it or ignore it anymore, but we've been talking about this, Jim, for a couple of years now, at least. That's true, and also I thought the title of this episode was going to be Melees, Tramps, and Thieves. You know, we usually don't have titles for uh, the drive through but we'll see what happens, but... It's up, to, it's up for grabs. Melees, Tramps, and Thieves, or Chimpanzee Piss? You know, that press scrum and what more audio from the remainder of the scrum later in the show was really something i mean if you really want to do a media scrum with a wrestling media that's how you do it you get headlines you get someone talking real yeah all that's incredible buzz. it wasn't a crummy scrum there may be no waiting at masterwork but apparently there was somebody waiting for cm punk when he got finished with his segment on the media scrum well, we're still finding out details on this. We're still trying to figure it out. I could tell you, as reported by the Wrestling News on this morning's issue or edition of the Wrestling News Wrestling Newscast, wherever you find your favorite podcast, that we reported last night, Fightful Select said that Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks were extremely upset with one source claiming they were threatening to walk over the comments to leave AEW. There was some sort of physical confrontation that took place away from the media, obviously, during the press conference. It actually happened during the Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland uh, sit-down portion, you could see there is video of security running out of the room towards what some people are saying may be CM Punk's locker room. We're still trying to get some details, but... Brian, and then, that poor one guy, he's like, what do they want me to do about this shit? Uh, Brian Alvarez, Wrestling Observer Radio this morning, reported that his sources said the altercation took place between Punk and the Young Bucks. Dave Meltzer called it a melee. The word melee was used. 
Those are all the details we know as of now. Well, hold on. Let's see now. When we come to find more details, let's see if that's true or not, because we don't know. You know, Uncle Dave, sometimes he mixes his metaphors, so let's just see. Melee, according to the American Heritage Dictionary 3rd Edition. Wait a minute, I'm still at mess, which may also be... That's the situation here, yeah. In this situation. Now I've got to meniscus. Well, again, Dave's not calling it a melee. He's saying that's what people have referred to it as to him. Okay, well, let's see what a melee is. Melee, 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 a confused hand-to-hand fighting, a tumultuous mingling. Also, uh, see synonyms (laughs) at brawl. It sounds like a description of the Young Bucks wrestling. What was the first one? (laughs) The first one, confused hand-to-hand <laughs> fighting. So it was a melee, because the Bucks were involved. Tumultuous mingling, that's probably how they procreate through. But nevertheless, so apparently the comments weren't received real well, but apparently, even if there was a melee, uh, they didn't get too froggy because we have not heard of CM Punk being transported to any medical facilities and the same for them. So apparently they were smart and they were just running their mouths instead of trying to back it up. Obviously, this has been a very interesting dynamic. As we said before, a lot of this dynamic has been there since the beginning. It's been there through a lot of the drama with Cody. It's just now it's playing out in public. And part of it's because CM Punk's willing to fight back. And as we said before, These guys in their camp have done everything they can to put down anyone in anything that disagrees with them or doesn't think they're the best thing since sliced bread, to use an old-fashioned expression from the days before sliced bread. Do you know that's not as long ago as most people think? I was watching the food that built America last season, and I think it was only like in the 30s or 40s. So up until then, you didn't have sliced bread. That's right. I saw something, I think, on CBS Sunday Morning at one point, but before we get to... uh, Sliced bread's been in the news a lot lately. That's right. It's one of those finishing maneuvers that makes no sense, I believe. (laughs) But what happens next? If you're Tony Khan, and you could say, oh, he needs an infrastructure, he needs a booker, he doesn't have that right now. If you're Tony Khan right now, realistically, what do you do about a situation if it has now gone beyond CM Punk expressing things publicly beyond Adam Page unprofessionally trying to sabotage his opponent in what would be the first million-dollar gate of the pay-per-view. It's beyond that now. If it really did have some kind of physical altercation in the back, what do you do? Well, you got to... Here's... I don't know whether Tony's got it in him, but the if the executive vice presidents have been given that position, then they have got to be held to a little bit of a higher standard in terms of how they react to things. And since the executive vice presidents, or what, what, is Page an EVP or is, just, is, is he just friends with EVPs? We know of, of, of the, the Hardleys and Twinkle Toes are EVPs. Is Page one as well, or is he just in the protected circle of trust of the friends? He's not an EVP, although he likes to take as much credit as building the revolution or whatever the hell they're right, trying to say right. about what their version of events is. Okay, well, when Page did that thing that he did, if if Tony had been proactive, he would have gone to his EVPs that are good friends of Page's and said, hey, tell the fucking phony cowboy that he's jacking around on live TV with my biggest fucking star before our biggest fucking pay-per-view, and if he does it one more time, he's going to be an unemployed cowboy. Tell him that for me, please. Or if you'd like, I'll tell him myself. But since you guys are friends, you might be able to deliver the message in a little more palatable fashion. But Tony doesn't have it in him to do that because everybody's his friend. So as far as what you do now, depending on how much insufferable douchebaggery has gone on between which of the EVPs and punk... I would think, you know, you have them sit sit them down in a room and say, well, here's the thing. I'm the boss, and you guys got to work together, and the first one that I find running their fucking particular mouth about the other one is going to be done. 
Because I think that Punk, now that he's probably said what he has to say, if he doesn't get any more bullshit like this, either from the Hardly Boys trying to do their whisper campaign or Paige trying to and failing miserably make a profound statement on live TV that nobody's ready for. If that doesn't happen, I assume that he can go right along and do what he's going to be doing. I assume there's going to be no more Punk versus Page matches. And I don't think that Punk was ever going to cross paths inside the ring with the Hardleys to begin with. That wouldn't have made any sense on a variety of levels. So, And Punk's someone who could do something and choose who he wants to work with. Well, there, yeah, and there, there are other be, guys there who can't. There's no reason for him to be in the ring with them to begin with. It's a style clash. It's a fucking genre clash. It's a clash of everything. Well, what I was going to say is I've heard from other people who don't want to do business with Adam Page now because they don't trust him. But they may not be in a position where they could put their foot down about it. Not that they're necessarily getting booked with him right now, but, you know, once you break that trust, I mean, what happens if you're a wrestler and you get known for, I mean, Buddy Rogers got known for injuring guys in the ring, whether he really did or didn't. He became known for that. And yeah. Guys didn't trust him. What happens if you're a wrestler and people don't trust you? Well, then your opponents are limited and then your scope is limited as far as what you can do. And it, 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 even if guys don't have the pull to, to not work with you at all, if they don't trust you, they're not going to go the extra mile. They're not going to, you know, oh, gosh, I really can't take that tonight. You know, I got this back or whatever the case. It's not going to be an optimum situation to have a great match. Yeah, so, Brian. Yeah. If, if we got more scrum, there was something scrumming scrumming uh with jericho well there was lots of other things not just jericho it was a scrummy kind of night but jim before we get going let me just give you a quick update on something we spoke about a little bit earlier a couple reports coming out now on twitter steven muehlhausen who it says here wait wait what muehlhausen steven muehlhausen is he friends with danhausen I, I don't know and now you make me question if this is indeed his real name but he's the boxing MMA and pro wrestling writer for DAZN. And he tweets, Sources, there was an altercation between CM Punk and the Young Bucks early Monday. The Bucks confronted Punk about his comments at the scrum. It did get physical with mm. Punk throwing punches Whoa. at at least one member of the Bucks. <laughs> A number intervened to separate everyone. More to come. And there's also a separate report that I'm seeing here being reported by Sean Ross Sapp that the altercation involved Punk, Ace Steel, and the Elite, but he has not confirmed that yet. So a little bit more getting out about whatever it is that happened. I mean, the whole story will get out sooner or later, but whatever it is that happened backstage. Well, this sounds like it's interesting, and I've, I know Punk's straight edge, but I'm pretty sure he's taken pills bigger than Nick Jackson, and I don't think that Matt Jackson could whip CM Punk, or even half of Punk, if the other half was helping him. So, maybe A. Steele was there just to make sure that Twinkle Toes didn't skip in from the back and pull his hair or something. Yeah, you think Brandon Cutler was there filming it? Hopefully he got he got the filming for being the they're gonna change the name of the show from being the elite to beating the elite. Biting the elite and Larry gets beat, involved. Beat, beat, beat your meat. Oh my god, if if Punk had fucking sicked Larry, well no, but Punk's an animal lover. He wouldn't want Larry biting any of those suet filled, tough, chewy, gristle filled elite <laughs> members. What? I'm sure he gives he feeds Larry a a proper diet of healthy food that a a growing canine deserves instead of just junk meat from the butcher shop. Left gristle. Over. You said gristle. Gristle. Grisly. Gristle. All right, Grisly. Well, let's move on here. <laughs> you gonna just call him Grisly Smith. Well, going back to let's not call him that. Let's not <laughs> call him that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That was a bad joke, but speaking of bad jokes, let's talk a little bit more about this media scrum. Okay, the drive through continues, or for those of you hearing this on YouTube, hello! Because so <laughs> much is happening, we can't ignore things and just do the show as normal. We used to do a late-night drive through this early-morning drive through 
if the if the people only knew, we are recording a segment while you are posting an, a previous segment while a previous show that we have done is still being edited or post-produced for broadcast and we don't know where we all are but things are happening fast in this world yes and thank you to all the very very patient guest artists the dozens of them <laughs> who have been putting up with the chaos the last few days but jim where we last left it because the first people that are going to hear this segment will be on youtube we're working on the drive through this is going to be in the drive through but on youtube everyone heard the breaking news audio your review of the cm punk press scrum audio from all Out, or After All Out, with Tony Khan next to him. We mentioned in that show, which no one's heard yet, that we had heard rumors of some sort of altercation, and we really didn't have too many details. Melee was, was a phrase, a word that was used. Pier 6 Brawl would have been used at another time. <laughs> Batten down or, the hatches. If, if it had been in <laughs> Memphis, Lance Russell would have called it a Donnybrook or a Stemwinder. Well, there was a hell of a stem winder apparently in the back. And since we have finished recording the drive through and since we have put up the audio of your review of the scrum, there's been so much that has happened that here we are breaking into the show with breaking news. And then we still have more shit. There's so much recording going on. I don't know what to do. That's it. That's all I have. Well, let's get to it. Uh, so the press scrum that shook the nation, the scrum heard around the world was followed, apparently, by CM Punk returning to his locker room. Whereupon, at some point soon thereafter, while, as you mentioned, Tony was still doing the, the scrum, uh, one of the re reporters in the room has released video of when they think the, the incident going on in the back became apparent because one of the security guys is seen dashing out of the room in a, in a panic. But anyway, the, the uh, EVPs, the executive vice presidents of All Elite Wrestling, took offense, even though none of their names were mentioned. However, as a group, I believe they were referred to as people that couldn't manage a target. Uh, but uh, the Jackson Boys and Kenny Olivier, I believe the phrase was stormed into CM Punk's locker room. Now, to be fair, they've probably seen a lot of people in video games doing this kind of thing. Well, that, yes, yes. So that's, that's a thing that they would think that, um, that you would do in a video game. We'll talk about here in a minute whether you do it and what the implications are in a professional wrestling locker room. But anyway, and from that point, there are only a few facts that are not in dispute on either side's retelling of the tale. Apparently, uh, those facts that are not in dispute are that CM Punk clocked Matt Jackson, punched him uh, at least once, and then now I'm here possibly multiple times, and that A. Steel got involved. A. Steel, of course, working as a producer backstage in AEW, is also a friend of Punk's and a, a his original trainer. A. Steel apparently popped Nick Jackson with a chair, um, bit Kenny Omega, and pulled his hair at the same time, or possibly at, at different times, but bit and pulled the hair of Harpo. And that's, you know, besides the harp, that hair's his trademark. Now, nobody knows who threw the first punch or whether, actually, probably Punk threw the first punch, but whether there was instigation or it came out of nowhere um those sides differ on that and apparently we don't even know for sure that a steel was in the locker room when the elite stormed in but his wife was because his wife was caring for and watching Larry the dog, who apparently is innocent in all of this, and no charges have been pressed on Larry at this point. So that brings up to me an interesting question, that if if A. Steele, because nobody actually said from the accounts I'm hearing that he was in the room, but he was involved shortly afterwards. Could he have been in the hallway? Whatever the fuck. Does he hear 
his wife yell, well, she wouldn't yell ace. That's not your Chris, help. Whatever comes in, his wife, a dog, and his best friend are getting maligned by three guys that, uh, well, let's face it, there's been ill will to begin with. Are you, you know, what are you going to do, Brian? You're going to take a bite out of somebody or clock somebody with a chair, aren't you? I mean, we don't know what he saw when he came in the room. Well, let's take a step back. We don't okay. know, we don't know what, he, what he saw. We also don't know where he was, like you said. He may have been escorting Punk back to the room after the scrum. Because, again, it just happened right after that, just minutes later. So he may have been in the room with everyone. We also don't know who else was in well, the room. Well, and who is everyone? Yeah. Yeah, we also don't there? know who else was in the room. We're assuming it's just Punk, a dog, and Ace Steel's wife. Maybe Ace Steel, too. Does Punk have any other friends in there? Are there any other wrestlers in there? Punk has been pretty helpful to some of the younger wrestlers. Is anyone hanging around? We don't know that. With Kenny and the Bucks coming in that room, I guess there are two options. One, did they calmly walk down the hall <laughs> saying, you know what? Enough is enough. Let's sit down and let's hash this out. We'll straighten this all out. This whole thing has gone too far. We're all just, we've got We're to adults. rein ourselves in. We're adults here. We're executives. We're making lots of money. Graduates of major universities. Did they walk down the hall like that? Or did they storm down the hall and go into the locker room of the biggest star in the company? Three on one. Or three on one and a dog. Or three on one and a dog and a woman. Again, and a we, woman. Don't know, we don't know what's going on in this room. Did the three of them go and surround him? Did they stand above him while he was sitting down? Was anything? We, I mean, there's so many details we don't know. The only thing that's kind of universally agreed upon is that Nick Jackson got knocked out. It's still kind of, I guess people are saying it is the chair. But is that confirmed? Because I also heard the chair gave him a black eye. What do you think happened with the chair? I don't know. Well, again, how did the chair come into play? Was the chair in the way of the skirmish and it was thrown and whacked the guy? Or did A Steel pick up a chair and perform a the fucking Paul Bunyan shot to the face? I mean, that. Hey, if something happened with Punk and Matt Jackson that led to Punk apparently taking a swing at him, we don't even know if he hit him or not. And I'm not saying Punk couldn't have hit him, but we just don't know. But well, no, I think that's one of the things that everybody's agreeing on is, is, that, is that Punk punched him. The question was, was there instigation and or how many times and or etc. So if Punk hit Matt Jackson and Nick and Kenny are still there, so it's now, I'm just trying to figure out how this all happens because it's still the, they have the numbers well, they game. Obviously, it wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be fair if they jumped in because then it'd be three on one. So obviously they're going to stand there with their dicks in their hands and do nothing. Right? <laughs> or you jump in and try to help your brother beat up the guy whose career you've been trying to sabotage for a fucking while. That would and be all an option as well. And all of a sudden you're hitting the head with a chair because you're assaulting someone. And you know, the other thing, I, I hate to go off a little bit here, but everyone's talking about, you know, everyone's clammed up on this because there are legal implications across the board. There's an assault in the back. But this isn't the only incident, but this is certainly the biggest public incident. When it comes to the questionable behavior and decision-making of executive vice presidents in that company, take out of the equation that it's Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, the wrestlers, that you may not like their wrestling. Let's look at them as executive vice presidents in Tony Khan's company. This, a very public display here, this was what they thought was the good decision. Not to go and sit down with Tony and talk to Tony, not to wait until the next day. No, let's go have it out right now. They're not wrestlers doing that. They're executives in the company. That opens AEW up to a problem because one could argue what is bullying and what isn't bullying. You don't have to be the biggest, toughest guy to be a bully. There's other types. And if these guys who are executives, which makes them above all the wrestlers there, are exerting their power in this way, storming into Punk's locker room, causing a confrontation that wasn't going to happen... They're executives. They're not just wrestlers. They're executives of the company at a minimum. And before you even get to who gets what, they should be stripped of their executive titles immediately. Because this is, again, this is public. There are other things that aren't public. But the behavior of the executives is certainly not the behavior of any executive in any successful company. Well, and then also somebody's going to say, well, but Punk said that stuff at the scrum. Well, Punk was, uh, Punk's comments were in response to 
not only their good friend Hangnail uh, actually on national television going into business for himself and trying to bury the guy, but Punk's belief that the EVPs themselves are the ones that have been spreading the whole Coke. Oh, he got Coke Cabana fired or tried to get Coke Cabana fired business. And that was obvious as well. So it's not like that he just blew up at the press scrum and had Tourette's all of a sudden and decided to just start this whole thing. But nevertheless, you also talk about executive vice presidents. This is why the number one wrestling for a hundred years didn't have executive vice presidents. Number two, why it never should have any that are active wrestlers because, and as we can I can give you some examples here in a few minutes. Um, People storming into other people's locker rooms in the wrestling business is not a new thing, and physical altercations resulting from same is not a new thing. But can you think of any time where an executive vice president of a company, publicly traded or not, uh, in modern history has ever stormed in somewhere and gotten in a physical altercation, whether they instigated it physically or whether they just instigated it by walking into the fucking room. That can you, can you see old Chip Burnham in the TBS WCW days? I could see him kicking open the door and fucking snatching goddamn Gary Royal around the neck or something. No, they're executive vice presidents. They, what they should have done Immediately, because the EVP thing kind of trumps being one of the boys. That's when now you're in office. You're, you're office now. You're not one of the boys. There's an so, issue with the balance of power in any situation like this because of well, the three but, executives well, standing over him. That's what I'm saying. So they should have had the good sense instead of going in to Punk's locker room. And also, if they weren't smart enough, take a fucking witness on their side, and apparently they're not because nobody's fucking making them look like angels in this. Everybody's shut up, which means there's fucking shit fault on all sides. But the, instead, they should have gone to Tony Khan. As soon as he walked out of that media scrum, they should have been standing there with their arms folded going, well, now, Tony, we're the vice presidents. Even if he's the world champion, what are you going to do about this shit? Because then, that not only are they covered as executive vice presidents, they've gone to the boss, but then later on, at a Denny's somewhere, they could have an issue that wouldn't have got quite so much attention. But uh, nevertheless, the it, it just it, I know that neither the Hardleys nor Olivier know anything really about the wrestling business and have no idea what the history of it is or what the meaning of things is are. But when you fucking bust into somebody's locker room after an emotional incident like that, you might not be going to have a fight, but you have to be obviously aware that one may take place. And in most situations where somebody does bust into a locker room, something does fucking happen. So I don't know how that they thought that somehow they were going to go in there and fucking tongue lash a motherfucker to his face and or whatever else happened in that situation and something not happen. That's fucking insane. So apparently now, um, the oh, one report was that police were involved. And uh, obviously, who the fuck did that? That's, uh, you know... Well, to be fair, could they have been there as opposed to someone snitching on this incident? Well, okay, but that hopefully that may have been the case because they're in a fairly big building and I'm sure there was a lot of yelling and shit going on, so maybe that was... And we haven't heard that any uh, charges were pressed, but that would add an extra level of fucking heat. Be and that's the reason why that in the days of wrestling, when guys did get in fucking fights, and I mean, we've heard stories of, you know, the hotel room where fucking my via tried to bite Robinson's face off and fucking severe assaults. Cops never heard about it because if you call the cops in those days, 
it would a either make the papers or b just go to court you go you're under oath and all these other things and it might expose the business so in those days when guys got in a fight and they were in the same territory they had three choices one was get over it and fucking become friends again and move on which some people did two was give your notice to leave the territory or three was get even some kind of way and then probably get fired but those those were your three options police were not a fucking option. And then if you've got a deal where some guy has to go to court for something for fuck's sake, then he's really going to go back and kick some other motherfucker's ass or take a shot when he gets it. So that didn't happen in the old days, but this apparently attracted enough attention in the building because apparently there were, as we mentioned, only a couple people or a few people, small number in the room. And then Everything happened, and apparently after the physical altercation, it went on for some time as everybody was pulled apart with uh, fucking yelling and screaming and cussing. And one of the best uh, things that ever happened to Twitter it was the <laughs> when somebody's already tweeted this morning the picture of the Bucks sitting in chairs and then the Dark Side of the Ring logo and so, I don't know, we busted in the locker room. The next thing I know, Matt's on the ground and Steele's eating Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so have you gotten any uh, updates on anybody else claiming that they were there? I'm sure in, in a few years, 150, 200 wrestlers will claim that they were there. But have you heard anything uh, updating the melee? Well, what I could say is a couple things. One, again, we still don't know a lot of the details. AEW has instructed wrestlers, even if they weren't there, to not say anything about this. From the best of what we know, the wrestling news can report there have been suspensions issued by AEW to personnel involved in this situation. That's all I could say about that right now. But there have been, at a minimum, suspensions issued from AEW itself to people involved in this. Whether those are paid or unpaid suspensions, we will find out, but we'll keep working on that story. I guess the big question is, and we'll talk a little bit more about another thing in a second, we're recording this on Tuesday. Tomorrow's Dynamite. You know, we'll see who's there and who isn't there. <laughs> If you're Tony Khan, how do you handle this? The wings may be spicy in Buffalo tomorrow. I, you know, honestly, no, we have not heard any indication that uh, anybody has stormed out. Uh, I think probably they're going to wait and see how this is handled. I'm saying stormed out of the company. Obviously, they left the building in Chicago. Punk's a pro. I would think that uh, he's willing to come and work and carry the company on his back and be the world champion. Possibly Tony might have to send the children home for a few weeks because they're the ones that came to where he was and in larger numbers than him. And obviously that wasn't, uh, if you wanted to, have a conversation about anything that probably wasn't the time after a long show and tensions running high. And as a matter of punk was still sitting there, he hadn't even had time to take a shower. We still sitting there with blood on him from the match. So I assume that was the same thing. So, you know, since Kenny and the bucks were on early, they'd had time to shower and calm down and, you know, be just chilling and relaxing. Brush Since their they hair. were the second match, brush their hair. They were the second match, one of the preliminaries. So they had plenty of time to compose themselves. Whereas this guy's been working hard, being the main event on a million dollar house and shit. But you're looking um, at it from one side, and that's the problem. What if, and you don't know what happens, you don't know what goes on in people's personal play lives. Play devil's advocate. I'm playing devil's advocate. What if minutes before this, Kenny Omega broke up with the bird he was dating in the sim app he plays? Well, now, then, of course, his emotions would have been running high as well. So, the, you know, but in all seriousness, here's the thing. I keep, again, hearing this shit on Twitter and people are saying, well, punk always has a problem with everybody. 
Punk's apparently to me, and that's kind of what got him over with me. I mean, I've never said he was goddamn second coming or Ricky Steamboat in the ring, but the guy's got a mind to be able to tell a story and he can talk. But what gets him over with me is he doesn't put up with bullshit and says what he thinks. And if he makes himself valuable to a place, then he expects to be uh, rewarded for that, but he then follows through with what he says he's going to do. And he doesn't put up, like I said, with bullshit and has, uh, I think, over the last, what? What's it been since that interview that Paige did? couple months before that, the Colt Cabana rumors have been going around for three or four months or whatever the case. And he finally, uh, I've had all I can stand, can't stand no more, and that's why he addressed it. And that's why he addressed it at the press scrum because the press are the ones that have been spreading all this shit because all of the darling websites are in goddamn, you know, the, 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 uh, they're members of the lollipop guild. They belong to the Cucamonga kids. And that's where he knew it was coming from. So he finally decided, all right, here we are. Let's just fucking bring us all out in the open. But so people saying punk always has a problem with everything. Look back. How many problems have the supposed elite been in the middle of? Personal issues, that uh, problems with the AEW. You know, sometimes I forget what's publicly known, and sometimes I forget yeah, what's you, not. you got to be a little careful here. I'm so gonna... I don't want to. <laughs> but, you know, but we're getting a pretty good track record here brian for people coming around saying you know they were saying that about a year and a half ago and son of a bitch wouldn't you know so and so did get fucking run off or so and so did leave or so and so was accused or whatever the case i'm just saying if you look at the interpersonal relationships of the aew roster and problems amongst same you get some member of the elite or their Literal high school friends. No, I'm sorry. Cutlet was grade school. Grade school friends at, involved in it. Or them picking sides in it. And this is now starting to come out. Because once again, okay, I'll liken the analogy to Sonny and Sable. I said... Hey, why wasn't he filming I, it? Where was Cutler with the camera? Well, yeah, hold on. I said one time I said, Sonny was an upfront. She was talented, she was good at what she did, but she was a bitch, and you knew it, and she'd probably admit it and do it right in front of you. Whereas Sable was an undercover <laughs> She'd smile to everybody's face, especially people that were more important than, than, you know, she was and could get her ahead somewhere. And then elsewise, it was, she was a bitch. So I think CM Punk is the upfront <laughs> He may be a little asshole sometimes, but he'll tell you why and he'll tell you who. Whereas the other ones, they like to run their little mealy butt munchers behind people's backs. And sometimes people have had all they can stands and they can't stands no more. But I think everybody should, when the story of all this is written, look at the uh, locker room beefs and see who the common denominator is before CM Punk ever even got there who the common denominator is. You know, Jim, and again, you brought up the Cabana thing earlier. Remember, if Cabana had been released with everyone else, Jelly Nutella and Marco Stunt and all those other people, that would have been it. It would have been gone. And I think that was the path he was well, on. Well, that was the path, because remember, that were they released or their contracts just expired right. and they hadn't used right. them in a while and they just went away? Well, that's when Cabana's contract was expiring. And that was Tony's passive aggressive way to say sayonara and then the hardleys went in to bat for him and got him signed to a non-existent promotion ring of honor yeah so a guy who's not generating any money for the company who doesn't mean anything to the company in terms of ratings or drawing people or anything someone who even if you like him and you're a fan of his someone who means nothing to the bottom line whose contract was going to be a thing of the past and they can move on We've seen what happened to other Dark Order members. All of a sudden, and what got in the Observer was that the Jacksons, I think Nick Jackson specifically, the knocked out Jackson, <clears throat> he went and got Cole Cabana a job with Ring of Honor. He got Tony to do that. And then the stories start coming out that 
CM Punk tried to cost Colt Cabana his job. And that's why CM Punk got mad about this whole thing. That's basically it. And the kids started their whisper campaign and throwing tantrums, you know, about something. Because they're, they're, here's the whole thing. They've been exposed. And they're jealous. We started this. It's ours where we can play with all of our friends and do our cosplay trampoline wrestling. We don't want real stars coming in, doing real matches, drawing real money. So that's why they created their little six-man thing, so they could all play together. And every time that it's come on for the past three weeks, 200,000 people have said, fuck it! We don't want to see this! And they're, they're, the pressure is on them because they're being seen through. And their friends are as unprofessional and mostly untalented, and in some cases just blithering dipshits. And, and I'm sure the stress is there, but... <laughs> They accepted the job of being executive vice presidents, so therefore you can't storm into the fucking boys' locker room and fucking tell them off for se- telling the truth in public. They've disqualified themselves from being able to do it. When you're, the, when you're one of the boys, you, well, you used to have that right. I don't know now anymore. They'd probably call the cops if somebody came in or whatever the fuck. But uh, no, if you stormed into somebody's locker room in the old days, you assumed you were going there to either hear what you wanted to hear or fight. There wasn't really any backups to that. In terms of, so, Tony, in terms of Tony Khan, though, and putting yourself in Tony's position, and not to make any jokes about Tony, but legitimately putting you in Tony's yeah. position here, I guess you have to be angry at everyone to an extent, but there's different kinds of anger. Ace Steel is one thing. CM Punk's one thing. But the anger with the executives who are representing your company, who there are other issues with, that's where it becomes another thing. So how do you think Tony deals with each individual party here? Or how should he? I think, obviously, I think the executive vice president thing needs to go away because they're a legal liability now. Because if anything else happens where they are even remotely uh, culpable in instigating it, now they've got a track record. And then whatever wrestler involved can just, okay, unsafe work environment. Remember that from Shawn Michaels in Hartford, Connecticut? And they can just sue Tony and get their money that they would be paid for wrestling and more without ever having to take a bump. So the executive vice president thing has to go away, and no active wrestler should be executive vice presidents in the company. It was bad enough when they were just a wrestler in a territory and being the booker with no contracts and nothing in writing, and the promoter could just fire him if he wanted to or whatever the fuck. But this is way too legally entangled now, and there's a lot of large sums of money going on. Who's, t- who's Tony going to be mad at? Everybody, including himself. He was sitting next to the fucking guy for 20 minutes while he said these things. So, and he was nodding his head while Punk said them. So that either means that he agreed with it or he's just lost and didn't know how to tell his star, hey, give him the Iggy under the table or reach over and give him the office and go, hey, we'll talk about this later, Ixnay, whatever the fuck. But then, since he sat there and listened to that, I'm sure that he was not hearing. Does anybody out there think that Tony Khan was hearing those things from CM Punk for the very first time? No way. In public in a media scrum? No way. Of course not. So he's heard it before, and apparently he's not done anything to address it to anybody's satisfaction. So who should he be mad at? First, his executive vice presidents, regardless, for walking into the storming, walking, motivating into the locker room, three on one, because that's the way that they were looking at. They didn't. They obviously didn't tell Punk, "Hey, go get two more guys." If there were some around, it wasn't their fault. So they go three on one to the guys' locker room. So the vice presidents, I'd be mad at them. I'd be mad at myself because I've been hearing this, obviously, for some time, privately, Can and I stop haven't done you anything about it. Yeah, let me stop you there, just because that's a big point. 
And I feel bad for Tony because of this whole situation, but Tony's also the blame for a large part of the situation. We've been talking here on this show for a very long time about internal problems, backstage problems. We were talking about him when they were a lot more benign. And a lot of those reasons they were benign is because Cody Rhodes dealt with things in a very different way. But these issues have been there from the beginning. And they've gotten worse. And we've talked about it. We've talked about the growing problems. We've said that someone needed to step in. We said there needed to be a better management structure. There needed to be a better way of doing all this. Tony has tried to do things. We've seen some of the hires, Sanjay Dutt and Pat Buck and Ace Steel. I mean, we'll see what happens there. But then we heard about this meeting. You know, we're talking about this, but this isn't the only AEW backstage drama. There's whatever's going on with Thunder Rosa. There's Eddie Kingston and Sammy Guevara. There's all sorts of shit. The shit that's not public. They had this meeting. Tony is animated, we heard, passionate about his company. It's his company. Yeah. If we take Chris Jericho at his word, and we'll play that audio on the drive through because we already recorded it, us reviewing him during the press scrum, Chris Jericho, who we may not see eye to eye with on everything, sounds like he stood up and he said, there are certain ways we should do things, certain things we shouldn't do. Maybe he should follow his own advice at times, but it sounded like he actually gave pretty sound advice. We heard Tony Schiavone stood up, and it was rather nice. No one had a problem with it. Even the Young Bucks, even if you thought they were full of shit, which they usually are, come talk to us, our locker room's open. Omega got up there and turned turned it into a contentious thing. Eight out of ten of them wouldn't be good enough to work for Kenny Omega. They don't work as hard as Kenny Omega. Yeah, he actually said, if it had been up to me, I wouldn't have hired 80% of you. That's, 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 that's like going back. Remember when Bischoff had the meeting and said the only people in the room that is drawing money is who was it? Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage. And there was flair sitting there. You know, we've talked about it. I said it a few weeks ago. Meg is going to be the next one out the door. His behavior is going to become a big part of the story. It's been unreported. It's been ignored. And his behavior in that meeting didn't do anything to help any issues. It drove a bigger wedge in the issues. So we're coming out of that, and the next public thing we know about is him and the Bucks storming into CM Punk's dressing room. I understand a lot of people think CM Punk's a dick, and at times he could be a dick, and he'll probably tell you he's a dick at times. We all could be dicks. Some of us could be big dicks. Quit bragging. But that doesn't mean that he's necessarily wrong. And you may not conduct yourself the way CM Punk would or say the things he would, and I get that a lot, so I understand it. But that doesn't mean he's wrong, and he's voicing concerns for a lot of issues. Quite frankly, he's voicing it for a lot of wrestlers that don't have the voice in the platform that CM Punk has. Some people may get upset about it. Maybe Kevin Owens will put out a little cute tweet. But to some people, he is a locker room leader. And the way this all went down, to the people that are predisposed to love the Bucks and Omega and want to just believe that they're just wonderful people that love teddy bears and save old women from fires or whatever it is. Sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, waterfalls. There's very little you could say. I mean, they're just, they like their guys. And I get it, you like your guys. There are people that, you know, still like Woody Allen films. The people like their guys. However, their behavior, privately, or not in the public domain, the stories, and now we hear about some of this stuff publicly, is the biggest part of the backstage problem in AEW. All Friends Wrestling was real, but after a while, there weren't really cliques of friends anymore. There was just one giant clique of friends. And if you weren't playing with them and their friends in their way, it was like you didn't exist. That's the reason the Cody-verse happened, because all of a sudden, he couldn't interact with any of them. Remember they had to have their faces blurred out of the Cody Rhodes reality show? <laughs> So I think that's... Well, in all, in all fairness, I would have asked for that too, but I see where you're going. Yeah, but I think that's the thing. CM Punk could be a jerk, and he could handle himself in ways that other people may not, but that doesn't mean he's wrong about all this. And here's the thing, C- Cody also, you know what? He, like you said, he's an executive, he's a professional, he wants to be on TV, he had bigger thoughts. He just, you know what, it's not worth fucking with these children. I'll just go over here and make my big splash and, you know, say sayonara. But with Punk, he doesn't want, need, or have to go back to the WWE. And 
he he's like, hey, I don't need to go any fucking where. Fuck you. And that's the difference, and that's why it's getting a little more public. Anyway. One more thing before we wrap up. Again, this is a breaking news audio update for YouTube. It'll be in the body of the drive through which will eventually be released when stories stop happening. But according to a front-page story on the Wrestling Observer Newsletter website, F4WOnline.com, Bobby Fish issues invitation to AEW's CM Punk for a fight. Fish commented on the issues between Punk and the Elite on his podcast. Boy, everyone has a podcast. <laughs> Let's get some quotes here. Get your thoughts, Jim. Let's make this a formal invitation to Phil. I'm down. If that's the direction he wants to go, and I mean, he could pick the time, the place, we can do it in Chicago. I mean, that would be kind of fun, right? It could be boxing. It could be kickboxing. It could be MMA. I mean, we could do this bare knuckled. Whatever sounds good to Phil. He could pick the weight. He could pick the place. It's like a song. Like I said, whatever he wants to do. But yeah, let's make this official. Uh, there's a little more here, but let me stop right there. What do you think of Bobby Fish? The last we heard, he had just left AEW having issues there. And now all of a sudden he's, again, longtime cohorts with the friends of Bucks and one of them the himself. The Buckaroos. He is a longtime, one of the older Buckaroos. Remember when the Musketeers got older, but yeah. they still had the things on their head? He's one of the older Buckaroos. Well, I hate to hear this because I like Bobby Fish. I worked with him, you know, briefly at Ring of Honor. He's an older guy. He's older than the rest of this group. I thought he was more mature. He's an excellent talent uh, as he's trained a lot in kickboxing, MMA, or whatever. I hate to hear that, you know, but he was obviously part of the undisputed elite, and I guess he's done a bunch of pro wrestling chimpanzee shows out in... Rancho Cucamonga. Um, so he's on their side, but I mean, you know, it, I guess it's good to get attention and he's making a statement that, Hey, if I'd have been there, which probably makes them sorry, they didn't go to bat for him more. Uh, but if I'd have been there, I would have taken care of the situation. Yeah, if but, FDR had been there, would have kicked all your asses. So shut well, up. I was about to say yeah. then, you know, <laughs> then if so-and-so had been there, then we got a 12 man and fuck, then we have to do the football field fuckery match. But, um, with it, it's nice of Bobby to say that and take up for his friends, I guess, but obviously it's ridiculous. And a lot of people will go, well, yeah, he probably kicked Punk's ass because Punk lost in UFC. Again, A, Bobby Fish never fought in the UFC. And B, Punk ain't gonna fight anybody for fucking free <laughs> because he's making seven figures a year to be the AEW world champion. And he just got hurt accidentally. He's not going to fight anybody for free. So it's a grandstand challenge. Um, no, I think it's a good but, idea. I think CM Punk should go fight out of work wrestlers who call him out. Yeah. But yeah and I'm, you know, but it's a great so, idea. <laughs> so I was sorry to see that, but I, and I have the article here also, I pulled it up because this was, this is what you never know about people. As Like I said, I've always liked Bobby Fish, but he says about the buckaroos, I love those guys. I love them. They're good people. They got kids. They got wives. They're God-fearing good human beings. So I guess he's on the Jesus train, and that's the connection. Uh, but anyway, but yeah, so Bobby, uh, grandstand challenge there. I don't know that, uh, well, it's, he says it's not even a challenge. It's an invitation. Because he says, because at the end of the day, like, who am I? I'm nobody. So there you go. We've answered our own question. My favorite is the quote here at the end of this article. Fish also addressed Ace Steel allegedly having thrown a chair at Nick Jackson and bitten Kenny Omega. <laughs> the quote, I know Ace, and that's surprising to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's not really. If he, if, if, and again, I'm going to go with Ace Steel. Either seeing his wife and a fucking innocent dog in a locker room along with his friend and three guys and decided to fucking even things up and just was in the wrong place at the wrong time uh, to get all this blame on him or whatever. But nevertheless, um, and, and by the way, Bobby Fish in another uh, statement had said that the reason he just left AEW was because... Besides the fact that his contract expired, 
he couldn't even get Tony Khan to sit down and talk to him just to give him permission to do a kickboxing fight since he wasn't being booked in AEW because everybody else in his goddamn stable is injured and is having surgery. And so Tony's the boss, and here's Bobby Fish, and he says, since May, I've tried to get Tony Khan to sit down with me no less than five times to ask permission to do a kickboxing fight. I could never nail Tony down. You know, but what the, how long does that take? Tony, can I do this kickboxing fight? Eh, or sure. Can we film it? Whatever the fuck. He just ignores people, apparently. Well, he says it's been happening since May. Maybe Tony was busy with Colt Cabana contract renegotiations. I mean, yeah, well, yeah. Other you know, that's, they got to put more important things first, I know. But still, so that, I mean, again, so, and then they did the angle. I forgot about it. They split up the undisputed elite so they could bring Twinkle Toes back. And then Cole still hurt. O'Reilly had surgery and they just let Fish's contract expire. Never had one goddamn match. Booker of the year. No wonder. It's chaos because they, the, the, the EVPs decide they want to do something and they put it in motion. It all falls apart and there everybody's standing there with Pete in hand. When the suspensions are lifted, we'll see who gets the first match on the Dynamite after that. If it's the Bucks and Omega, they've learned their lesson. They don't want to be last because they're afraid of the falling numbers. Yeah, the, well, do they want to be first right after Big Bang Theory and see that goddamn precipitous drop? <laughs> we'll see what the fuck happens. What else we got to talk about on this special edition? I think that may be it for this special edition. We can get back to the regular edition, which we're actually still in the process of recording. It's a two-day recording. There's so much happening, and so much of it sucks. We still, and the, and the WWE did 60,000 people at a stadium, and we haven't had time to talk about them yet. <laughs> yeah, they didn't even have a real castle. I'm still pissed off about that. That was what I wanted. But they should have brought the whole Viking boat in. Close it up. I'm going to close it up. Well, for some people, I'm going to close it up. We will be back on the drive through and, of course, the experience wherever you find your favorite podcast. And, of course, this drive through episode will be out in the regular podcast feed in the next day or so. But... Thank you for subscribing to the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel and tell me so what we have here is failure to communicate. And I, I, I appreciate and want to say thank you to all of the people who have been tweeting and writing in and etc. saying that, well, Cornette and Last have been calling us for a couple or three years and we're finally finding out that they were ahead of the game on this. But now here's the situation in AEW. Their biggest star is not only injured, but he's suspended. Their entire roster of EVPs, the ones that are remaining, Cody already hit the fucking back door, they're suspended. They have gotten a ridiculous amount of bad publicity. And more importantly, the fans are picking sides. So even if, even if all of this is somehow miraculously smoothed over, the fans are already going to have a negative viewpoint of one side or the other in this thing. And in many cases, it's baby faces that they're going to be fucking mad at and have a negative opinion of. And the whole company looks like shit because of, you know, shit trickles down like everything else. And from the top, that's what we've gotten. And it's not just it's not just the cosplay wrestling fans and the childish contingent of wannabe indie rific wrestlers. It's also grown adult people that realize that this is not good for anybody. And so, yes, you have the California contingent trying to do everything they can behind people's backs and whisper campaigns to put heat on punk and anybody that fucking sides with punk because for all the reasons we've mentioned not only are they upset about their positions but they're they feel threatened because their friends have positions too that they don't deserve but everybody's looked like shit in this because tony wouldn't do anything from the start to prevent this from happening. <clears throat> and we mentioned, you know, the, the 
the the fact that there's no way he's hearing any of this stuff for the first time when it comes out on the internet or on Twitter or in the reports or whatever, or in front of him at media scrums, he's heard it before. He hadn't been able to do anything. I got an email from an actual grown adult out there in the cult of Cornette who doesn't know any of these people personally, but he had a pretty good take on it. From Nick, Jim, your frequent comparisons to what would or wouldn't happen in mainstream pro sports contest are accurate and how the CM Punk elite conflict has been covered by wrestling quote-unquote journalists is another example. As someone who works in sports journalism, it has been galling to watch. From the journalists applauding wrestlers entering the press conference to the takes on the fight, any sports writer, whether they cover high schools or pros, would die to get the type of honesty Punk gave. Secondly, if it was so awful and so unprofessional, why didn't Tony Khan cut in to stop Punk or tell reporters to limit questions to the night's match? And as a journalist, I'd want to know why executives are scuffling with employees, and if they were, why they were still executives. When reading some of the stories, it's blatant that only one side talks to reporters and the stories are skewed in that direction. And let's face it, also, that's that's true as well, because the people taken up for punk are taking up for punk purely because they can see what's going on in front of them. There's been no whisper campaign with, oh, those guys. We can see it straight out, and everybody else can. But punk's not feeding shit to the press. That's the other side's uh, wheelhouse. So anyway, uh, Nick continues, Anyone thinking AEW would be better off with the elite than Punk is out of their depth. Sports history has proven the all-pro quarterback, the leading scorer on a basketball team, or the guy who leads the league in home runs gets more leeway. He's the only mainstream star with ratings and merchandise sales to back it up. If Tony can't see that, it's just confirmation AEW isn't an organization to take seriously long-term. So. That's an example from somebody in has a, a journalistic background, but is seeing what's going on. Here's another thing. Dave Shearer at PW Insider wrote a column. This was from uh, Thursday, I believe, September the 8th. That was Thursday, right? I encourage you, if you can, to find it. It's, it's long and it's very perceptive, and I was going to read it, but now I realize it'd take me 30 minutes to read it. So I've got a couple of paragraphs. And the reason this caught my eyes is because he started with a Mama Cornette quote. Only he attributed it, well, he attributed it to his old boss, Gary Snellbaker, where he used to work for him at the Coca-Cola company. Sounds fake. But, Sounds like a fake name. Well, he said the same thing. Mama Cornette, whenever we'd have a family get together, we're going to go out fishing or we're going to go to the store at, at holidays, Thanksgiving dinner, whatever. We're supposed to all do something as a group, but everybody's standing around waiting for somebody else to take the lead and nobody's doing anything. And that's when Mama Cornette would jump in and say, all right, let's do something, even if it's wrong. Meaning, let's do fucking something. And that's what he started the column with. But it was a quote from his old boss, Gary Snellbaker. Do something, even if it's wrong. Do something, Tony. Here's an excerpt. From the beginning, Tony has seemed to be more concerned with being a fan who was able to hang around with wrestlers and book a fantasy federation in real life rather than a leader who would grow a company that could maybe someday compete with WWE. He had the money, but he didn't have the leadership skills, and with each passing day, the latter becomes more and more apparent. I remember back at Halloween of the first year when he dressed up like Orange Cassidy and sent pictures of it out on social media. I called it a bad move that will send the wrong message to the talent. Some scoffed at me. Tony's just having fun, they said. He's one of us. Yes, that's the point. The owner of the company should never come off as a cosplaying mark because most wrestlers Jeez. are predatory animals. And once they see that kind of weakness, they take advantage and they realize they have freedom that they shouldn't possess. That's absolutely true. That throughout the history of wrestling, that's true. The vibe of AEW being Disney World for wrestlers 
had long since dissipated when Adam Page went on TV on the go-home show before his title defense against CM Punk and double-crossed the challenger by going into business for himself with a bizarre promo that made no sense at all, especially for a babyface taking on another babyface. At that very point in time, Tony Khan was at a seminal moment in the history of the company. Page, who I was very happy to hear get some deserved booze last night, started AEW going down the toilet with his actions, and Khan exacerbated it by doing absolutely nothing about it. And then he mentioned, of course, Punk got hurt. So his anger at Page stewed while he waited for revenge. When he came back, he got his receipt on national TV by also going into business for himself. Khan could have done something then as well to defuse the situation. But again, he played the fiddle while his Rome was burning. And also while Punk was out, someone leaked to some favorable reporters that Punk had gotten Cole Cabana fired. It was widely reported by outlets, even though there was no truth to it at all. What did Tony Khan do? Not a damn thing until the story had blown up and turned into a disaster. By the time he finally said, yeah, that isn't true, it was far too late and serious damage had been done, and it all falls on Khan's ineffective at best leadership. And then he mentioned you got CM Punk, a man with a history of not taking being dis disrespected, lying down. And there you go. This is a long and interesting and perceptive yeah, article perceptive. on the situation. And that was just a part of it. So PWInsider.com. But again, grown a, that Dave Shearer has been a wrestling fan for 40 years. And now he owns the website, but he doesn't go to live matches and go to scrums and talk to the boys individually and become friends with them. He is running a business of a website and he likes wrestling, but he doesn't immerse himself in being friends with anybody to take their side. He calls it like he sees it because he's removed. He's impartial. And yeah, a lot of people can say we ain't impartial. But we're also very perceptive, and we see what's going on, and we know what's happening, and we have for a while. And the whole thing boils down to <laughs> when you create Disney World for wrestlers, you not only let them do whatever the fuck they think they want to do, but you let them get the idea that they can do whatever they want to do. And sometimes that's not limited to creativity in a wrestling ring. That's then they get the feeling, well, this place can't run without us. And then when Twinkle Toes comes back and every week his match loses 200 something thousand viewers, then they start getting nervous. And then they start trying to figure out some way that they can fuck with the people who are out drawing them. And then there you go. So, and, and here's another. <laughs> We've overlooked this. It was announced this past week that the WWE has hired the guy that used to run the Oakland Raiders. So now they have, they hired the biggest mover and shaker agent in Hollywood that's making them a bloody fucking fortune, Nick Khan, jolly old St. Nick. They hired the guy that used to run the Oakland Raiders talent to be in charge of talent relations, not booking but relating with the talent, the contracts, and the fucking big-time players. Tony Khan hired Matt Jackson's wife and grade school friends. Let that sink in for a minute. So then you've got this mess going on where one side's serious about the wrestling business and the other side's serious about their own business. And and the show is schizophrenic. And all this is starting to come to a head. And Tony still can't get in and do anything about it. So now there's an independent third-party investigation. I'd like to know who the independent third party is. But what is there to investigate? Is there only one investigation? That's what I'd like to know. Well, but what is there to investigate? So this fucking guy, Adam Page goes out and tries to bury the top star in the company on national television. And I guarantee you, 
that any time in the history of this business, the Attitude Era, the territories, whatever, you got two guys doing promo for a world title match and one of them tries to bury the other one on live television and he don't know what's coming. I'm surprised you didn't see physical violence there and it would have been entirely justified. Motherfucker ever went into business for me on uh, with me on for himself on television and tried to bury me, he would have got a fucking racket. But so you've got a guy that does that to your biggest star and world champion. Then the guy gets a chance to sit home and stew about it for a while, comes back and gets his receipt in very effective fashion. And then to the rest of them that have been spreading the rumors that he's sick and fed up with, he tells them at the media scrum, if you got any problem with me, then come to my locker room. Thinking that the gutless pussies would never do it. But they did. They didn't, the EVPs, they didn't go Tony Khan, boss of this organization, guy that was sitting right next to him when he said all those things and you didn't say boo to a goose or try to argue with anything. So what are you going to do about it now? Because now we're pissed. No, they didn't do that. What they did was they go over to his locker room. A bunch of them. A lot of people have said three, but... A lot more people than that got suspended. Brandon Cutlet got suspended. Michael Naka Naka to fuck off got suspended. Kenny Omega's Our, assistant. Let's just throw that in there. Kenny Omega's assistant and the Young Bucks' grade school friend. Does anybody think that they were storming in that locker room to pull shit apart? So there's Punk. Now we know not only was he after the media scrum, he was still bleeding from the match. Now we know he was hurt with a torn tricep at least it was <laughs> maybe it was torn after the match or maybe it was torn in this skirmish who knows but he's after a match he's tired he's hurt he's bleeding and now we also know from testimony and from things that have gotten out that he's in his locker room with his dog and a steel's wife who now apparently we come to find out is on crutches She's got some kind of injury. Did she break her leg? I don't know what the fuck, but Punk is sitting in his locker room, beat up, banged up, and bleeding with a dog and a crippled woman when anywhere from three to six grown men burst into the room however they say they want to do it. They Somebody said, well, you can't kick those doors down. I don't think that any of the body in the, the elite could kick a goddamn door down if it was a door that you could kick down. But they sure apparently opened it in a surprising manner. And these guys rush into this fucking room. What's he supposed to do? He's just told them if they had a problem to come to his locker room. Apparently they got a problem. They've come to the locker room. And there's three to six of them. And there's one of him, and he's got a dog and a crippled woman as a backup. Are you going to sit there and say, hey, guys, did you come here to talk to me while they pounce on you? Or are you going to take the one in the lead down, which I assume that's what jolly old Matt was, because he was the first one that was involved in this, apparently. And he got the shit beat out of him, and then there's still a bunch more, but they've made enough noise that a steal somewhere down the hall, sees that the room that his crippled wife is in and his best friend is in, somebody's just burst through the door and there's all kinds of shit going on. And so also, he comes in. Go ahead. And this is around the time we also know now from reporting Pat Buck at some point got in that room. And he's another, I don't know if he's a producer. I have the exact title somewhere, but not in front of me. But he's a backstage, I think, vice president, actually, of talent. Well, he after the big... Uh, promotions of the few weeks ago but a steel comes in and he sees his best friend in a skirmish with three to six other people in the room where his wife is either still in or just trying to get out of so he takes matters in his own hands because i'd do the same thing and <laughs> The fucking elite gets a shit kicked out of him by a fucking guy that's bleeding with a torn tricep and a fucking retired producer. And that don't set well with him either. 
Hey, let me ask you this. And then, well, one more thing. And then when when all this when everybody realizes what's happened here, then all of a sudden, from the EVP side, it's well, we just went to talk to him. You probably should have waited. If all you wanted to do was talk, you probably should have waited till everybody was a little calmer. And maybe till the guy had gotten out of the shower. But he didn't give the Bret Hart offered events. Punk didn't. He didn't say, you know what? You guys just stay right here that have busted in my locker room. As soon as I get out of the shower, if you're still here, I'm going to knock you out. He just cut that part out and went straight to the knocking out. What What is hard to understand about this? This, this has happened in wrestling a bunch of times. The only difference now is that some of the wrestlers are EVPs and they're whiny little bitches that when they get the their shit handed to them, they try to backpedal and go, oh God, we just wanted to talk to him and iron this all out. Then why'd you bring a bunch of guys in to bust into his fucking locker room to make it worse? P-brained imbeciles. What were you going to say? Well, there were a few different points I was going to jump in, but you know, again, when you try to look at this objectively, like you just said, in the room, CM Punk, A Steel's wife, I forget what her name is, apparently she was a wrestler at some point, with a broken leg, well, on crutches, one or the other, his dog, by the way, my reporting has Mega Parikh, who everyone always says is the number two in the company, who's in charge of legal in the company, who I think is in charge of HR in the company, who was down the hall with the Bucks before they came down. She somehow got the dog out of the room. Other people have said Omega had the dog when he got attacked or beat up by Ace Steel. Who knows? But somehow the dog, what was the dog thinking when everyone storms in the room? That's what I want to know. Well, I'm surprised somebody didn't get their ass bit. Besides, well, well, I, yeah, yeah, well, well, by the dog, I mean, by the dog. And ass got bit. Not And, and here, <laughs> one more thing. Ace Steel bit Twinkle Toes has Ace Steel had blood work done. Oh, come on. It's, it's a concern. Go ahead. It would be a concern for anything if anyone had a bite that was deep. If you get bit by a dog, you would want to get your blood tested, just to be clear on this. But again, just CM Punk, the dog. Ace Steel's not in the room. I think a lot of people assume that early on because of his involvement here and his friendship with CM Punk. Ace Steel's not in the room. In the room, we have Kenny Omega. We have the Young Bucks. We have Nakazawa. We have Cutler, so that's five people. Apparently, at the back of the line was Mega getting ready for the dog handoff, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck that's about. And her involvement in this is something very interesting, because if she has anything to do with that investigation, and she's a party to that investigation, and she was down the hall with the Young Bucks... She, wait a minute, she, she's the one that actually not only let the EVPs go to Punk's locker room, but followed them there? She's the number two. She's the legal beagle involved. Wouldn't her first thing to be, you shouldn't go to that locker room. We should talk to Tony. And I think part of the reason she may have done it may be part of the reason it's a problem. She's been working with Omega and the Young Bucks. And like you said, Matt Jackson's wife, Omega's assistant. She's been working <laughs> with this group of people since the beginning, since before it was on TV. Okay, well, here's another thing then. If she's the number two and she's in charge of legal, why didn't she lead the group in there and be the first if mega or any other female was the first one through the door do you think that punk would have started firing punches or would he have seen a civilian lawyer and gone well apparently they didn't come in here to beat my ass six on one and again with all of this happening and i don't know how big the room is i mean cm punk is what sitting on a couch how far is the couch from the door is it a big room? Is it a well, small room? I, well, to see, here's another thing, and I can tell you from experience, the NBA arenas, the big buildings, a lot of people think locker room, they think you see on TV, the football team's in there, the baseball team, whatever. It's a big open area. But this was not an NBA arena, and especially if Punk had his own locker room, then there's plenty of, for concerts or for other types of show business events, these buildings have small locker rooms with a bathroom and a dressing facility, a vanity area or whatever, but it's not like you got a lot of room. So if suddenly, if he's in one of these private locker rooms and four or five, six people bust in, that room's pretty full right off the bat. So 
how do you how do you suddenly it's in, like the Marx Brothers in yeah. seconds how do you ascertain oh these guys have all come in here to talk to me like men or they've just thrown this door open and I've invited them to come in and fight so I guess they're taking me up on it so here we go did he open the door and walk three steps slowly and say look Phil or did he walk <laughs> you know I'm serious when you try to visualize it in your head like did they hey. calmly walk down the hall or was it like Let's go tell that motherfucker what we a think. Bunch of, a bunch of pissed off people walking down the hall, and I've heard somebody say, oh, they knocked, and there was no, what the fuck? They threw the door open, however the fuck they did it, and started to say, hey, what the fuck? And that's about all they probably got out before matters took a turn for the worse for them. And let's just go back a step to general etiquette. The idea that someone knocked... And no one said, come in. And then they're like, all right, let's just go in. When did that start? I don't think it is. They didn't knock. Have you? Again, nobody has seen the mad wrestler walk. I've seen it for 40 <laughs> years. The mad wrestler walk where they're going to fucking tell somebody something. They're not knocking on a fucking door. And if you're going down to knock, how come six or seven people have to go down and talk? How about just the people that were involved? Or maybe if Mega was a lawyer instead of a stooge, she should have been the one to go down there and say, well, the other side of this thing is very upset. And when Tony finishes the media scrum, we should all sit down. That's no, the she, that's she the trails behind. That's the thing I'm always saying about the fucking executives in AEW. None of them, even Mega, none of them act like actual executives. It's like kids being fucking turned loose from Tony on down. No one understands how to be fucking serious, make good decisions. If you've ever been around serious fucking executives, it's so obvious. They all, because everyone's like, oh, Mega, whatever she did. She went to Harvard. She went to Yale. I don't even fucking know. But they're like, oh, look at all these things. And then she makes dumb fucking decisions. Well, but LK, and she's mixed up many- in everything. Wait. How many wrestling promotions has she done legal work for? How Before this project started, how many professional wrestlers had she met in person? How much experience did she have dealing with any kind of professional athletes that were ready to fight each other? Does that happen in football? Probably. Well, but does she yeah, do any yeah. football <laughs> business? I believe so. That's how she started with the con. She starts with... I think she still does stuff with the Jaguar. She's like Tony. She splits her, unless she's fully AEW now, at least. Okay, then then does the legal department there, do they handle the football players who want to kick each other's ass, or is that the football team manager and coach and et cetera? What experience? I don't care if she's goddamn Johnny Cochran or fucking Clarence Darrow. What experience in life does she have dealing with large... (laughs) Adult male professional athletes that want to fight each other. Zip, zero, none. She shouldn't have been involved. One of the biggest problems in the entertainment industry is when you take contract lawyers and you give them too much power. Because they're smart people, they're talented people, they're capable people to a point. And you also have to just understand basic humanity. Ah, whatever. (laughs) This This whole thing is such a mess and it's all their own fault. That's the thing. This is 100% an AEW fault. Adam Page gets a lot of the blame for just acting like a buffoon. And he's going to own that for the rest of his career. But AEW, Tony Khan on down, the fact that it went from that point to the point where a few weeks ago they had to have a meeting that did nothing, that helped nothing, that was for show. Nothing came out of it other than Jericho got to do his little show. Nothing else came out of it. And Omega got to insult half the locker room. Oh, no. I guess eighty percent of the locker room. <laughs> but I think about it, he yeah, had to yeah. insult. There was that, and then tensions kept growing to the point where even Dave was reporting on it. Well, and nothing was done. <laughs> nothing was done at all. Nothing was done. It was like you could see this was coming. We saw this was coming for various reasons, but it was obvious this was all going to happen if no one got in there and eased this in any way, and no one did, and no one did. Well, let's talk about Uncle Dave and and the people that he talks to for a second, because the story's coming out now. Punk is a cancer in the locker room. Punk is only out for himself. Punk is bitter. Punk is mad, blah, blah, blah. Well, actually, there was an article 
on ESPN.com. You may have heard of ESPN. They actually still do have journalists working there. I think the Sports Illustrated website's gone off the deep end a time or two, but <laughs> you're not lying. This was on ESPN.com from May 27th. Mark Rimondi wrote this, talking about CM Punk and his return to AEW, his return to wrestling in AEW. And uh, this, the reporter was there that night last September when they did the Arthur Ashe Stadium in Flushing. I love the name of that town. Remember, Punk worked with Will Hobbs, Powerhouse Hobbs. And it says, Punk, one of the biggest wrestling stars of the last two decades, opened their discussion about how the match would be laid out with something surprising. Punk said he knew Hobbs's mother had just died about a month before and the match would be in her honor. Hobbs told ESPN, first thing he said, don't worry about anybody else. Your mom's in the crowd. Let's put the match on for her. That made me feel so much better, so much more comfortable. Uh, Punk beat Hobbs in a match that received solid reviews from fans and critics, blah, blah, blah. But for Punk, it represented precisely why he'd returned to the ring and what he believes the industry should be all about in the first place. It talks about Punk giving back and that he felt his time in WWE was almost wasted, walking on hot coals. His mission now isn't putting on five-star matches, winning championships, or selling out arenas as much as it's been about those emotional moments with Hobbs and making up for lost time. Making new relationship. Darby Allen was the wrestler tasked with being CM Punk's first match. And basically, Darby Allen also says that his experience underscored the magnitude of Punk coming to AEW. Because Allen's straight edge like Punk. And they mentioned that uh, Lee Moriarty said he didn't know what being straight edge was till he became a fan of Punk, and now he follows those principles. And you've got other people in this article. Dax Harwood. He was apprehensive at first when Punk signed with AEW. Because Punk made enemies in WWE. He had a reputation for being standoffish. But Harwood and Wheeler, it says, ended up hitting it off with Punk. In no small part due to their shared reverence for WWE legend Bret Hart. He's always, oh no, this is a Dustin Rhodes quote about Punk. He's always coaching up the talents when they come back or on their promos or a certain move saying less is more sometimes. Those are very, very important things to learn as a young superstar in the wrestling world. Hobbs said he couldn't even remember the number of times Punk has pulled him into his locker room to watch one of his matches to offer guidance. Max Caster said that he's come to Punk for business advice for non-wrestling ventures. Caster added Punk made him feel included in the locker room. Uh, there's more folks here. Punk says he wanted to do for younger wrestlers in AEW what legends like Eddie Guerrero and Tracy Smothers did for him as mentors. But he's also doing it because other older wrestlers he worked with did not do the same. But the problem is, is that he expects people to take advice from veterans. And he expects people to want to improve. He doesn't want empty-headed nitwits like Adam Page said, I don't need to take anybody's advice. So all of these people, whether Dax and Cash or Darby or Hobbs or these other people mentioned in this and Punk's own words himself, he wanted to come back and help, as he said at the press scrum, he's trying to run a business because Tony ain't. Hey, look, here's the problem. There are guys who have problems with Punk going way back. There are guys who don't like him from the Midwest. There are guys that don't like him because they're on Cabana's team, which happens to be the entire Young Bucks team. So there's always people whispering and complaining about him. But we heard nothing but good things until he had to work with them. Until he, until he had to work with the guys who had a problem with him, we didn't hear anything about CM Punk. We heard the exact opposite. I mean, we heard this stuff. And, you know, that quote you just read... Uh, and, and I'm going to get it wrong, even though you just said it. Oh, less is more. Actually, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. I don't know how I can get that wrong. Less is more. 
You could see why that advice is valuable to some, and you could see why that quote even appearing attributed to Punk in that article would be threatening to others, because that's the exact opposite of what they believe. They think that idea, less is more, is completely an old school idea. More is more. Just do more. More is more. And there's a lot of resentments for Punk from those guys, because also, look, in their head, they really believe the shit that they say about, we started this company. This company was built on our backs. This company was started by and built by Tony fucking Khan. Yeah. With his money, his relationships, and his fucking vision. And they were lucky that he fell for their fucking mass hysteria and decided to bring them along for the ride. And it was all fun and games when Cody was there because they knew they could fucking out manipulate Cody. And Cody, we talked extensively about Cody. There's a 20 hour omnibus or whatever. But Cody was flawed in a lot of ways as an executive, and it wasn't the role for him. But they needed the ego of Dusty Rhodes' son to get to where they got and to make that happen. And then they did everything they could to ice him out of the fucking company. Well, now, here's the thing. If Punk, the biggest star they've got, can be treated like this and subjected to the rumor campaign and have all of their darling little newsletters and websites, you know, on their side to malign this guy because he came in and was the only one, the only one so far that has produced million people fucking numbers and million dollar gates and buy rates that kept going up and kept going up until they completely fell in a hole here because of all this shit going on. If they can do it to punk, they can do it to anybody. Because one of the selling points to come to this company was don't let Vince McMahon be in charge of your, your career. Remember last year, even Mick Foley, the nicest human being that ever walked the earth, got on the internet and said, I trusted Vince McMahon with my career and he made me a star. I don't know why anybody today would trust Vince McMahon with their careers. And that was the selling point. Go to AEW. Vince won't fucking destroy you. That's not the selling point anymore because Vince is gone. Triple H is in charge. Triple H is more friendly to the wrestlers when it serves his purposes, but he's certainly more sympathetic to the wrestlers' cause, uh, especially on bad, silly gimmicks than Vince was. And at the same point now... It's not about even putting Tony Khan in charge of your career over Vince McMahon. It's about putting Harpo McFingerbang and the Cucamonga Kids in charge of your careers instead of Vince McMahon, instead of Triple H. So who wants to do that if you are, again, an indie-rific play wrestler on the outlaw shows that the click of the elite likes, then sure, you're fine. And you also know that you probably got no chance of going to the WWE anyway. But if you're a serious wrestler and a legitimate talent and you have a future, now who do you want to put your career in the hands of? Triple H and the most well-run, mega-billion-dollar wrestling promotion that's ever been on the planet? Or the Hardly Boys? and Twinkle Toes, because they're going to be the determining factor in whether you get over, or whether you're allowed to get over, or whether you are the victim of a smear campaign and made miserable and run off in the locker room because you are better than they are and they know it, and they don't want that. They want everybody subservient to them, and they want all their friends that they can hold down and or put in the right spot, but they don't want serious talent to show them up. And this is what happened. Like we said, Cody just left. He said, fuck it. I got another place to go. Punk don't have that patience. And Punk don't like putting up with bullshit. And Punk doesn't want to go to the WWE because he's been there and he didn't like it. So he's like, why should I be the one to fucking leave? Fuck you, you leave if you don't like it. Now they're fucked up either way they go because he's hurt again. 
And that's another thing. Would he have gotten hurt if they'd have had a a sensible match for him to have its pay-per-view instead of having to do an angle where they switch the belt and give the preview of the pay-per-view match away a week and a half early so they can come back and do an interview to try to put everybody in the right place so then they can have that match on pay-per-view. Then they had to go through all of that. He might not have got hurt again. Now, even if Tony does smarten up and decide that his EVPs shit the bed and acted unprofessionally, and even if he does figure out that his goddamn number two legal woman may be a fucking issue, he still got no access to his biggest star for eight months. So, uh, this is the biggest bunch of fucking bullshit I've ever seen in my life. I don't, even in the days of the click and Michaels and all of that hoo ha in the WWF, I never saw anything like this. This is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And you know what? Even to be more fair, even though he was there, from all the reporting I've done, and my reporting has been firsthand talking to people, not just reporting on what's been reported elsewhere. I've definitely, some people have done some great work. But I have to say, even though he was in the room and even though he was apparently bitten, I'd like to hear more <laughs> about that and what exactly happened there. But I heard that after it all went down, Kenny Omega was the only one who seemed to be a cooler head. The Jacksons were still looking to go, although I heard they were a little too obsessed with it. <laughs> what, I, I they, they were looking to go where? To the hospital? One of them got knocked out. The other one got fucking rattled with a chair. Well, I heard they were still, I heard Ace Steel and Punk were still yelling at him, and they were still yelling, and everyone's in the middle, and it's just a complete mess. But Kenny was actually apparently at that point willing to be a pacifist. And as we reported, him and Punk at some point that night talked. There was an attempt to, like, let's get everyone cool, and that did not work out. That didn't work out, apparently, and that wasn't very fruitful. Well, but at least he did try. Kenny did try to be a pussifist yeah. in all of this. Oh, there you go. A pussifist. That's a, I've never heard that before, actually. But let's talk about a couple things around this, if you don't mind. Let's do it. I have here a tweet that's very interesting from the other day. It relates to something we mentioned earlier. From September 7th, 2022, which would have been Wednesday, Dynamite Night, 8.54 p.m., I've been way too fucking nice, tweeted out by Brandy Rhodes. <laughs> what was said on that TV show at 8.52 or so? Yeah, hold on. Where was I just had that uh, screen up? Let me find that again. Well, I mean, uh, and honestly, again, these little fucking, you know, crumb snatchers have been running around since this thing started. We started this. It's our revolution. We, this all happened because of us. No, it happened because you got a billionaire that happened to fall in love with you. That's the only reason it happened. But they conveniently leave Cody out of all of that stuff because he was, he was the, the misfit toy. He was the one that didn't fit the picture from the start. We've mentioned that. And now they've just decided to erase him like he didn't have any. He probably had more to do with it than most people because he was able to have a grown-up adult conversation with other business executives that he may have come in contact with where they'd be looking at Harpo and the fucking kids and go, what the fuck is this all about? In a lot of ways, Cody was the perfect complement for them before, before the company. He was like the step parent that could keep them in, in line and take their ice cream away if they cried too much. I guess that's another way of looking at it, sure. Yeah. But, you know, the Brandy Rhodes tweet is interesting. Now, we know Cody Rhodes has an NDA, and I believe it may be a two-way NDA, so Tony Khan can't even talk about Cody. We don't know if Brandy has anything. I think her contract just expired. It is true. Look, again, we're talking about Cody, very flawed as an executive. And certainly his booking after a while went off the rails. But look at what happens with AEW. Once you're not mingling with the friends, they do their thing and you're iced out. And Cody had only so many people he could work with after a while. He certainly got distracted with other things. But he came back to a very unfriendly place. You know, it wasn't the same. That's the reason why he left months after he returned. But we've never heard what Cody had to say. And we may never because he tries to play it nice and he's a very political guy. But Brandy. 
Brandy on the other author, What is this? Open mic night, bitch? No, you know what? <laughs> author of one of my favorite lines ever. I still laugh about it. You may have a black belt, but I'm a black bitch. It's <laughs> <laughs> the greatest fucking line of all time. And look, Brandy too flawed. But Brandy's wrestling push, someone should go write the history of that. It was nuts. She was a heel. She was a baby face. They were nightmares and cutting people's hair that they weren't. Nothing made any sense. But you could certainly say that any contribution she made have kind of been put down and diminished for a while. And we joked about it a little earlier. It's true that there are like factions. It's almost like Game of Thrones. It's like you have (laughs) the Bucks camp. Oh, boy. And by the way, we talked about Bobby Fish challenging Punk to a fight on the last program we did. And I was like, that's a shame. I always liked Bobby. I thought he's a good worker, but obviously his head stuck with his friends from California. Now, guess. Guess who he helped and contributed money to? I don't... don't Drake Wirtz. Oh, come on. He's one of the fucking ultra-religious crazies that think that there's child molesters on every corner and we got to stop the the child trafficking. And he actually supported Drake Wirtz in in that. uh, So apparently, like you said, you got the the Republican right-wing religious nut faction from california uh the uh, the anti-obama bucks i don't know if old kenny's political or not he just probably falls in with them was canadian and then you've got normal people on the other side (laughs) well that wasn't even where i was gonna go i was just saying you know here you have the bucks camp you have cody and his crew i mean this is all the people fighting for airtime you have jericho and what he wants to do by the time Punk gets there, and that's the end of Cody, Punk gets over so big. Punk's getting lo- a lot of time on TV. You know, it's all like a battle for fucking airtime is really what it's about. And everyone wants their thing to win out. And the Bucks can't take it that their shit is not winning out right now. The ratings for their shit isn't winning out. They have so much resentment for CM Punk, and a lot of it's unjustified, I think. I think they're lumped in with people that or mad at him for shit from, like, 15 years ago. The people that didn't know him then, they just met whoever he is now at this age of his life, and they're like, oh, he seems like such a nice guy. What are your problems with 20-something-year-old? I guess what, what pisses me off is that, yes, these little weasels can send their version of the story out to all the news sites because they're the same journalists that sit there at the media scrums and applaud them when they come in the room. And it the... Serious wrestlers who don't plant stories with the media because they don't talk to the media because they're just trying to do their job and they don't give a shit. Their story doesn't get out. And theirs is, in this case, the true one. So it's about time that we examine this from all sides. And suddenly, somehow, over the last two months, over the last two months, CM Punk went from the returning conquering hero trying to help all the young talent to the fucking devil incarnate that's a cancer in the locker room. And it all started with that hangman promo out in public. So put two and two together and figure out what the fuck's going on in front of you. That's what I'm telling people. Hey, everyone's looking into how did the story get out there that Punk got Cabana fired? Tony Khan is emphatic that it's not true. CM Punk is offended that anyone thinks it's true. So let's ignore that. I think the bigger issue is, how did it get into the Observer that Nick Jackson saved Colt Cabana's job? Because that has nothing to do with Punk. Well, I'm sure as soon as he talked Tony Khan into signing Colt to a contract, because he's friends of all theirs, he immediately went and told all of the appropriate people what a nice guy he was to do that. And guess who was almost responsible for getting our friend fired? That's all they had to do. And people were ready to believe it because everybody knows that Punk and Cabana have been on the outs. But nobody was looking at the fact that fucking Cabana wasn't on TV for the year before Punk showed up any more than Dwarf Dongsucker was. And they let him expire. Tony was doing the same thing he does with everybody. He's not capable of telling somebody eye to eye, I paid you for two years, but now I'm changing talent. You're not worth it, or I love you, or whatever you need to tell him, but goodbye. 
He just lets the contracts expire, and that's what was obviously happening. So then the Cucamonga kids figure, well, not only can we hopefully help our buddy Colt and give him six figures of the company's money to do absolutely nothing, but we can make Punk look bad in the process if we spread the word that Punk was behind Colt being sent out in the cold, and everybody will believe it because they know they hate each other. Because how otherwise would Tony ever release a talent like Colt Cabana? I mean, obviously, Tony would have re-signed him, maybe given him a slight raise, if not for CM Punk saying, hey, you know that guy you want to give more money to or the same money to? Get rid of him. Tony was ready to give him what? I mean, what is the other side of the <laughs> argument? What was Colt Cabana going to fucking get? A run with the title? Nothing. He means nothing to no one. And all of this shit happened because of that. CM Punk was having a fucking... In terms of being a wrestling fan, has had heck of a the, run. Having one of the great runs of modern times. The feud with MJF is a classic. It's maybe the best feud. It's the best feud in the history of AEW. It's great. He doesn't have one problem with drama until he runs into these guys, the guys that are fucking looking to get him. What the fuck is that? And I, I heard Dave Meltzer, he fucking bit a whole thing just destroying CM Punk, destroying him completely one sided. It's incredible, the hit job that's coming out of one side about this. Well, I shouldn't say one side. One side and a certain person in the locker room who loves leaking shit because it benefits him. <laughs> who has no sides because he plays all sides against each other. And it's the same thing they tried to do to us. Oh, yeah, he's just bitter because that's we it. won't work with him. We won't give him a job or same we thing. won't talk to him. So they're bitter and they hate us because we're successful. No, I don't give a fuck whether you turn bled or tur turn, turn bled, turn blue or I drop dead. I would give dead. a fuck if he turns bled. I'd like if to he see turn that. bled. I don't give a fuck if you turn blue or drop dead. I don't want to work with you. I don't want to work with anybody. I'm just telling the truth and fuck you. But they can't goddamn accept it so they have to figure out a way that there's something wrong with everybody that doesn't like us and remember well, i've said it it's not just this before this all happened i said they had problems with the executive vice presidents i'm gonna say this again it's not just this no so when you're basing like oh it's the innocent bucks they like to you know super kick children how could they ever want to hurt somebody and all their friends they're all and Christopher Daniels, he was in the room with them too. That's hold on, Christopher Daniels, Nakazawa. Yeah, right. Because yeah, he got suspended, and he's talent relations. Talent relations, who's buddies with the Bucks from Southern California. Christopher Daniels, Nakazawa, Cutler, two Bucks, and an Omega. And an Omega, and a partridge in a pear tree. Here's another thing: if one side was all on the up and up, and the other side was all wrong. Well, the side that burst into the locker room had at least one talent relations executive, three executive vice presidents, and the number two in command and head of the legal department, and there's still an investigation going on. Well, it seems like with all of those dignitaries in the company, you'd get the straight story, wouldn't you, from them, except... If all of those dignitaries were on the fucking side that caused the problem. That's why there's an investigation going on, because there's more to the story than what that group is giving out. You would think it'd be cut and dried there. Okay, here's a lawyer. Here's a representative of, of talent relations. Here's three executive vice presidents. Oh, you mean we still don't know the true story of what went on in there? Golly. As a, as a talent relations and or creative booking team, whatever, member, I've had to witness a couple of things before just in case uh, there was a lawsuit or whatever. And it, I'll tell you, the, remember when the uh, skyscrapers, Spivey and Sid, when they beat that job guy up in Texas for not selling for him? Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, I saw him, and Teddy Long gave me the eye roll, like, we're going. They were headed for the guy's locker room. So I'm in the back. I'm going to try to see what happens. I know what's going to happen, but I may need to testify later on. And 
Spivey's in front, as you'd figure, because Sid looked great, but he ain't going to fight unless, you know, there's some advantage. Spivey goes in there. The guy stands up. Spivey fucking punched him and dropped him and slapped him two or three times. And then, of course, Sid's so big, I'm trying to look over Sid. And I think he may have kicked him while he was down there as he was cussing him, saying, you got a fucking problem you don't want to sell? Fuck you. And then so I think they spit on him and walked out. And then as the representative of the booking committee, because the guy deserved every single goddamn thing that happened to him, I then told somebody else in the locker room, I said, you better get his bags packed and get him the fuck out of here unless they decide to come back because they didn't think they got the point across. That's what happens when somebody has done something and somebody else busts in a fucking locker room, shit takes place. If you don't want shit to take place, don't bust in a locker room. You know, also, so, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, too, again, I'm thinking about the history of AEW, and like you and I have said and alluded to many times, we've been very well aware of the way things are going on. When Cody had problems with the elite, you could pick whose side you want to take, right? When FTR are having problems with the elite, and then Punk's having problems with the elite, at what point do you realize it's the same people over and over who have a problem with anyone who's not doing their thing? I think it's pretty obvious already. But it all boils down to what Tony Khan is willing to put up with and or whether he wants to take control of his fucking wrestling promotion. And the easiest thing to do right now would be say, okay, I don't have any more executive vice presidents. We're going to go back and start fresh, and I'm going to try to find or hire or promote from within some experienced veteran wrestling personnel to run talent relations and the booking department. And hopefully I can talk Jim Ross into helping me sit down with all the talent and determining who else is going to blow up in the near future and commit aggravated mayhem and find out how to assuage their feelings. And then I will be the promoter that makes the decisions and authorizes the expenditures and tries to regain my positive standing with the fans out there in the audience. And all these other people are going to run this fucking thing and see if we can get a coherent television show, a goddamn talent roster that doesn't look like it's mix and match day at the fucking buffet and it's a cohesive coherent team all pulling the same rope and going in the same direction and featuring a palatable mix of wrestling styles instead of everything all over the goddamn page like that fucking idiot olivier wants and get my employees under control and start trying to build for a potential contract renegotiation with our rights fees that may or may not be as easy as we thought it was going to be two weeks ago because the network's hearing about all this shit too. And even if they didn't hear about the the beef at the press conference and afterwards, then they would have heard about it when Tony said, well, we don't have CM Punk. Well, we don't have, well, I guess the network wouldn't care if they don't have the Bucks or Omega because they don't do any ratings, but we don't have CM Punk. Why not? Well, my executive vice presidents bum-rushed him in his fucking locker room because they were pissed off at what he said at the media scrum. What did he say at the media scrum that caused that? Well, he said that the EVPs couldn't manage a fucking target and that he was sick and tired of having to deal with children. Who were spreading, yeah. who were spreading stories about him in the press. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what the network would hear. What the fuck? It's, I, I'm, that's, that's all I'm going to say is I've been saying the same thing for the past three and a half years. You can't do something at this level when you have everybody in charge with literally no experience at doing any of these things before and not willing to listen to people who have. This is what you get. Yeah, everything right now is, I think, being done to placate the network because that's their biggest fear. They are terrified right now about the fucking network. Well, and how does the network know that somebody isn't going to go into business for themselves in the ring? 
and get in a fight and something happened and legal and blah, 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 and they'll be called in to testify or to give their thoughts on the situation under oath or blah, blah, blah. How do they know that now? It's a shit show. It's a complete shit show. And I feel, I actually, look, it's Tony's fault. At the end of the day, this is all Tony's fault. Adam Page too, <laughs> but it's all Tony's fault. Yeah. But I also feel really bad for Tony because he's in a rough position right now. Yeah. He, he, he's, try, he's tried, except for being he's oblivious in a really rough to position. advice, he's in a he really has tried his position. best. And yeah. I'm sure he has worked his fingers to the bone. I see the bony fingers. So yeah, you got to feel bad for him, but he should have known because we told him. We told him what was going to happen. I'm sure anybody that didn't want a job and didn't care for taking him for any money has told him. Well, goddamn, that would be me, I guess. That's the sum total of those people that fit that description, but would have told him what was going to happen. Jim, before we wrap things up, I'd like to bring up something that's actually starting to gain some buzz at the moment, and the Young Bucks are trending because of a report. It appears to be from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Figure 4 online (laughs) message board. The headline is, Report Young Bucks Sent Feelers Out to WWE. (laughs) <laughs> and this all seems to be coming from something on the F4W online message board. I'm getting this from a Wrestle Talk article. Ryan Frederick of the Wrestling Observer pointed out that the Young Bucks had their options picked up. Here's the exact quote. They didn't sign new deals. Their options were picked up. They did reach out to a talent to send feelers that they would be interested in talking about coming in when their deals are up. And what did Steen say? but everyone on both sides are going to do the same because you want to look for the best deal. Anyone who doesn't, <laughs> anyone who doesn't do so is dumb and possibly yeah. leaving money on the table. Uh, and okay. then I guess explaining why the young books. No, when, when you, when you're just a fucking talent, when you're an employee, when you're just one of the, the worker bees. Yeah. You want to, see what kind of contract you can get. You want to entertain all offers. When you've made the commitment that you're an executive vice president of a company and they've already had one leave when Cody got run off. And now these, I honestly, if they had, had not agreed to start AEW from what we hear, they probably would have got a fucking WWE contract because at the time before the company got started, They had made offers to all of them because they didn't want a billionaire getting in the wrestling business. So they wanted to try to take the talent at the start. But now, not only that, I mean, Vince McMahon, if they were willing to make an offer to the Young Bucks while Vince McMahon was in charge, that meant that they were worried about a billionaire getting in the business and they wanted to put a stop to it. Because there's no way ever, ever in life that Vince McMahon would sign Matt and Nick Jackson seriously. Maybe like James Elworth or whatever, but not seriously. He wanted to stop the company. Now they've seen the company. And I've said this, I've been saying this for a couple of years. They've seen what it looks like. That's why all of a sudden they stopped those, not only stopped the high contract offers to the WWE talent to keep them, but started fucking firing people. They fired people that goddamn AEW could pick up immediately and did because they knew what they had as competition at that point and they weren't concerned. So now, if these two little fucking dipshits are trying to get a deal, I don't think Triple H would look at them with as much disdain as Vince, but he still don't need them because they know now what the competition is, and those guys would never make it in the WWE. They wouldn't make it in the locker room. They wouldn't make it in the ring. And it would be ridiculous visually. So now they're trying to see if there's any interest at this point up there in them so that they can attempt to put Tony over a barrel to sign him to a new longer-term deal or whatever the case. But they ain't going to find a lot of people nibbling on that fucking worm. The time has passed. They didn't, they never wanted them to begin with. They wanted Tony Khan not to have them. Well, Jim, I have one more quote from this part here. Uh, They reached out to a talent to send feelers about coming in. I can't say they talked to anyone direct to WWE, but that would fall under tampering. And this came at the same time that the legal letters were being sent about tampering. 
I can't confirm they actually talk to WWE people themselves, but they talk to other WWE talent <laughs> about coming in, which they can do, much like WWE <laughs> talent can send feelers through AEW talent, which has happened and happens on both sides often. Good Lord, that was a convoluted fucking way to get from point A to point B. It's not something they wouldn't have done anyways, since their deals are coming up at the end of 2024, and you want to maximize your leverage when it comes to getting a new deal and get the companies into a bidding war. Oh, good Lord. It's not necessarily a sign that they're going to leave. Everyone should do it. Hey, right now they have no leverage with AEW. <laughs> if Tony has a brain right now, right now they have no leverage. Let me, they're suspended. They brought disgrace to the company and they're currently suspended. If that's leverage, then I, I need to look up the American Heritage Dictionary definition of leverage. And they ain't going to have any leverage with the WWE because the WWE now doesn't want... What? How would Triple H sell that? To anybody else in the company, yeah, I'm going to sell these two guys every time they're on the opposition program, 200,000 people tune out. If, what the fuck? If the talent, I'm going to say this, even though it's not the thing. If the talent they contacted was Cody, this whole thing's a work. You know, I, I, I guarantee you they called up Steen. The only reason Steen didn't come over to join him was because they gave him a couple million dollars to stay where he was. And just the fact that... <laughs> You could see, you could see that the wrestling business is fucked up when Kevin Steen gets two and a half million dollars or whatever on a wrestling contract. Uh, but no, they just call their friends. That's all they know how to do is call their friends. But now the friends ain't going to be able to help them because they have no leverage. They have no track record of ratings. They have no track record of fucking pay-per-view buys because they're Fortunately, they haven't been featured in any of the major pay-per-views in the main event, and they have no track record of any kind of great matches with top talent. They do the same match every time with the gymnasts that they brought with them. So they have no appeal to the WWE past will take them away from the billionaire so that he will have a harder time making it in the wrestling business. And now that they're not making any difference to the billionaire, I can see them going after MJF. I can see the WWE being hell of a interested in Wardlow. I can see the WWE being completely interested in powerhouse Hobbs. I, I can even see, okay, for, for shits and giggles, Let's see if we can get Omega away from him. Maybe if, you know, either he'll listen to us and make the changes we want him to make because at least he looks like an athlete and maybe some of our guys can get something out of him or we've taken him away from the competition and they don't have him. And, you know, he'll, he'd have a nervous breakdown in that locker room in three months, but I can see them making him an offer. But for the Jacksons? I think the WWE would rather make an offer to fucking Randy and Tito than Matt and Nick. I would actually pay to see Randy and Tito team up, even today. If Tito still has any of that afro left, because that was a mighty fine afro. It was. Jim, before we wrap up, I guess, where if you're Tony Khan, where do you move from here? If you're going to go under the assumption CM Punk and the Bucks and Omega at a minimum are gone for a while... What is your what is your program and your promotion look like in the next What does it look like in the next month, two months, and what do you have to do immediately to change this? Again, bring Jim Ross in, put him in charge of talent relations, see who else is mad at who and how it can be fixed. Fucking immediately, regardless of whether they ever come back or they fuck off and go away forever, do not let the executive vice presidents be executive vice presidents anymore. No wrestlers with any type of office affiliation. If they want to leave over that, help them carry their bags to the fucking car. With Punk, yes, he's been pushed and coerced and instigated and provoked and etc. But still, you got to do something because he buried Tony at the press conference, saying all, all that in front of him. And of course... Tony buried himself by not doing anything about it when he heard it in private. 
That's a great example, though. Like, he should have done something. He should have stopped him. He should have said questions only about this, whatever it may be. And while he didn't do that, I still feel awful for him when I see that. I feel yeah. terrible for the fucking guy. Um, but Punk's going to be out for eight months. So that's enough punishment right there because he's punishing the company. And he, he sure ain't going to want to sit home and recover from another surgery. And also it's punishing the company because they ain't going to have Punk for ratings or goddamn buy rates. I would get, uh, after I put Jim Ross on the case of trying to figure out who else in the locker room is going to try to strangle each other and make sure that everybody's contracts that I want to keep for the future are not only written properly, but still have time left on them. Then I would get Jim Ross's and a few other people there, the William Regals of the world. I would get their opinion on which person or persons might be good to put together to start booking the show with absolutely no input whatsoever from Tony Khan. And they would be in charge of booking the, the writing the show formats and booking the talent and working with them to make a cohesive television program from week to week that would start getting people over and building issues that you'd want to see instead of bringing in people from all over the place and then you never see them again and nothing makes sense and somebody's a heel one week and a baby face the other i like this guy's costumes so i'm gonna let him go 20 minutes in the main event or whatever the fuck and then i would see about a new legal fucking head since Mega is obviously in over hers. I don't think that's going to happen, but... Well, I, you asked... I, none of this other shit's going to happen either, but you asked me what I would do. So I'm telling you, don't ask the question if you don't want the answer. I'd tell Mega to go piss up a rope, and I'd get a legitimate male attorney about 50 to 60 years old that's seen every goddamn thing in the world and is a fucking barracuda when it comes to contracts and negotiations and i'd put them in charge of my legal department because a guy like that's probably not going to be intimidated by wrestlers or want to make friends with them either one is bad because so far everybody i've seen in a position of power that was not in the wrestling business until, until tony decided to get into it either wants to be friends with the wrestlers or is intimidated by them neither one is a good thing so, once I'd revamped my talent relations department, and I'd revamped my booking team, and I had revamped my legal department to make sure that the fucking legal head is not with the people storming my top star's locker room, then I would go to the network and say, I've taken all of these steps to make sure that the shit show that happened a couple of weeks ago never happens again, especially while we're on your network. Because elsewise, he's what is he going to say? Well, I suspended everybody. Well, the horse left the barn for you did. What are you doing about it to make sure it doesn't happen again? That's what the network is going to say. And he's going to say, well, we're having a third-party investigation. What are you going to make sure, or what are you going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again? Well, we've suspended everybody, and I may not, let them be EVPs anymore. They still going to be around. What are you going to do to make sure it never happens again? I've got a new head of talent relations. I've got a new creative team. I've got a new head of legal. I'm stepping back. Experienced people are in charge. And we're going to have a cohesive program from here on out with everybody either getting along or out the door. That's what you tell the network. But he can't. Because he's not doing any of those things. I'm done. It was a pre-taped announcement that Tony Khan did. And somebody on Twitter, wherever, well, why didn't he come out live? I guarantee you somebody close to him told him, do not try this live, Tony. But it's too complicated between the matchups he had to rattle off and the fact that Tony tends to wander badly when when public speaking there's no way he could have got away with doing this live but as it was no mention again so i'm gonna hit you with this brown and we'll move on because the good stuff's coming up let's say that ty cobb 
Mickey Mantle, Lou Gehrig, and Babe Ruth are all working for the New York Yankees, right? All playing on a team. Uh, sure, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to... Ty like, Cobb was never a Yankee. Well, nevertheless, that's the, that's the four big baseball players I know, and you're going to take me to task for de- comparing one of these to Twinkle Toes, but I don't know any job guy baseball players' names. The twinkle Toes? Is it DiMaggio? Possibly. Huh. So Babe Ruth is pissed off at Ty Cobb and Mickey Mantle and Lou Gehrig. And finally, they get in a fight. Because old George Steinbrenner has not done anything to fucking settle this down. So they all have to be suspended. My question to you is after they're suspended and the next time that the the Yankees go out to play a game and there's no Babe Ruth or Ty Cobb or Mickey Mantle or Lou Gehrig, would George Steinbrenner... Would he make the announcement, ladies and gentlemen, the Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb, Mickey Mantle, and Lou Gehrig are suspended because they got in a fight in the locker room last week, so they ain't playing tonight. Okay, you don't know anything about baseball, but you got one thing right. If it was Steinbrenner, Steinbrenner would have put out a statement. He also would have lambasted them publicly. He was an owner that would do that. In any professional sport... Including the UFC, we just, Dana White canceled his press conference because the guy's got in a fight and he said that. It's a shit show back there. In any sport, I'm not arguing with the suspension that Tony did what he had to do. But in any sport, would it be reported (laughs) that so-and-so has been suspended because they got in a fight? You don't have to take a side. I know there's legal situations coming up but if there would be a legal situation coming up if the baseball players got in a fight or the football players or the soccer players or the disc golf players so why even if there is legal investigations going on and potentially legal things happening why is it illegal for the owner of the company to give the simple reason I stripped these people of their championships because they got in a fight in a locker room and they've been suspended. Not placing blame, reporting a fact. Yeah, listen, I know CM Punk has good lawyers, but you could say something. Come on. (laughs) What is this? Because this just made it just even more. So anyway, why don't we talk about it a little further and let's talk about it seriously. So Kenny Omega, based on this, is in Japan. Visiting Sega at a minimum. He's an executive vice president. He's suspended. The Young Bucks are executive vice presidents. They're suspended. CM Punk's the biggest star in the company. As of this moment, he's at least suspended. And I believe the same with Ace Steel and various other participants. There's an investigation going on. We don't know what that investigation truly is. If we're going with the idea there's only one investigation... We don't know what that investigation truly is. Is it just about what happened in the room that night? And can it be just about that? Or is it about everything that led up to that, which includes the behavior of the executive vice presidents, in which case Kenny Omega may be staying in Japan. I don't know. But what do you think about this investigation? What we know so far, what we don't know, and... Again, what could it be? It has to be more than just the fight, right? It has to go back to previous things and to what led them to walking down the hall and everything else. Well, if if this was Vince McMahon, he'd say, well, you can't make a decision in a vacuum, pal. You need all the information. You need to know what led everybody to that point. What caused them to have a certain frame of mind? What caused friction to be bubbling over uh, and steps along the way of where it either could have been alleviated or it was magnified and who's done what to who uh from the feuding camps and as well you said is there only one investigation well there's going to be more than one investigation because at some point the investigation is going to find something about somebody that they don't like and don't agree with and then they're going to want to conduct their own investigation of the investigation but at minimum Yes, you have to go back and say, okay, why is, yes, CM Punk said these things 
at the media scrum. Why did he say these things out in public at the media scrum? What led to that? What issues has he been having that he felt this was the way to settle things? And then for the uh, the uh, invited guests to the locker room, why did anywhere from three to six of them, as best we can determine, barge into the locker room? Uh, instead of waiting for the owner of the company, since they were his sub subordinates, instead of waiting for him to tell them, yeah, I think we might ought to, you know, just pack it up and go home for tonight while emotions are running high and let's everybody sit down tomorrow. Or would he have said, well, yeah, I think you ought to bust in the locker room and see who gets whose ass kicked or whatever. But they didn't do that. They didn't wait. Why didn't they wait? What's their issue? Let's get it all out in the open. So, yes, the investigation has to go back to what's been going on at, that we know of for at least the last several months between the Buckaroos and CM Punk and anyone uh, associated with him or sympathetic to his side of the story. Because there's and this, that's the side that hadn't been saying anything. The first we heard from. The Punk side was when Punk did the media scrum, right? Has there been any shoot interviews from anybody associated with Punk? Has there been any veiled references? Besides when Punk responds to things like he did to Adam Page's interview when he did it a few weeks ago, or when he references something that somebody else has done, and that's only been recent because nobody else was bothering to put out his side of the story. Well, there's a difference, too, between bothering to put out his side of the story and getting his side of the story. You also do have to, you know, it's tit for tat. Well, no, you, well, and, and you got the tits on one side, uh, whispering everything and, and to all of their friendly journalists and making sure that they have the story that they want out there. And you got the tat side that's been acting professionally and going about their business until they're forced by the lack of leadership in the company and the general overall tone to do something about it themselves because nobody else is going to do it. So you got the tit side and you got the tat side. So this investigation, if it's going... You know, have you ever noticed there's a lot more tits than there are tats in the world today? And not anymore. Everyone has a tat nowadays, it seems like. It used to be you had to be a tough guy or a sailor or something to have a tattoo. And then it became the punk rockers embraced it. And then a lot of skinny white wimps saw Henry Rollins like, I wish I was like that! And then they got tattoos. And then Axl Rose influenced a whole nother crew of people. And then they got yeah, tattoos. But there's still more tits in the world. Because you know what another word for tit is, don't you? What's Boob. That? And there's a lot more boobs in the world than there are tats. All right, and there's certainly tit willows. And before we get stuck in the willows here, why don't we get back to the question I was asking you, which is about this investigation. If the investigation is about what happened in that room, like we said before, it can't be limited to just what happened there. It has to be what caused it. I have a very difficult time. There's a few people I think have to be fired. Uh, and it may not be the people everyone else thinks, but again, if it's all about the general behavior leading into this, I I think Ace Steel's done, just because I don't know how you bring him back after this. I think Kenny Omega may have an issue. I think I think you should make Ace Steel the chairman. <laughs> He's gonna you can't steal Is Sean Spears still there? Does Sean Spears still work there? Oh boy, there's a name from the past. See that thought gimmick's about him. free, available, and open. Who was his manager? Tully Blanchard. Tully Blanchard. Is Tully still there? No, He's he in left. Ring of Honor with Cole Cabana and Brian Cage and all the guys no one sees ever. Oh, no, he quit. He didn't even he show. Remember, he no-showed their yes. pay-per-view. <laughs> he no-showed when he was supposed to go to. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but I, I'm most sympathetic to Ace Steel of anybody because he's just running in the room to save his crippled wife. I guess the question becomes from a company standpoint. Is Ace Steel's responsibility to go in there and de-escalate things or go in there and fight on behalf of a side. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but if you're investigating someone, I'm going to guess that's going to be the question they're asking. 
about A. Steele's involvement. I would think yes, but I would also think that, you know, if so, if your friend, his dog, and your crippled wife are in a room and six at least or thereabouts full-grown adults burst into the room and there's a fight going on, you're going to go in and help the uh, outnumbered side. But that's just me. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think the end result's going to be? You know, here's the thing. If it was the wrestling business of days gone by, then Tony would probably fire a few miscellaneous people, yank a knot in a few other people's tails, and everybody would go on because it's business and they'll get over it. But now with independent investigations and the cuntish nature of most of the buckaroos and their feelings, you know, who knows? It, because here's the thing. Punk's been putting up with his shit for a while. If he's the biggest star in the company, he's, he's on the video game, he's on all the po he's on everything. If they fire him, not only are they shooting themselves in the foot, but also he'll probably sue because he's the goddamn injured and put upon party here that not only injured himself in the line of duty, but then had various high-ranking employees burst into his fucking locker room while he's outnumbered and injured. That's a lawsuit, if nothing else. You can fire the Bucks and, and Kenny, and it wouldn't really impact business because people are already tuning them out on television anyway. And we've done nine months without Kenny, and it was actually better. I'd love to try to do nine months without the Bucks and see how the, but it, it's not like the core AEW audience is going to desert if they were not around because they'll watch anything. It's the extra several hundred thousand people that the stars get that you got to worry about going away. They're already going away just when these people pop up on television. But if Kenny was to fire, if, if Tony was to fire the buckaroos there, then they'll probably sue him. Who knows what for, but they're litigious twats. Uh, they're whiny little bitches, so that'd probably be their last resort. And I they don't may be know. suing Punk. I mean, that's the other thing. You're talking about them suing Tony or them suing AEW. They're going to sue Punk, maybe. Well, then if they sue Punk, because Punk, I get Punk. Gave one a black eye and Ace Steel knocked the other one out with the chair or vice versa. There's so many stories going around. They both got their fucking r ruby red asses kicked in fine fashion. I heard Nick Jackson's eye was closed shut immediately almost. Well, so anyway, so they might sue, but if they sue Punk, they're also, and I've, I've been a party to a few lawsuits, not from the good side, from the bad side. If they sue Punk, they almost have to sue Tony Khan. Because Tony Khan not only set up the, the working relationship and the working environment and the infrastructure of the whole thing, but it's technically, and they might actually, depending on what kind of lawyer they get, they might name the arena and or whatever arena security were being used that night as well. Because if the Bucks get a lawyer, that lawyer's not going to worry about hurting anybody in the wrestling business's feelings. If they're going to go to the point of a lawsuit, then they'd go all the way. So they might sue Punk as well as Tony Khan because it happened on his watch and they might have to include the arena. And Ace Steel. Well, and Ace Steel, obviously. But I'm talking about even farther reaching the arena. If the arena are the ones that contracted the security. If Tony contracted the security, then he gets sued twice. But but all these, I mean, we punched a fucking guy in Baton Rouge one night. Well, I whacked him with the racket and Dundee punched him three times and he sued me, the members of the Midnight Express, Dundee, who he didn't know. So that was a John Doe. He didn't know who the fuck Dundee was. The Baton Rouge Centriplex, the security and the city of Baton Rouge just for getting punched four times. So you spread a wide net on these lawsuits. So if they wanted to file a suit, they would, their lawyer would tell them most probably to include at least Tony Khan. 
Then if they were still working there, they'd be suing the guy that they worked for. So, it, 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 uh, you know, uh, I mean, from from a business only standpoint, you keep punk and you get rid of everybody else. If you want to just get rid of everybody, then you're shooting yourself in the foot for business because then you've lost significant, you know, uh, talent at the top. I don't know what he's going to fucking do. The punk stuff is interesting because, again, punk's not completely innocent. No matter what we want to say, even if you want to take someone's side, we don't know what happened in that room. So punk has to be admonished, punished, whatever it is at a minimum, just like everyone else here. But the issue becomes if Tony just suspends him, and he's going to be out now with an injury, so I don't know even what a suspension means. It's not like, you know, baseball where it's from the beginning of the season or whatever. I don't know how a suspension works if he's going to be out no matter what. It's a paid vacation, like you said. (laughs) But there will be issues bringing Punk back right now into that locker room. I mean, not just with the Bucks' friends. That is a legitimate thing. The way this all went down, the danger it put the whole company in, there are a lot of people upset about it. Does Punk just, if this happens and Tony just brings him back, whatever, a year from now, is it just he brings him right back or Punk just continues to do what he's doing and stays to himself and doesn't really interact with too many people on the roster, except for the people he talks to and gives advice to or whatever? Well, apparently he had been interacting with almost everybody on the roster that's not in the Cucamonga Kids' fucking treehouse club. We've seen the articles from a variety of people praising him for the help that he gave him or the fact that he was giving him advice and his door is always open. Now, again, they may not appreciate or they could have done without this happening because now they're shitting themselves. Oh my God, the company I'm working for may be falling apart. But otherwise than that, Punk has not done anything to dissuade those people's positive opinion of him in the locker room, just as he hasn't done anything to help the negative opinion of him that the Bucks camp has, which is what started the the rumor campaign and the blah, blah, blah. And well, now the whole thing with Fish is coming out. And now it makes a little more sense when they had that awkward match on TV a few months back that didn't, several months back, that didn't uh, seem like it came together like it should. And that also there was some miscommunication, we thought, because fuck, he kicked out right at the finish. Almost kicked out on the finish. Come to find out he did kick out on the finish. Because now we find out that Bobby Fish is a godfriend of the Bucks. They're God-fearing family men. And also Bobby Fish is apparently a right-wing religious fanatic because he just uh, admitted in public that he gave money to that lunatic referee Drake Wirtz in Florida to stop the child molesters that are apparently on every corner, according to these people. So he fits in with the ideology that the Bucks and their camp possess. So was that, uh, and and then P- Fish goes into, well, my MMA is so much better than Punk's because he got his ass kicked. Noted UFC veteran Bobby Fish says this. I said this the other day, I hate to hear this because I always thought I'd never cross-examined him about every facet of his life, but I thought Fish was a good talent. He was an adult and serious. I didn't know he was a wacko, but now apparently he thinks he's Bobby fucking Gracie and that he could have stretched CM Punk and he did CM Punk a favor by putting him over that well in the fucking match and challenge him to a fight and I'd stretch him from asshole to appetite if it was a shoot and all this other stuff, which then backfired on Bobby Fish because all he got on Twitter in response to that was jokes about his fucking advanced age, including, hey, what could you have done? You couldn't even save Abraham Lincoln from John Wilkes Booth. But this goes to my question earlier about the investigation and how far it looks back. I got to look to see when that Bobby Fish match was. It may have been at the end of last year after Bobby Fish first came in. If Bobby Fish worked with Punk and now he's admitting he was purposely difficult and we could see it, and it was noticeable at the time, although because Punk was kind of going through a phase where 
He would struggle in his matches. You didn't know what you, you didn't we, realize. We, th- we thought he was working the I'm rusty because I just came back deal and not the this prick won't work with me deal. Yeah, not this guy's not giving me anything and I'm trying to be a professional. And then he kicks out on the three of the pin. If that happened then, how does that not tie into all this? Bobby Fish is best friends, not best friends, I won't say that, but he's all in the Bucks camp. I mean, he's defending them. I mean, how is that not part of this whole thing? If the whole thing is that the Bucks and their friends have been waiting to get punk. Have had a chapped ass that CM Punk was around since the beginning because it took attention off of them and they was potentially they were seeing that somebody was going to elevate people outside of their little fucking social circle and their little clique. So again, the investigation, I would think, would have to take that in. So then it covers a whole lot of other stuff. I would think they would have to interview how, people how like much, Adam Page. You know, a notably cranky motherfucker who does not take, I believe, as Dave Shearer put it, does not take disrespect well. He comes into a company as the top guy and he gets his finish kicked out on on TV by fucking Bobby Fish, of all people, who was the fourth member of the Undisputed Era. Um, He gets confronted by and and go a guy going into business for himself on a live promo before the main event world title match adam page he sits at home for a couple months injured after surgery listening to all the alleged wrestling journalists whining that he's the one that got poor cole cabana transferred over to ring of honor like Again, like a paycheck every week for working in a non-existent wrestling promotion is a goddamn horrible thing to have happen. He's been, he's been getting a check to work in a fucking existent wrestling promotion for the past three years and done nothing. The whole argument. So, so I'm I'm just saying that's a, he's had to sit on top of all this shit and fester about it because all this shit's been going on and nobody's been doing anything about it. If we are to believe that version of events, that Punk is the reason Colt Cabana was not going to be there any longer, why would it have been done that way? Why would it have just been, oh, his contract's expiring, so Tony's not going to renew, renew him? Why wouldn't it have been, hey, listen, if you want me to come in for this first dance, I don't want this guy that cost me a bunch of money, a bunch of fucking time I had to spend dealing with this shit, I don't want him working there. That's the time you would have made the move. Right yeah. there. Send him fucking home. Pay him if you want, but I don't want to see him around here. I said that, but again, the contract was coming up for renewal. Tony was probably thinking, well, maybe Colts lost my number. And then one of the Jackson boys says, oh, well, here's a way we can give Colts some free money from this sucker that we work for. And at the same time, we can start some kind of campaign against cm punk that it's all his fault so cabana goes home to get a check in the mailbox every week to do absolutely fucking nothing and somehow he's a victim see that's the way tony actually played it smart i mean in the long run it all backfired but he saw what happened to you when you fired cabana from ring of honor and all of a sudden you became public enemy number one (laughs) he shifted all of that to punk he got away from it God, you would think that I'd taken ice cream away from orphans. <laughs> we said, no, no, we don't, no, we don't need you. Don't have a spot. Nothing open at this time. See you later. Well, we will keep everyone informed about what happens with this investigation. Like we said, there's a lot of interesting things happening here. Depending on how big the purview is, my prediction, Ace Steel and Kenny Omega fired. But let's see what happens. Jim- now, wait, let's, let's. Chisel that into some stone here because you've been right with a lot of your predictions the last couple of years. So, And I have said Kenny Omega will be the next EVP out the door, but that, of course, was before Nick Jackson got knocked out. <laughs> and I, I don't even know which one got hit. There's a chair. That's the other thing. Is it a folding chair or is it like one of these chairs? Like what kind of chair was thrown exactly? I think it had to be a folding chair because those, those uh, big squeaky chairs like you got, they're too padded. They wouldn't have even heard a little delicate flower like uh, balding Nick Jackson. Was it a chair with four legs? Did Ace Steel come in there and pick up one of those big chairs with four legs and just <laughs> haul it across the fucking room? How did, I want to know how they used the chair. This is the most interesting part of the story that no one's talking about. Everyone's upset right now. 
you know, everyone's still pretty fired up about this whole thing. Tony Khan has lots of money. And any of these lawsuits, at the end of the day, what it would be about is money. If you're Tony Khan, as crazy as this may sound right now, but in a few months, do you spend what it takes to get these guys in the ring somehow to work together? Is it worth it to try and do something with all these guys, or is it a lost cause? Well, again, if it was the wrestling business of the old days, that would work. I don't put it past uh definitely the kookamonga kids to okay it ain't ballet and shit happens the first potato that they catch they'll go into fucking full-fledged whiny bitch mode and try to sue or fight or do something or other and then what is tony khan's you know what what's what's the statement that he makes then oh Everybody said they had made up. So despite the fact that we had a big incident <laughs> that caused investigations and potential lawsuits and everything before, they said they all made up and wanted to work together. And that's that's what we thought they were doing until so-and-so kicked so-and-so with the point of his toe in the fucking upper goddamn uvula. And that guy fucking turned around and said, well, you son of a bitch, I oughta. And here we go. And they had another fight. Now they're suing again. I... <laughs> My idea from a few months ago that I said to you, half jokingly but half not, that Tony should just give the Bucks and everyone who's kind of into their style and their group of friends, give them Ring of Honor and just let them do their thing there and then treat the TBS show differently. Even if you use them, just treat it differently. If they're still under contract and they're not going to be fired and Tony's not going to let them go, is that idea as crazy today? Even though Ring of Honor doesn't exist as really anything, we know they have contracted wrestlers because their buddy Colt Cabana's there. <laughs> is that as crazy an idea today as it was a couple months ago? Probably not. Uh, that Yeah, start two promotions, one wrestling and one gymnastics, and let the Cucamonga kids and their friends play there. That, of course, then you're spending a lot of money for no fucking reason, otherwise that a bunch of people are goddamn immature, childish jack-offs, but... And then we could see whether the real wrestling or the goddamn cheerleading routines is what drew the ratings and the money. And we think we know what that case would be. Here's one. I'm going to read you one. And then I'm going to make a comment after this. We've received several about this or in this vein. This was sent to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Robert. What if it's this? CM Punk tells Tony before the scrum. Dude, I'm hurt. I know it. I'm going to be out a while. I'll tick everyone off in the presser. Make the EVPs and you look bad. Maybe the EVPs even fight me. You'll have to suspend me and take the belt off me. So I asked this one. This is one of many with the idea that this whole thing is a work. So I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are about it being a work. And then I guess to show the brilliance of the mind of Jim Cornette, if it is at work, how do we put it all together? How do we deconstruct this? <laughs> okay, well, no, I ain't that brilliant. Because it's not a work, and you can't put this together where anybody benefits in any way whatsoever if it is a work. If it was a work, is what I should say. Uh, no, again, from the Montreal screw job to the, whatever, everybody wants to think that everything in wrestling is a work because 98% of everything or 99 or whatever the overwhelming statistic is, is a work. But I think now people are trying to figure out a way to justify this in their own mind as being a work because it's so ridiculous. But that's the thing. Much as in wrestling, you can find a story a, a top guy and you can put him over and you can give him wins and you can give him TV time or whatever, but a superstar, the magic has to happen with the people, right? It, it, you know, you can push him all day long, but Stone Cold Steve Austin or The Rock ha has to happen because of the people. And generally that's accidental. And you don't book it that way. It, it give you know, Austin 316 says, I just kicked your ass or, 
you know, if you smell what the rock is cooking, because fuck you for die, Rocky, die or whatever. Some, you, they, none of these things were intentional. The screw job wasn't intentional. It was seen as something that they had to get, get over with and get past, and now they can't get past it 25 years later. It's the biggest thing still they've ever done. So you don't book those things. And in the same way, anything this ridiculous in the wrestling business, I promise you, was not pre-planned by all parties. Now, some party may have had a thought, well, if such and such happens, I'd do this or whatever. But no, none of this was planned. Obviously, it was. if it was, it was the most poorly conceived and thought out and implemented fucking work in recorded history. Let's play devil's advocate, okay? We have not seen any photos or anything of anyone with any injuries coming out of this fight. We've only heard stories about it. All anyone has is stories. What if this is all the build-up CM Punk and FTR versus Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks? <laughs> what better build-up? The man behind the pipe bomb. The kids behind Cucamonga. I don't know what they're behind. <laughs> they all get the together. Eight, the the eight ball right now is what they're behind. The greatest work shoot of all time. What do you uh, think? Well, and then you're giving... Guest referee Colt Cabana. <laughs> <laughs> then you're given a number of simpletons involved in this credit for being able to conceive this and or pull it off and also again for what business i'm i'm an ftr fan and i love me some punk and there's no way that punk and ftr versus the bucks and olivier with Larry is special referee, and Luthez is going to stretch the losers on pay-per-view. That still wouldn't draw enough money to make the goddamn justification for fucking up your world title picture, taking your fucking top stars out of your open of your show, suspending them, taking them off advanced advertising of places they're going to be, taking statements, having attorneys burning up telephone lines. You could have no. you could have Mega in a shark cage above the ring. <laughs> yeah, Mega in a shark cage above the ring. Special guest timekeeper Topher. But then you know what she's going to do? Every lawyer carries a ballpoint pen. She's going to drop the pen through the bars of the shark cage, and somebody's going to get stuck in the eye with it. No, it's 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 not a work. Bless y'all. Please get hobbies. Unfortunately, this isn't a work. This is. Ha, huh, apparently as legitimate as now it, the one thing that what was the the caller's name that asked this question? Oh, I actually don't have the email in front of me anymore. Well, well, okay, little Robert little I think McGee. was the email. Tits McGee was. over there that asked the question. I believe it was Robert, not Tits McGee. The, well, Robert McGee or or Tits Robert, I don't know, or Barack Hussein from the previous administration. Or um, Arabian from the previous email. You know, well, there you go. I, I, rem I remembered it was something began with a B. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is I can believe that Punk, after that match, he's already bleeding. He's hurt some element of his arm. I've, I've heard triceps is what we've heard now. He's fucking frustrated anyway because he's just been off for an injury and he's had to suffer through sitting and listening to the whisper campaign and all the, the rumor mill about what he was pissed about and his boss has done nothing about it. And he's the only thing to make him smile is he's got a tasty muffin in front of him. And I would think that he probably at that point saw all of the, I'm going to try to say this with a straight face, the journalists I I wonder how many people in that room actually went to journalism school. And I'll give Uncle Dave that. He went to school for it. He didn't go to the school of common sense, but he knows how to write. Um, But I wonder how many of them went to school for journalism or how many of them just got free tickets because they're publicity machines. And he decided to say a few things that had been 
troubling him and get a few things off his chest. I can believe that that much. That may have been pre-planned. By the time he walked in there, he was like, well, you know, I got the chance to say to all these people that have been printing all this shit from the, the buckaroos camp, I got a chance to make a point here to all of them and say some things that I, apparently I'm the one that's going to have to say because it's not coming from the owner and leader and manipulator of the company. So I'm going to have to do it on my own. I can believe that. Otherwise, everybody else pretty much was reacting to what they heard. And if it's a work, where does it start? Does it start with Punk and Cabana in 2013 saying, hey, I got an idea. If a billionaire comes around yeah. in 10 years, we're set. <laughs> it's all part of the plan, Smithers. Thinking of the long way around, you just talked about the Young Bucks. Jim, in a related story to this whole Young Bucks CM Punk melee fiasco whatever you want to call this whole thing and it's still up in the air so much of it there have been a lot of people a lot of listeners of the show sending in photos i'm going to assume you've seen some of them kenny omega on his japanese vacation stay i'm not exactly <laughs> sure what it is appeared his on excursion. some excursion his excursion he appeared on a tv show and a lot of people seem to notice what appeared to be a bite mark on the inside of his forearm have you seen any of these photos Yes, I, I I saw him at a table. It looked like he was signing autographs. Possibly he was on television sitting at this table. I don't know, but I've seen that. And, and some people were kind enough on Twitter to do the the telestrator thing where they circle it with a you know a colored circle so you can see it. But yes, he's got a bite on the inside of his left forearm, uh, a little about halfway in between the the crook of the elbow and the uh, the meat of the inside of the arm, which would obviously be the perfect place for somebody to bite you if you were in the process of trying to put a fucking rear choke on them. So I don't see how he got bit by saving the dog. Wouldn't you need both arms to pick up a dog and carry it to safety from a burning building or a locker room brawl? The dog didn't bite him. At least Larry Talbot has not been accused of, of biting him. So how in the world did A. Steel manage to get his teeth right there inside Kenny Omega's forearm, I wonder? Unless Kenny Omega's forearm was being wrapped around his head at the time. Yeah. Because the other argument, like you said, is innocent Kenny Omega <laughs> was holding this dog that isn't his, that I'm sure just loves strangers picking it up, that while all this is happening, and the Bucks are getting their ass kicked by CM Punk and Ace Steel, and Christopher Daniels is in the mix, and other people are in there trying to break this thing up, while all that's happening, Kenny Omega's innocently tiptoeing out of the room with the dog until Ace Steel runs over to him, mouth first, apparently, <laughs> right into his arm and bites him. It's either that or Ace Steel was in the middle of the melee. Kenny Omega got either on top of him or behind him, got his arm around him. Hey, you do that to me, I'm going to bite you too. I got to be honest. Well, I, how you do you too. know if, if the arm is coming from behind? How do you know whose arm it is to begin with in one of those scrums? Because I scrum, as they say, because scrimmages. I've been in that position in crowd activity where an arm comes around behind you and you don't know who the fucks it is. And one time, as a matter of fact, I've told this story, it was a fucking cop. The cops didn't like us in Saginaw, Michigan when we jumped on the fucking mark that tackled Bobby. And so I was trying to take my tennis racket and swing over my head to get the cop that had me around the neck from behind. Because you can't tell it's an arm. So a lot of that shit happened very quickly. And But apparently, Kenny's arm has the habit, like Kenny does, of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. You had the same reaction I did to the Kenny Omega bite photo to circle back to where we started. That looks like where you'd get bitten if you put your arm in front of someone's mouth. Yes. Yeah, which is the, the way you've got to do it when you're going to try to get on somebody's back and fucking choke them. So maybe Kenny ought to concentrate on not trying to choke people while he's on their back still haven't heard too much about the status of the suspensions of omega the bucks a steel or cm punk the length of the suspension if there is in fact a suspension have we, 
I guess we've heard that at least, that there are suspensions, yes. but we still don't know too much about this whole thing. Well, it, it sounds like that they uh, they dropped the suspensions on people that could reasonably have been expected to have been there trying to break it up instead of getting involved in it. Um, You know, I was... Right, we shocked. did... Well, I'll just say, we did see Pat Buck, Christopher Daniels, and I think Brendan Cutler and Nakazawa were, were cleared, I believe. And I can, you know, I was surprised about Christopher Daniels. And Topher, and Topher backstage, I believe, was cleared. Who? It's someone you don't know, but he was involved. Okay, well, Topher, is he the guy that used to be on uh, the that 70s show? Whatever happened to him? I wondered if he got a new job. That was the worst show. But nevertheless, I was surprised about Christopher Daniels because he's a grown adult and he is a talent relations, you know, executive now that Tony put out all those promotions. And even if he is from California and friends with the Cucamonga Kids camp, I didn't expect him to, you know, be going into a a locker room with mayhem in his heart. He's probably one of the people that was trying to at least observe, caution, calm down, whatever the fuck, so I can see that. Cutlet and knock it to fuck off. I mean, you know, they're probably just dim-witted stooges that were following their, you know, the the leaders of the Treehouse Boys Club. But um, I don't see how you can drop any of the EVP suspensions without dropping all of them. And I don't see how you can actually penalize a steel if you're not penalizing punk because steel was coming to punk and his wife's assistance. And actually steel may be the next innocent victim in all of this, but even before punk and the EVPs where he's going to get tied up with this investigation is you're going to have two different, you can have three different camps, three sides. It's punk side or the punk camp, the buck side and management. And the argument's going to be, or the question's going to be, was Ace Steel trying to break this up in his job as AEW producer or whatever it was, or was he escalating it? Was he getting involved? And I think that's where you're going to have different people arguing different things and it's going to get tricky. Well, but the problem is what, uh, what status does a steel have that trumps his other status is it more important to him and is it more natural to a human being to go into a room where his friend is in a fight with a number of individuals and his wife is stuck while she's on crutches and start clearing some shit out (laughs) see that's the thing there if he wasn't in the room when they busted in and he turns around seconds later when there a commotion is heard and knows his wife's in there on crutches and punks getting triple teamed at the very least. Fuck it. Any normal person, whether they got a goddamn job as a, a producer or a representative of Walmart or whatever the fuck, is going to go do the same goddamn thing. If they have any balls and or self-respect. So... You know, sorry. If his wife hadn't have been in there and he hadn't seen numerous guys in a conflict with his best was single alone best friend, then yeah, then yeah, you're supposed to break some shit up, whatever the fuck. But no, that other shit changed. The news that broke overnight, although I had heard a few things last week, it is now, I guess, officially being put out there. Dave Meltzer reporting a steal officially released from AEW. I hate to hear that because he was my hero in the whole thing. He's the one that really did all the damage. He came to the, like a knight in shining armor, came to the rescue of his poor crippled wife who was trapped in a room with a bunch of raging EVPs. And if, if, if it wasn't Larry that bit old Yeller over there, if it was indeed a steel and that was heroic, and the chair and the whole nine years. It sounds like he was fucking Dick the Bruiser in this. I think he should be on top. He should be in the main event over there. No, I'm sorry to hear that because he's a experienced veteran wrestler, trainer, 
et cetera, with a lot of fucking background in the wrestling business, the kind of guy that they need. If they didn't have the kookamonga kids and the weirdo from fucking Sapporo, you know, uh, causing all this trouble, they'd still have a valuable employee. So that's what I think about that. They didn't really have much of a choice, though, with A. Steele. Out of everyone involved in it, he seemed, as I said early on, there were two people who I thought would be gone coming out of this and the various things that led up to this, and I thought A. Steele would definitely be one of them. He was there the shortest period of time. Um, You know, there's certainly been a lot of issues around the idea that it was put out there that CM Punk led to Cole Cabana being removed or almost fired. Well, I want to assume that CM Punk is one of the people that led to A. Steel being hired in the first place just because of the situation, but he's gone now. How do you think this affects whatever else is going on with this mysterious investigation? Well, you know, that's the problem is Punk can't come back now if everything, well, okay, we've, you know, concluded the investigation and the dipshits were at fault. Punk, come on back. He's just had surgery. So we may not know what's going on there. We may not know what's going on with the EVPs for a while. I, I, didn't uh, somebody say that Twinkle Toes couldn't appear in Mexico because he was still suspended at, Conan. at AAA? Or, Apparently yeah. Conan is the one who said that he asked Kenny Omega to record a video, just a short video, because I believe he is still... He's not the mega champion, right? He's the number one contender for their mega champion. He's the mega, mega King Kong Godzilla champion. Isn't Chris Jericho the mega champion? But anyway, I... uh, Kenny Omega couldn't send the video. And the reason that was put out there was because of legal issues. Well, I think they ought to send him to Mexico for about three or four years. You say work every night. That's uh, that's how you can clear this whole thing up. And that way we wouldn't have to look at him. But everybody that wanted to search it out could easily find it. No, I I don't know. Again, yeah, because A. Steele's the one that, from what we can tell, did most of the damage. <laughs> Whatever was left over the punk didn't do, Steele did. So, you know, he's not the main event star. He's not the world champion. He's not the guy that drew million-dollar gates. So I guess they got to do something to make some people happy. But we will see when it gets down to, as well as everybody down south used to say, when it gets down to nut-cutting time, we'll see what happens with the uh, the Mount Rushmore of the situation. Twinkle Toes, the Cucamonga Kids, and Punk. Let's talk about the big news of the week. Apparently now the the information has trickled out or dripped out or trickled down and dripped or whatever the case that Punk and AEW are negotiating, potentially, we this has not been confirmed, we haven't seen documentation of this, but that's the story going around. Punk and AEW are working on a contract buyout, and that the holdup is a non-compete clause. So, <laughs> the one good thing that has happened to this company over the last year, they get a major star. He produces ratings. He produces gates. He produces good television. He produces good matches. And Tony Khan cannot keep his fucking nursery school from fucking up this goddamn deal and pissing off his star. And now, instead of telling Twinkle Toes and the Cucamonga kids, hey, why don't y'all go back and play with your fucking schoolgirl friends in Japan because I need real talent because I'm in a promotional war and my ship is taking on water. Now he's going to talk about to punk about a buyout. Does that mean he's going to bring the other three back? Or will he buy punk out and just fire the other three for putting him in this position to spend probably a few million dollars at minimum? to never have his biggest star on his television again. Your thoughts before I get too pissed off. I mean, it's very sad that this is the ending and this is where we've come to. We'll talk about the non-compete because that's the very interesting aspect of this because no one has really thought about the idea of CM Punk going to WWE until all this has popped up. Uh-huh. 
I will say it's almost poetic. It's almost as if it was scripted perfectly. CM Punk debuts in Chicago with the first dance. Same building that Michael Jordan had the last dance in. And they just had that ESPN documentary series, The Last Dance. CM Punk has, in my eyes, and everyone has their own opinion and their own thoughts, has almost a perfect year. His feuds, his promos, his matches, even the ones I wasn't crazy about, they told a story. Nothing was phoned in. And we had one amazing year. And he went out in the same place he had the first dance. He had his last dance. And what better way to script the ending? Wins the world championship, knocks out the troublemakers in the back. Now he's going to get fired for it. I mean, the problem is it was set in stone in a way. Because the only way he was, the only way this was going to work is if Tony decided he was going to take charge and put his foot down. But Tony had, you know, Tony had Mega who wanted CM Punk fired. And Jericho wants CM Punk fired. So who that talks to Tony is going to bat for CM Punk? Nobody. So now it's Tony's thoughts versus all these people saying, fire Punk. You know, it's sad. I hope this isn't the last we see of CM Punk. That's my other thing. I, as a wrestling fan, I tremendously enjoyed his last year. Like I said, everything. It brought a sense of realism to that program. And people reacted to it. So it's not just me saying it. Other people felt it too. I just hope this isn't the last we see of him. And uh, if this is the last of him in AEW, if all this is true, it was the best run anyone's had in AEW. Hey, you know, that is actually perfect because you were right about everything you said. He came in, he produced in every metric, television ratings, gate, pay-per-view, match quality, promos, everything. The only person in the three years of this television program, everything he did pretty much made sense except for the shit that he had to coexist with. And then he basically, on his last night, wins a world title and, and beats his shit, and A. Steele along with him beats the shit out of the fucking guys running their fucking pie holes behind his back and tells the public what he thinks of them. But it should have ended up with those three being exiled and Punk, after his injury... And here's another thing that I don't even think we've said this. Maybe somebody else has brought it up. He had to know that he had torn his, what did they say, torn a tricep or tricep. whatever the injury was. Okay, he had to know that that was in some way damaged. And do you think he's sitting there at fucking midnight or whatever it was in Chicago going, all right, I've put up with these motherfuckers. I have tried to talk to them and i've tried to talk to tony about it i've done this business for these people i've brought these eyeballs on on this company for these people i've put up with these children and now i'm fucking probably hurt and i'm tired and i'm old and i work with children and you know what i might not get the chance to say some of these things in public again that need to be said so here we go give me some muffins it makes sense now because the one thing that you can say about punk and one thing that I admire about him is he doesn't take bullshit. He will tell you you're full of shit. And he did. He told the whole world who was full of shit because he couldn't get it rectified any other way. So now the problem is Tony has allowed his lack of leadership and the people he's chosen to do business with who are all, as we've mentioned, mortified that real talent came in the company and showed them up and outdrew them and outperformed them, and they couldn't take it, and they wanted to get him out of the way. And now if Tony does buy this contract out and Punk doesn't come back, but the other jackoffs do, then we will see again that he doesn't want this business to get bigger he wants to play with his action figures and promote indie-rific, outlaw-style wrestling because that's what he likes and that's what all of his friends want to do. And he'll pay them as much money as they need to, to have for to be happy to do that for him. 
On the other hand, we will have an amazing passive-aggressive war between the Jericho side and the fucking elite side. And we haven't <laughs> had that yet. And that'll be coming up. You know, the, the, the locker room angles are more entertaining than what's on television. I wish they'd just feed the security camera to TBS. But here's the, about the non-compete. Right now, I would I would have said at any point in time, no, Punk doesn't want to go back to the WWE. Punk doesn't have to go back to the WWE. He's still got his fuck you money. He's going to get bought out for a lot of money if that happens here, or else, or else if he comes back, he'd get paid a lot of money. Nobody's going to be doing any fucking GoFundMes. But now would be the perfect time for Triple H to show the world that he will put business in front of personal feelings. Because, again, one of the greatest lines in the history of wrestling that was never uttered on television was what Punk said to Triple H in the locker room, I don't need to work with you, you need to work with me. But that's not, I hate you and your family and I hope Stephanie gets run over by a herd of thundering goats or whatever. Although there may have to be some apologies for firing him on his wedding day. That that may be well, one, I would, no, that well, may be one they have to apologize for. <laughs> but no, see, here's the thing. There's no real apologies that Triple H needs to ask for. He needs to offer some. And I would That's imagine... That's what I'm saying. They fired yeah. CM Punk on his wedding day. He needs to offer yeah. some apologies. But who was in charge? Vince McMahon. And eight years later, whatever it is, now, depending on what this non-compete clause is, Triple H can go to the, and say to the world and say to CM Punk, it's all changed. We're about business. Let's get together. It's all about business. No personal feelings. And... Have you met Nick Khan? Have you met Nick Khan, one of the slickest guys in the world? And here's several million dollars... And then they've got the goddamn top talent that AEW has had on their television over the past three years on their TV. And, and Cody. That he, and, <laughs> and, well, and, and, and Cody, one of the EVPs, yeah. the top in-ring star, depend on what happens in 2024, maybe MJF, who knows. Uh, but it would make a statement to everybody else in the business, in the locker rooms, They'll make up with anybody and they got money to spend because they're serious and it's a new regime. And so now, again, they would make Tony look like an idiot at a point where his whole company has already made him look like an idiot multiple times. And even if it's six months from now or whenever he gets finished with his surgery. So that's probably what the holdup is. Tony Khan said, well, if I'm going to pay you, then you shouldn't be able to go anywhere for however long your contract was for, well, maybe I'll just sue you for your EVPs busting in my locker room and causing a goddamn fiasco. So we'll see how it plays out. If you're Tony, are you demanding a non-disclosure agreement? Jesus Christ, we know that Tony sleeps with those under his pillow. Right, but that doesn't mean you have to agree to it. Yeah, are are you are you buying my contract back or are you buying my silence? To those prices may be different. I hope he doesn't sign an NDA. Well, everybody's going to know what happened, yeah. just not how much. Nobody needs to know how much, but everybody's going to know what happened. And now, again, if you are a serious talent in the wrestling industry, if you're not just a young rookie that has no other chance but to get on television or to make any kind of money, or if you're not an old veteran that just wants to coast and laugh at the goofs that you're, you're sitting looking at and get a bunch of money from a billionaire, there's no reason to go to AEW. If you're a serious talent that will outdraw and outperform the EVPs and their friends, or if you're not in their clique and you're not in their social circle, and they don't like you, well, then you're fucked because the boss is not in charge. So it doesn't matter whether the boss signs you to a contract or not. Then you're putting your career in the hands of Matt and Nick Jackson. I understand sit in, according to what I've been 
reading on Twitter or on the internet, sit in on the production and booking meetings, twinkle toes when he's there, sits in. <laughs> Talk about whistling stranger in paradise. These morons sitting in on a wrestling booking session. So that's who any serious talent would be placing their careers in the hands of. A feckless, ineffectual leader that lets his talent run rampant over him and a bunch of jealous, indie-minded, as you said, passive-aggressive little fucking twats that basically run anybody off that either is not in their friend circle or that can get over them, which is almost everybody in a serious wrestling business. If the Bucks survive this, you think... Who do you think comes out on top, them and Jericho, in terms of backstage politics? Well, but now, see, remember, you're still, the Bucks are still dealing then with an old master when it comes to conniving. Um, and Jericho is, you know, he's very, he's very polished with that. So, and, and also we know that he loves coups and insurrections. So... <laughs> Keep an eye. He could, be, he, could, <laughs> he could be storming the gates of Daly's place any time now. Uh, I'm sure Hager will be with him. Hager will be right there alongside of him. So CM Punk, I mean, here we are. If this really is the end, how do you look at his AEW run? I, I, I really couldn't disagree with anything that you said when you ran it down. His matches have all made sense. Somebody's go, oh, but he botched a fucking... Buckshot Lariat or what? Big shit. Look at that program. Maybe CM Punk wouldn't have looked so good over the last year if he was on a good television program, but he wasn't. But everything that he did made sense, was serious, didn't insult the wrestling business. It drew money. It drew ratings. It was the promos, the whatever. Everything you said. That, if that was something they could have built off of, if Tony was smart enough and if the other people weren't working against him. But because they're so schizophrenic, because they have to have their falderall and their best friends hugging each other and the goddamn lizard man and all that Southern California PWG bullshit that nobody wants to fucking see. And that's why they tune it out by the hundreds of thousands. They were working at cross purposes. If you'd have had a, a young, serious lineup of talent ready to go in some interesting situations underneath guys like Punk and Danielson when they were both doing ratings, then you could afford to lose some of the top guys because people would be more interested in your newer talent now, with the exception of MJF, who gets himself over again. Who? On the male or female side is more, is in a better place now, is more over, is more popular, is more of an asset to the program than when they made their surprise appearance for the first time or when they first showed up. Nobody. Well, I tell you, apparently from what we have heard, the investigation, the big, inv boy, thankfully the January 6th commission didn't do this crummy and superficial of a job but the january uh, 6th commission was comprised of professional people seeking the truth instead of children uh forcing a self-fulfilling prophecy on a billionaire that's in over his head the investigation into the media scrum and the aftermath we are hearing rumors has been completed of course, we've already heard A. Steele has been let go from AEW because he's the only guy that could actually handle himself in a fight, apparently. Besides Punk, he's the one who did the other part of the damage. We're also hearing rumors that CM Punk is being talked to, at least, for a buyout of his, I assume, multi-million dollar contract. And there is also now a story going around that the non-compete clause may be a hang-up in those negotiations because apparently Tony wants to have his punk and eat him too. And it's funny how the whole thing has worked out to benefit the people who instigated the whole thing in the first place, our friendly EVPs over at All Friends Wrestling. So we thought we'd just talk about all of this stuff here today that's coming out or has come out or 
And now Larry, potentially. Larry was apparently injured by the door being flung open or flying open or whatever. He, either that or somebody took a shot at Larry because he had to have two teeth removed at a veterinarian's appointment several days after the incident. And people are now starting to shoot that story down because they haven't heard anything about it up till now. But Brian, maybe that's where we ought to start. Because when this whole thing happened, everybody was told, the people who were involved in the fights, people who were trying to break up the fight, everybody that had any knowledge of the incident or was going to be investigated or was going to be interviewed for the investigation, they were all told, don't say anything. Do not say a word. But all the stories and the leaks that we have come heard come out pretty much unauth in an unauthorized version since then have been from the Cucamonga Kids Camp, where we hadn't heard anything from Punk's side, as some people are calling it. So I wonder why that is. Is it because maybe again, oh, I don't know, one side is not running around, running their dick liquor behind everybody's back, trying to instigate shit, going to friendly journalists and friendly news outlets that will get their side of the story out to paint them in a more sympathetic light. And one side is doing that. I just think it, it's been a little uneven. We're, we're the only ones out there in the broadcasting world that's trying to look at this from the obvious face value of it, which is that they didn't want punk there from the start. I'm talking about the Hardly Boys and old Twinkle Toes because he exposed them. And Jericho. For, well, hold on. These guys he exposed for their limited audience. He exposed them because Tony Khan was sold a bill of goods that these guys were the elite in wrestling because of the, you know, fucking overly hysterical, but unfortunately not numerous indie and New Japan wrestling fans in this country that were just in the bubble and just enamored of them. And he thought that he could fucking put together a national wrestling promotion on their backs. When he found out those backs weren't wide enough to carry it, he had to start bringing in stars. They got somebody that was doing numbers, and they were jealous of it because not only was he doing bigger numbers than they were, but he was doing it with wrestling instead of their brand of convoluted Western swing dancing. <laughs> so those three guys, they needed Punk out of there because he was exposing the whole myth of the elite as this massive powerful force around wrestling jericho think about this without punk and if mjf suddenly somehow becomes a baby face not in terms of being popular with the people but in terms of acting like a baby face and destroys his appeal then without punk or without mjf moxley and danielson just want to wrestle they don't want to get in anybody's way. They just want to... Moxley wants to do his Moxley matches and his garbage stuff, and Danielson wants to be nice to everybody because he's a wonderful guy. So that means Jericho's a star if Punk's out of the way and MJF is maltreated by the booking. These guys would rather be the big fish in a fucking fish tank than one of the fish in the Atlantic Ocean. And that's what it's been. And they're the ones that ran their mouths from the start. They're the ones that were doing the campaign against punk from the start. All the friendly journalists that had a stake in whether or not the elite were exposed as indie-rific, fucking not-ready-for-prime-time players were more than willing to lend a sympathetic ear to their viewpoint. And it's funny how it's all worked out. The one guy that came in and got in everybody's way from having Tony's ear and or what other appendages that they have of Tony's in their pocket and 
being the star of the of the, the star of our show, that one guy, boom, he's out of the way. <clears throat> and now and and we hear, oh well, punk was poisonous and punk was cancerous. That's why all those people that we quoted on the podcast a few, well, it's probably been a couple months ago now when this all happened. The FTRs and the Hobbses and the Starks and then Darby Allen, I think everybody had great things to say about punk. A lot of those people don't seem to be on the program a lot lately either. Maybe the EVPs felt betrayed that their brand of amateur hour dog and pony show was not being praised. And instead, the big star that came in and was helpful to all those guys because they were serious about their business, and they praised him for it. Well, geez, they must be on his side. So we got to get rid of that talent too because they'll poison our little fucking clubhouse. They'll tell people that we're not as big as we think we are. Um, who did the investigation? Have we found that out? Did they hire, I, I mentioned at the top of the program, Inspector Clouseau. I wonder if, if uh, obviously, Columbo was not involved in this. Maybe Leslie Nielsen, Frank Drebin. He's done some work in wrestling before. Was he heading the invest? What was the third party firm? It, was it a legal firm? Is there someone who conducts internal corporate investigations that was contacted or consulted? Certainly they didn't leave it to their legal girl, Megan, because she was actually involved in the incident. She was mega, a mega, mega. She's a megastar in that world. Yeah, so Megan was there in the room because she apparently trickled down along the down the hallway and and joined the EVPs when they Now a lot of people say they didn't bust the door down. So I don't want to give people that impression because nobody has ever said when somebody without knocking or without doing in a silent calm manner quickly opens a door and comes in in a loud fashion. Nobody's ever said, well, they busted in the room, but she was with them because that's already been talked about. So well behind them, but yes, she was, well, she was behind them, but she was with them. She wasn't trying to hold them back apparently. So was she interviewing or being interviewed? Certainly, they didn't have the in-house legal department that was also on the scene as a witness conduct the investigation into, I guess, I don't know whether the executive vice presidents, are they her bosses or she's their boss? or No, she's their they boss. They co-bosses? Well, they, she's okay. number two in the company, according to Tony. Oh, she's number two. Well, good. Well, then she's even doing better than Patrick McGowan in The Prisoner. See, I like to just do those references every once in a while. So, so if she was, if she's number two, then she would be investigating herself and her direct employees, as well as an independent contractor that those direct employees that she was in the group with when they got in a fight came in. So it sounds like a recusement would be in order there for something like that. Do we know that Punk was an independent contractor? Well, actually, we don't know that because now he's never made a, any mention of it publicly whatsoever, except he alluded at the scrum that I'm trying to run a business here. But then Tony Khan grouped him in just, what, a few weeks ago with a statement of people who did office work and had office positions in addition to, you know, the wrestling. So, you know, it's funny how the other three went out and got EVP tattooed across their fucking forehead as soon as they got the job. And if punks had it, we've never even heard him mention it. Maybe it's because it looks bad publicly when one of the wrestlers is also one of the bosses kind of makes it look like you're just there because of your job rather than your talent. But anyway, 
So who did this investigation? Was it the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, or trickle down and drip? Shyster, Flywheel, and Shyster, one of these major, you know, investigative groups. Who did the investigation? Well, we don't know, because we have heard that it was an internal investigation, then we heard it was a third-party investigation. There are people who think that the television network wanted an investigation. And again, Mega, who, based on what I believe I read from a Tony Khan interview, was number two in the company, she's involved. And there have to be questions asked about how close she is to wrestlers and how close she is to the wrestlers involved in this or anyone else who is suddenly opining openly about this. Well, but now, hold on now. Maybe they didn't need to talk to her at all because she was just there and I witnessed the thing, but they didn't talk to all the people that were there and I witnessed the thing because, remember, A. Steele's wife, who we've now established, apparently from all accounts, that inside the locker room, we're not, we weren't talking about a big NBA locker room with 20 people in it, is a private locker room inside the room before the door was flung open were CM Punk, A. Steele's wife with a cast on her leg, and Larry the dog. And they didn't talk to A. Steele's wife. That's been reported. Nobody talked to A. Steele's wife in doing any investigation. And the reason given was, well, she wasn't involved. She was, I think the quote was, a non-factor. Well, that's the same reason why after the Kennedy assassination, nobody wanted to talk to Abraham Zapruder. He didn't have a goddamn thing to do with it. I may have gone over the heads of some of the kids there, but a lot of the older folks will get it. The point is, when is the last time an investigation was done of anything and one of the direct eyewitnesses that was there from the start was a non-factor because they just saw it, but they didn't take part in it? What? Imagine what story that might be told if they were talked to. Kind of like, well, yeah, I was sitting there with a dog and suddenly these fucking nuts busted in the door in some fashion and everybody went to fighting and Punk was outnumbered and fearing for the safety of his friend's wife and his dog and himself. And then there came Megan in. That's what she would have said, and that's not what they want to hear. So we didn't talk to the one of the main witnesses. Is this why they're talking to Punk about a buyout? Because Punk said, okay, you're not interested in the real story, so just fucking give me my money and I'll be on my way. Can I be honest? If I were CM Punk or the way I'm looking at this, this is where CM Punk has them dead to rights. because. If they're really trying to buy him out of that contract, okay, take the money and go. But if they want to non-compete, what do they have as leverage? If CM Punk wanted to sue them over all this, if there was some sort of suit over any of this, he probably has a good idea what will come out in Discovery. AEW doesn't want shit to come out in Discovery that would hurt the way people see their executives, from Mega to Omega and anyone in between. And I think. AEW doesn't really, they shouldn't play too much hardball with Punk because the last thing they want is people knowing various things and it will come out quickly. Well, because you're not just talking about things related to this case. If there is a civil suit, and by the way, civil suits also do not depend on beyond a reasonable doubt, but on a preponderance of the evidence, they would also be allowed to through discovery, be able to focus on or get details on or testimony on any improprieties or bad business, as Dusty would say, involving any of the EVPs before this or in the past as a history, as a precedent. Oh, yeah. You get your yeah. lawyer to contact them and say, make sure you don't delete any emails or text messages because we're going to go through all of them. That's right. basically how that works. So, yeah. But in any way, and then, of course, a lot of people got upset when they found out that Larry was injured in that he had a couple of teeth loosened. He'd already been scheduled to go to the vet, and the vet discovered that a few days later after the incident. 
And that's now just coming out. And of course, since that sounds bad, because somebody hurting a dog, there was a lot of shit going on there real quick. And now they're trying to shoot holes in that and say that that's not factual. Well, yeah, just because that hurts their that hurts their fucking case they've put together very carefully. I have something here from the Wrestling Observer newsletter that just came out. The story of the dog being hit with the door had not been told to anyone that we are aware of until the story broke on October 26, which many suggested was timed due to the Bucks and Omega returning to television. <laughs> and perhaps with the result of the investigation being what it was, an attempt to take them down when the investigation did not do so. Oh, good God. He's so dramatic, Uncle Dave. I mean, I mean let me just uh, comment on Again, we just mentioned nobody has been hearing Punk's side. We've been talking about it, again, from what we can observe uh, empirically. But there's been no leak of, well, Punk's side says this and says that, except A. Steele, when they fired him, they said he was surprised to hear that. Because he probably figured, well, <laughs> I mean, sillily enough, he probably figured they were actually going to do a legitimate investigation. I gotta, be, I gotta be honest, he was going one way or another. <laughs> he, well, yeah. he shouldn't have been surprised. That's ridiculous. Somebody on Twitter said, A. Steele comes in, gets his first job on national TV, says fuck on TV, does a great segment, kicks the shit out of the EVPs and leaves. He's my hero. But anyway, but besides that, we haven't heard, well, Punk's side says this and that. No, the story that we heard from the start was pretty much the story, and there were multiple witnesses that. We don't hear from Punk, but we hear from, you know, blink, wink and blink and nod over there that, thank God, they didn't have nuclear secrets during the Manhattan Project in World War II or we'd all be speaking German. These guys can't help but fucking spill their guts because they are so butthurt all the time when anybody recognizes their flaws and shortcomings. And they need their pussies pampered on a constant basis. So, anyway, now they're trying to shoot down poor Larry getting his fucking teeth knocked out. And, I, and, and he has more, correct? Because, this, again, this is not even a journalist trying to say, okay, well, this side says this and this side says that. Here's the facts, like they do on the wrestling news every morning. Yeah, by the way, this, if you want wrestling news without any opinion or spin, thewrestlingnews.com or wherever you find your favorite podcast, look for Arcadia Vanguard's The Wrestling News. None of this. Yeah. And Dave uh, continues to act like a, this is a yellow journalism campaign. He's William Randolph Hearst, and he's fucking pissed off, and he's going to use the power of his newspaper to make sure that his friends are not ill thought of. Keep going. What else do you have to say? Well, a couple things here. In terms of the dog, from the Observer about the dog, a completely made-up story, said one person regarding the story. Punk's losing and is desperate. There was a multiple <laughs> weeks-long investigation, and this was oddly not discovered? Hmm. Also, it's... Wait, so wait, wait, wait. Hold on here. Number one, Punk's desperate. Punk's desperate because he's in a bad position. He's either going to come back to work and make multi-millions of dollars, or he's going to be given multi-millions of dollars not to come back to work. Goddamn, I'd be almost suicidal. Secondly... A weeks-long investigation, and we've heard nothing about... Maybe you should have asked the other person that was in the room. Also, it so happened to be mentioned the moment there was news about the elite possibly coming back. It's insane that people would even humor this. <laughs> the dog story is a complete lie, said a neutral party who was in the locker room seconds after the incident occurred. Seconds! When the altercation was happening... Punk was a total psycho. Kenny picked up the dog to save wait, him. Wait, wait, wait a minute. You mean, you mean he was a, a guy in an actual real fight instead of one of these fucking fruitcakes fucking skipping around doing round-offs and cartwheels? No, they meant he was wearing his mother's clothes and stabbing people in the shower, but let me get back oh, to the okay. quote here. Kenny picked up the dog to save him from being hurt oh, and boy. gave him to Mega. Oh, boy. Mega was holding the dog, screaming at Punk to stop. 
Punk didn't even register that his, quote, baby was being held by a stranger in the middle of a fight. It didn't stop him one bit. Well, oh, okay, okay, because I'm, I'm down on the floor in a fight with a fucking guy, and there's chairs being thrown and all this other shit's going on, but when some girl is screaming, stop, stop, I instantly am aware that, well, the dog is in trouble. Some girl that already hates you and already has chosen a side. <laughs> some girl who's already friends with everyone who hates you. The, the, the whole now, thing is slanted. So again, so again now the, the, she was there on the scene to be, you know, to be handed the dog or whatever she's got in her hand that the boys are handing her these days. I, Hold on, let's take a step back now. Because we kind of painted the picture weeks ago based on everything we had. And the Wrestling News had information that wasn't out there that we broke. And we still have information that hasn't broke that we know about. But what we could say is... Punk's in the locker room with his dog, with A. Steele's wife, and into the room come all these people. The Young Bucks, Omega, Mega, Christopher Daniels, Cutler, Nakazawa. All of these people. Pat Buck got suspended too, didn't he? Pat Buck, I don't think he was in there for the initial uh, bunch of people that went in there. Just like A. Steele wasn't in there for the initial bunch of people that weren't in there. Guess who right. else wasn't there, by the way, everyone? Chris Jericho. I just want to point that out because you're seeing yeah. a lot of things now. There was someone hiding, trying not to get involved until it was time to give a speech and look good. And his name was Chris Jericho. <laughs> and then he comes in now. Hey, you. Hey, everyone. Let me be the hero here. I'll make sure if... this gets out to the observer. Tony, it wouldn't have happened if I was around. All these people came in the room. Is the idea, you know what? I can't believe what Phil just said in that scrum. I'm going to give him a talking to. Come with me. Let's all go there and just stand above him and lecture him. Like, what is, if it all had worked out perfectly and there were no punches thrown and no bites and no dog teeth on the ground or whatever the hell's going on, what was the best case scenario? We're going to go in there and we're going to all confront him, all of us friends who have been here since the beginning, skipping along together. What was the best case scenario? I mean, I'm asking you a serious question. What was the best case scenario here? I have no idea. I have no idea how they thought that would work because for one thing, and, and it's something I think we mentioned it a while back, but punk tore what a tricep, bicep, some type of muscle. I saw it reported as tricep. Whatever the fuck it may be. So now he's sitting in it, and we mentioned this a couple weeks ago. That's probably why he was like, well, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and say some fucking things need to be aired out in public. Because I'm, I might be back on the shelf for a while, but he's sitting there, and he's hurt, and he's wore out, and he's pissed off. So let's now that he's said that and is clearly ready, if they have a problem with it, instead of again, let's wait for Tony Khan to finish his media fantasy and bring all the rest of his action figures back to the locker room and go to Tony and say, what are you going to do about this? But instead, the three main people that he's pissed at, two of their stooges, another couple of miscellaneous locker room AEW personnel, and Megan, all rush in at the at the same time, and I would assume we're not saying, excuse Phil, could we talk for a minute? You think there wasn't probably something like, hey, what the fuck are you talking about back there? And then boom goes the dynamite. So I don't know what they think. Again, when it, when it happened, I was like, okay, you don't go. The guys asked you to come. If you got a problem, come see me. You don't go unless you got a problem. And if you got a problem and show up, just because you're the one that gets fucking knocked out first is, is not the uh, other guy's fault. You showed up. It was a specific You don't show up if you're an executive. I mean, let's go back to that. Well, yeah. I don't care. Was... He called us out. Hey, if you're on the street, go fucking deal with it. You're an executive and you're actually in your office. I'm just telling you, that would be the first impression that one would get if one had made an offer like that. 
that when here comes everybody, well, not only are they going to fucking take me up on it, but they all want to go at the same time. You know, the other thing, a lot of people have brought it up, so I think it is worth saying. CM Punk, very openly on TV, would wear shirts to support women's rights and various things. He is the only one at all of them. I don't want to make this a political thing, but he is certainly a different thinker than the Young Bucks camp and the Jericho family. Oh, yeah. And he was a different presence in the locker room. And there are people who think of AEW as just a place for you and your like-minded friends to play your games. But sometimes people don't want to play your games. It doesn't mean that they're going to ask for your game to be fired. They're just going to make their game better. But we've seen well, you, you we've seen see. throughout history with the Young Bucks, we've seen who the insecure people are who constantly have to get their side of the story out there. I've personally witnessed the way they've lied about you publicly and things you've yeah. said or done. So, I mean, CM Punk... Well, but, and they always do it in, in the way that, well, obviously, so-and-so wants to be involved with us, but they're so whatever the fuck. Or obviously, so and so is jealous of all of our success, or what? It, it's they still, they're so warped. They have to frame themselves in their own minds somehow as this pinnacle of achievement for people to be able to associate with and and deal with them and interact with them. But again, from the start, we saw what it was going to be like. You talked about like-minded, whether it's politics or wrestling or anything. That's right. That's why I business. said it wasn't just about politics, but well, it just yes. so happens with these guys. But you yes, have to but, be like minded. Business wise, business wise, Punk comes in. You didn't see him interact with pockets. That was obviously because why? Why would you spend all that money on a real star and then fucking, you know, do that? You didn't see him interacting with the trampoline cowboy crowd. You saw him working with the young guys that he thought he could either elevate or teach something to, or make something, you know, some advancement in their career. And the, the again, the Hobbses and the Darby Allens and the MJFs and the blah, blah, blah. And he didn't fuck with the people who weren't serious and were hopeless in, 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 in their spots. And that's all the friends of the EVPs. And let's, while Punk came in and drew Million dollar gates and record pay per view buy rates. No, and, it was Adam Cole and Adam Page, and everyone oh, good knows Lord. it. And ratings, etc. By whatever metric that you want to use. Meanwhile, when the uh, and and also tried to advance people and was praised for it by those people. What do you hear from the EVPs that are supposed to have a vested interest in this business? Well, they're the. The uh, California Raisins, they wouldn't put FTR over for the belts when it meant something for them to have all four of those belts because the ones they have, the three they have now are absolutely meaningless in the United States of America. They, the three belts they have would have meant something if they had the AEW belts because that's the company that they're on and the show they're on. And they had the chance to do something right for business there when FTR was so hot and the people were tearing the house down for them. But instead, they bring back Twinkle Toes from his hiatus, which wasn't nearly long enough, and they scratch all those plans so that they can have the six-man belts and they can play with their friends. And they work it in such a way that FTR isn't just, like, obviously jobbed out and beaten. They just disappear. And they're just marginalized and they're just allowed to float around. And where do you see them? Most of the time you don't. And we'll put the belts on some mid card team because that's not like everybody knows they're not as good as we are. We just won't put the one team that the fans were starting to think is better than us over. That's the kind of example of the professionalism of those guys. Then you've got old Twinkle Toes. I don't really think he knows enough. I don't think he's smart enough to do what Jericho does and manipulate backstage and bury people that are a threat to him and or 
put them over and kill them with kindness and ask for their shit to be changed so they won't be a threat to him because Twinkle Toes doesn't know how to do that. He's an idiot. What he does is he just sabotages the company with the women's division, which is a complete joke and has been from day one because he cannot put his personal feelings aside and recognize that not everybody is a complete fucking weirdo mentally like he is and wants to see on their television. Nobody wants to see her wrestle and nobody wants to, as Dusty Rhodes might say, make sweet love to her. Either one. So what the fuck? That's the kind of professionalism you get from these guys. If you're a friend, you're fine. If you're a talent, you're fucked. So now everything, as I said, has worked out so well for everybody except Tony Khan whose business continues to suffer. The EVPs got rid of the threat that they had that exposed them already, but Tony ain't realized it. Jericho's cleared the way for the canned ham to be the most prized product in the whole store. Yeah, and the other thing is Tony... Mega has Tony's ear on a lot of the non-wrestling issues, and Jericho has Tony's ear on way too many of the wrestling issues, but Jericho also has Mega's ear, so Tony's kind of getting tagged. Him. And what does Mega have of Jericho's? I don't know about that, but, but basically Tony's not necessarily, I would think, being advised uh, from a good impartial party. Well, when you're, you know, when you're grabbing people by the ear or the nose or throat or any other appendage, and getting in there with your thoughts, sometimes they register on weak-minded people. Should Tony have called their bluff if the Bucks and Omega... Let's just start with them. Jericho could be a separate one. Because, you know, Dave's reporting top guys don't want to work with CM Punk. And it was previously reported that the Young Bucks did not feel safe or did not want to work there. If Punk was there, they were even thinking about reaching out to Triple H. Oh, good God. Oh, good God. We don't feel safe. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. We don't feel safe if Punk is around. He may come and whoop us again. You fucking pussies. Hey, let me take that the other way. The idea that people are jumping on Punk because one of the stories that came out, I believe in Nick Houseman of Wrestling Inc.'s uh, reporting, he reached out to the Punk camp, that Punk didn't feel safe in the ring with Adam Page after Adam Page went into business for himself during that promo. I can believe that. Some people are looking at that and saying, oh, what a pussy punk. He's a tough guy until this, not realizing. He's not saying he wouldn't have won the fight. He's saying that's not what you're supposed to do out there on pay-per-view. Well, no, and and besides that, but hold on a second. Hold on a second. There's completely different fucking trust factor involved. When you're working with somebody and you're laying there and they're on the top rope and they're going to jump, oh, golly, I was just that far off. That could be a fucking story. Do you want to lay there and trust that guy when you've already had words with him because he's already gone into business for himself and he obviously doesn't like you because he's goddamn enamored of one of your enemies and they apparently play pocket pool together or whatever the case. That's different. A match trust is different than, oh, I don't want to go back to work and be in the locker room and be in the same building with Punk because he might come and find me and track me down and kick the shit out of me again. What's but Don't run your goddamn pie hole, and it won't happen again. But is anybody really going to fucking make the case that Punk is going to, if the Bucks and Punk are in the same arena, that Punk is going to, well, I didn't get enough last time. I'm going to go over there and kick the shit out of him again. No. But there's a lot different trust that has to go into a match. And the margin of error is nil for a lot of shit that's done to begin with. And how are you going to disprove a guy if he says it was an accident? At the same time, he's made his point. That's the kind of trust that Paige threw out the window. So, again, these fucking amateurs and or the fucking Twitter crowd that's never been in a goddamn ring and don't even understand how this shit's constructed, and the ones that they've listened to for what they have learned is the goddamn self-trained 
contingent of trampoline cowboys that don't know how the wrestling business is supposed to work to begin with either. So they get their information from people who've made it up. Uh, Jim, before we wrap things up, we have gone a while here, but we have some breaking news or... Uh Uh-oh. I don't know how broken it is. It certainly isn't fixed, though. But Jim, we have some news that's coming out. Fightful Select is reporting... Uh, This is sent by a few of the listeners to the drive-thru email. Jericho approached CM Punk, unhappy about the brawl out fight as the brawl out fight. The brawl out fight? Unhappy about the brawl out fight as well as the nature of the scrum that had just taken place. Jericho told CM Punk that he was a cancer to the locker room and a detriment to the company. Those we've spoken to didn't recount CM Punk's reply verbatim but said that he effectively told Jericho it wasn't his business and he needed to leave. (laughs) 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 Can you imagine you're in the middle of all this shit and you and your friend are fighting these other guys who have fucked with you and his girl is there and your dog is there and people are screaming and all this shit and you're fucking been hit in one way or another and you're hurt and you're bloody and all of a sudden in the middle of that Jericho runs in, probably just combed his hair. Stop enough, everyone, stop! You're a cancer to the locker room, said Mr. Pot to Mr. Kettle. And I wish we got the exact quote, but I'm sure that Punk probably drew his fist back from one of the Bucks' face and took his other foot out of the other Bucks' ass and turned over to Jericho and said, It's not any of your business, and I think you should go now. And then resumed, Ripping out carotid arteries. Thanks for showing up, Chris. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Where were you when we all needed you? Why, why didn't you run in with everyone else? Where were you, Chris? If he's worried about being a locker room leader, why wasn't he one of the people that went to Tony Khan and said, you've been hearing about this and you've been hearing about this and and you've been warned that it's headed to a physical confrontation and there's going to be some type of showdown and you're frivolously ignoring this, why didn't Chris step up and be a locker room leader by getting Tony to address the situation that he had been informed of over and over again? Because he wanted Punk gone. He never wanted Punk there to begin with. No, it couldn't be that. Couldn't be that. Why, they had a a long series of matches back in the old WWF days, didn't they? They go yeah. way back. <laughs> Yeah, how how far back? That's a long time ago that you're talking about. Well, I'm sure some things stay with you. Can you imagine working a long series with Chris Jericho? And how I'm sure that was interesting discussions on how that would go even back then. And to be honest, that's kind of the end of Chris Jericho when he was Chris Jericho. That's kind of the end of that period right there. Well, he may be back on his period because he's now he's f- firmly back. Oh, in the, I set you up so in the well. seat here in control of of the period he's having right now, ladies and gentlemen. Let me ask you this, just to throw this out there, because there are now fans saying it. So let's get your take on it. The Bucks featured the F- CM Punk chant in the latest episode of their YouTube show. They led the chant here during the match. They mocked the buckshot lariat. Omega yeah. bit the arm of well, whoever he bit the arm oh, of. Oh, yes. One of, one of the opponents, yeah, he bit his arm. The fans, I think this is building up the return of CM Punk <laughs> with another, let's say, FTR or someone, but CM Punk at least to feud with the elite. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it actually, it would be business. If they had that uh lined up laid out then all this would be perfectly acceptable and and wishful thinking would indicate you know that everybody would want to see that right oh yeah everybody gets back together we have this big program it draws all kinds of money but what you are overlooking is the fact that these fucking douchebags don't want to draw money they don't want anybody to jeopardize their position their their company, their revolution, their movement, if anybody gets over or is more important than them or shows people that their wrestling is shit and that people still in larger numbers react to shit they can understand, that's bad. And that would have to 
you would have to assume that the Buckaroos and Twinkle Toes were willing to work with a guy like Punk, who they've had heat with, or that Tony would be willing to deal with a guy that's told him to go fuck himself or whatever. Now, I know people are saying, well, hey, Vince McMahon has put the WWF title on a dozen guys that said fuck you to him or whatever, right? Before that. Yes, because Vince was all about business. This is not business. This is fantasy booking by a billionaire boy child and the incredible windfall that these self-trained, self-important, self-indulgent nitwits have fallen into by getting said billionaire boy child to fucking fund their goddamn vision of what this Fakakta wrestling is. And it ain't working because they're in the same place they were three years ago, but they've had tons more bad publicity. Ticket sales are going down. Ratings are going down. Everybody's getting in a fight backstage. And the only people in the locker room that have the pull with Tony to get him to do anything are the ones that are protecting their spots at the expense of everything else. The show, the program, the promotion. The show, the program, the, the business, everything. So, yes, in a perfect world, this would all be a work, but it's not. And it's not going to be. And they don't have it in them to call Punk and say, all right, let's put this fucking behind us. Let's make some money. And let's, to be honest, besides the same group of people, you could probably get Punk and Olivier if, if people thought there was goddamn real legitimate bad feelings, which there is. You could probably get a pay-per-view out of them. To have Punk in the same ring with the Buckaroos would just be bringing him down to their level. There's no money to be made there anyway, because the only people that would care would be the same people that's already watching the show. I think there are people who would pay thinking the idea they would love to see CM Punk get his hands on the Bucks. Because if you really think about it, even when they lose matches, no one ever gets his, their hands on the Bucks and just smacks them around and treats them like shit. I don't know. I think that anybody who dislikes the Bucks that bad would probably think, well, he already beat him up and for real and in a locker room, and why, why should I pay to see it again for a work? But, it, it, I mean, just, there's no way, if you noticed, I'm sure everybody did, CM Punk and neither of the Buckaroos ever crossed paths on camera during his entire time in that promotion. Right? The only thing I saw is apparently, and I think it must have been on their little YouTube show, when CM Punk debuted, they did a video of them making mocking faces of the reaction to CM Punk. Yeah. Backstage. That's the only thing I know yeah. of. Well, yeah, because that's where they were back doing their little YouTube thing, and he was doing the real television program. But there was never any interaction, because I'm sure that right off the bat, Punk said, I'm going to work with serious talent. There was never any interaction with Olivier either. But I'm not saying that if, if people knew there's real heat, and then they could get them to work, that might be interesting. And if Olivier is able to listen and do as he's told and be led, probably have the best match he's ever had with Punk because he wouldn't be doing all that fucking cheerleading routine bullshit. But I don't see any way in the world that Punk ever gets in the ring with the Buckaroos for any reason, working, shooting, or anything else because nobody would give a fuck. It would be ridiculous. Look at them and look at him. Nevertheless, hey, speaking of... Go ahead. Forget it. Forget it. What? What? I was going to say, part of the problem is we haven't heard CM Punk say shit. Everyone's, oh, CM Punk's side says this. CM Punk hasn't said anything. And I was going to say, why doesn't he just come out and say what's going on? But I realize he's still an employee. He's actually still confined to his contract, too. Yeah. And I, I don't believe they're making any inroads to a successful resolution when the guys that he's already beat up once are out there making fun of him on fucking television. Because he's got Tony's either going to have to pay him this money, or or he's going to have to bring him back and and let him work. Between the issues here with Tony and Punk, where purportedly there's a buyout, but we haven't heard anything anything about movement on that or anything in a long time now, and other stories about Tony maybe not necessarily having such a rosy time with other top talent, 
that maybe some people are turning into divas. Do you think it's going to change the way Tony deals with talent and top talent? Well, I think something should have changed that a long time ago. I think Tony should have stopped dealing with top talent. Because it, I know there's some nice people, like a Mick Foley. Mick Foley would sit down with Tony Khan for hours and try to talk to him and teach him and give him advice and pitch ideas and work with him because Mick is the nicest human being in the world. But most top talent is either going to do one of two things with Tony Khan. They're either going to manipulate him for their own self and best interests because they know they can, because he wants to be everybody's friend. He has no experience with this. And he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing and he can be easily led. Or the other section of top talent is going to go, okay, you're my boss and here, here's a handshake and boy, you're a nice guy, but don't talk to me about wrestling because that's, it's like you're a fucking grade schooler coming up and talking to a heart surgeon about a fucking bypass. They might try to pitch stuff to Tony, but it would be frustrating because they could see it was going over his head or whatever the fuck. So you've got the self-serving crew and you've got the, the group that, it's just like, my God, can we talk to a real booker or a real wrestling person? We don't mind working for the guy, and he's a nice enough guy, but he's not qualified or equipped to tell us what we ought to be doing. You can't tell me that 95% of the wrestlers on the AEW roster do not fall into one or the other of those categories. I'd like to hear what the third category is. Oh, everybody's happy to be there, and Going out and working their hardest, that's for all the guys in wrestling school. Because, yes, when optimally, you want everybody going out and working as hard as they can and being behind the promotion and excited about the momentum and all that stuff. But that's a perfect world. And this ain't a perfect world. And I can't imagine that anybody that is more than just somebody that's lucky to be being seen and paid would have any opinion otherwise than the, the two camps that I just mentioned. And, then, and I guess now that, as we said, the Ring of Honor pay-per-view is going on and people are, are writing in that now they're, they're maligning CM Punk at the merchandise stand. Is this why I saw this on Twitter as we took our last pee break? What's going on here? Do you have this stuff up? Uh, yeah, I see this guy here who has messaged both of us. Again, we don't know the, uh, the identity of this man or exactly how true any of this is, but we'll go into the assumption that he's sending it for a reason. Jim Cornette and Brian last. So I'm buying merch at Final Battle, and it seems that AEW is pushing their anti-CM Punk agenda on the merch buyers and security. A security guard who is regularly at shows and a lady at the merch table aggressively bash CM Punk. <laughs> Very unprofessional. And then he sent us a second one. The AEW security literally said to me, quote, if he comes back, this company will end. End oh. quote. This can't be the way Tony Khan wants his company represented. Again, very unprofessional and makes a ticket buyer like me uncomfortable. And uh, it appears there's one more. Tony Khan... I was told by the security guard that I can, quote, go see him somewhere else when he saw my CM Punk shirt. <sighs> this is how you're running your shows? So at least one fan, I mean, we can't say it's widespread or anything, but apparently multiple people working there bash CM Punk and... Oh, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Not only that, but the people selling the merchandise, they're still selling CM Punk merchandise, are they not? Since he's still technically under contract. As of, I believe, a couple dynamites ago, at least, because I saw a picture of the merch stand. Yeah. I believe so, yeah. So the P... And who's in charge of the merchandise business in AEW? Wasn't that one of the buckaroos, young wives, that got to be the head merchandise person? I believe it was the wife of one of the young bucks, correct. So it's funny that the merchandise people are slandering a guy on the roster still that they're selling merchandise of. Wonder where they would have... Sold more shirts than her husband did. Yeah. Since he's yeah. been there. I wonder uh, where they could have got those opinions from, those merchandise sellers, possibly from 
their uh, supervisors or authority figures. That's a great marketing tactic. Yeah, here we got plenty of shirts of this asshole that would end the company if he came back. You can go see him somewhere else, but buy one of these. I will say it is interesting, the quote here, allegedly from a security guard there. Again, we don't know who this guy is sending it to us, and we don't even know who he's talking about. But there has been a narrative among some there, the idea that that night CM Punk could have killed the company because of his behavior, or that CM Punk could still do a lot of damage to the company, therefore he's after our jobs. There is a little bit of that, and you could say that it's from people being fed that idea or from people just thinking it, but... You know, it is interesting that this quote came from the security guard, because you are hearing some of that, too. Or you have, at least, for the last few months. Jim, another question that a lot of listeners, especially in the last week, have been sending in questions about, because Dave Meltzer, I believe, said something on one of his shows and various things going around. There is now a growing consideration amongst fans that CM Punk may return to AEW at some point in the next several months. What do you think of this, and what do you think it would mean? Well, they need him. I think everybody's pretty much acknowledged that fact. Now, there is no the guy in that company. There's a guy wearing the belt, MJF, who is the only needle mover that they've had for ratings or, the you know, really the big matches besides Punk. There's, you know, there's other guys, but they're Nobody knows whether Moxley is a heel or a babyface or what his deal is. Brian Danielson has not been assertive enough with his talent to where he's viewed as the unapproached top guy in the company. Nobody gives a shit about the EVPs anymore because the bloom is off that rose. They've seen all they have to offer over and over again. Now the viewers tune out except for the bedrock faithful. So they need a star. And they're still paying him. See, that's what a lot of people, they have to still be paying him. Tony's, he's, he's under contract. So he's either getting paid or he's been fired. And he's injured. So I don't think he's been fired. And he's injured. So he ain't been, we'd we'd have heard about it anyway, if they'd have fired him. If they'd have come to some exit agreement, we would have heard about it. So he's still under contract. And that means he's still getting paid. And the injury that he had September, September, October, November, December, January, February, he's pretty good any time now. So they're either going to have to, through their lawyers, through their whatever their mitigation, mitigation, mediation process is, he's going to have to either get bought out, paid off, and released, or He's going to continue to get paid, in which case then, if he's healthy and getting paid, then is he going to come back to work? And that's the question they got to answer. And if if he does come back to work, there's got to, I would have to think for a guy like Punk, who is, as we mentioned, it's been phrased, doesn't take being disrespected very lightly. He, he he doesn't have to come back and wrestle Twinkle Toes or the Buckaroos, and he, he wasn't before. He's never been in the ring with them, and he probably wasn't ever going to be because he doesn't do that shit, and he wasn't there for that. But he has to coexist in the buildings with them, and I don't believe that he's going to come back or that he would come back and continue to do what he did for the company, which was... TV ratings and million dollar pay-per-view gates and etc. Unless Tony sits down with his EVPs and says, hey, you guys need to go mend some fences. There needs to be some kind of apology, settlement, agreement to move forward amongst you guys because we need this guy. I'm paying him. I've got to, you know, he's either going to come back to work and and do business for me, or I'm going to have to release him, and then he's going to be able to go and do even bigger business for my competitor. And you guys don't have the leverage right now to say that I should do something that's going to hurt my business. Yes, and, and Harpo's contract is almost up. The Buckaroos, they got one last year on the, the thing that Tony, uh, the clause that Tony exercised, but they're going to be out of there, or they're going to be renegotiating again. And what what do they have to renegotiate on? 
They've gotten okay. everything. They've gotten their family's jobs, their friends' jobs. They've gotten to do all their little jerk-off segments, exist in their own... They have their own Cody-verse. Exist in their own little Cody-verse. Their own belts. They've gotten everything they ever wanted from Tony. And it seems like it's not enough. But 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 now what do they have to negotiate on? They tank the ratings every time they're featured. Twinkle Toes was gone for an extended period of time and business didn't suffer, got better in certain instances. The Buckaroos, is anybody clamoring to see them? Now that we know that they're never going to have the rubber match with FTR and it'd be meaningless at this point if they did, who does who do they want to see the Bucks wrestle now? Anybody? It was always, oh, let's see Bucks FTR, Bucks FTR. What do they want to see now? They saw seven times in a row against Felix and Penthouse. Who else is there? So I think Tony needs to sit down his EVPs and say, Punk's healthy. I'm paying him a ton of money. He's the only one that has consistently produced big numbers for me and the ratings and the gates that he's drawn on top blow away the shit that you guys have done. And you started this fucking whole deal and put me in this position. So I think y'all ought to line up with your tail between your legs and go and say, I'm sorry, Mr. Brooks, for the problems that we've had in the past. We'll stay out of your way going forward. We'd ask if we could help you, but we know we're incapable of that and you wouldn't take it because it would be a hindrance. So we'll just stay out of your way and we apologize. Then maybe he gets punk back. What else is there? Who else is he going to sign right now that's going to do what for the numbers what Punk did? It's going to do for the quality of the in-ring what Punk did. There's nobody else out there now that he can get because Vince has already snapped him up because he wants to sell his white elephant. In terms of Punk, if he did come back, there's a natural thing there to be done with him and MJF. Yes. But looking beyond that, and that may be the initial thing they just go right back to, and I'm sure they can get months and months of great TV if those guys are on the same page. But beyond that, if you're CM Punk, and things, there are apologies, you don't have to be friends with anyone, but there are apologies, and the mission, whatever Cody Rhodes was talking about before, the mission is still the mission, which is, this is Tony's company, let's try to make this as good as we can. Will you work with an Adam Page? Would you work with a Young Bucks if they were willing to do it? Well, I think Adam Page is irrelevant to this conversation. Yeah, and, pro- and, more, and more than likely he is, but I'm just saying in terms of what well, you're yes. bringing back, would you? That's, that's why Page is irrelevant. The biggest money thing they could put together, the shortest term big money thing that would be attractive right away and wouldn't need to be built, especially to the base AEW audience, is Punk and FTR against the Buckaroos and and Harpo in a six-man. Because, again, the Jerry Jarrett principle, people know there's legitimate heat. There's been a real fight. They don't like each other for a shoot. That is what draws money in wrestling. However, the problem becomes that in any other circumstance like that, when other guys have gotten in fights, and done whatever down through the history of wrestling into territories and nationally or whatever, and people have known about it, they've turned it into a way to do something in the ring and sell tickets to it, and people have responded to it. But I don't know that you can do that here because, I mean, let's just face it, being legitimately real, my real opinion is Matt and Nick Jackson and Kenny Omega don't have any clue of what the wrestling business is and didn't and wouldn't have gotten in it if they'd known what it was to begin with and they've been trying to change it into something that they want it to be because it's their specialty they do that shit so they want that to be wrestling even though most people don't want that shit to be wrestling and that unprofessionalism and stuck upness and self-indulgence that they think their fucking farts don't smell they don't even th- they think they even smell better than mine after a colonoscopy. 
I don't think that they realize that they're now in a position where they could be professional and do business with a guy and draw real money for the first time. They've they've brought their band of merry misfit fans with them and they like they do everywhere they go, but it's not real money. It's not sizable amount. It's not over a million people. We've seen that. To get a bunch more people interested in them that are not interested in their playtime matches into something that people might think there might be something go on here. The problem is they would probably not appreciate being in that position. And I don't think punk could trust them to not take advantage of it. They run in his locker room and he takes one down, beats one up and his buddy takes care of the other two. That was a real fight breaking out organically. But if I'm punk and I'm working with these guys, I got to lay there for fucking Harpo to come off the top rope. Or I've got to stand there while the two little goof tennis shoe collectors throw super kicks at my face. Or you work a different kind of match. With a margin of error of a quarter of an inch and they can say afterwards, oh shit, we're sorry. Fuck you. I don't... They need to build trust with punk. He doesn't need to build trust with them. So if they want to be in the money picture, if they want to be in a big match that actually might help the company, they would have to do a lot of salabimin and a lot of fucking tuck and tail with Punk to get him to trust them. And then they would have to follow through with not fucking potatoing him or elsewise and say what you want about his UFC career. But does anybody think that Phil Brooks or CM Punk can't take either one of the Bucks down and beat the fuck out of him. Come on. Seriously. I think even they, especially after everything that happened in that locker room, and if you know what really happened, they didn't have a chance, and Omega didn't have a chance. I think even they would have to admit that. <laughs> I think Omega just wandered in confused like he is normally of what was going on around him and didn't realize until shit started happening. He was in a stu- his usual stupor, you mean. Yes, yeah. the stupor. But but anyway, so the, you know, I don't know whether they could put it together because why would Punk trust them? Because they think that they're bulletproof. They think they're special. They think they're EVPs. They think they could potato somebody, and it's oh, I'm sorry. Except they would get the fuck beat of, out of them on live television, especially if FTR was in there, because then all three of them couldn't do anything. So, you know, it would draw money, and if it was all a bunch of professional wrestlers, it would be happening probably already or close to. But since one half of that equation is a bunch of children who got into business that they didn't understand to do play acting and be video game characters. They're probably scared that they would legitimately get their ass beat again, and they're indignant that Tony would want them to apologize to this guy. So there's probably going to be no movement because they're children and he doesn't have to work with them. Let me ask you this. Because we've said that I genuinely felt bad for Tony Khan when everything happened. I don't agree with the way he's handled things since it happened. And I think a lot of blame truthfully needs to be put on Tony Khan for things getting to that point because he's the one person who could have put his foot down and stopped it. And he did. He, he was hearing about it a long time before all of us heard about it and he didn't do anything about it. So that's when it was made public again, based on everything I know, I'm going to assume there's been very limited contact between Tony Khan, who was regularly talking to CM Punk as top star. It's been probably very little contact in the time since then. If you're CM Punk, based on everything that's happened, are you going to have any trust issues with Tony Khan if you did go back? Uh, yeah. Again, he knew you know- there's no way Tony Khan didn't know exactly how Punk felt about these guys. And you know what? I actually think there's no way Tony Khan more than likely didn't agree with CM Punk on this stuff because he knows and he's been hearing yeah. it from other people and he's seen other things that happen. He, he just, let it all he happen. just couldn't go and be the boss to his friends. That's is right. what he couldn't do. So he has, uh, can he trust Tony Khan? Here's the thing. I don't think anybody is going to accuse Tony of being a, a crook or a manipulative, you know, like a Paul Heyman-like figure all. that's manipulating everyone behind the scenes for his own selfish purposes. He's not that person. He's not that smart. He, and that's why he's where he's at, because he came into wrestling 
thinking all these guys were going to be his friends because he's giving them jobs and everybody's going to be happy with each other because everybody enjoys each other in the wrestling business. And he finds out that it's egos and it's fucking backstabbing and it's goddamn jealousy. And it's what about me instead of this other guy? And he can't stay friends with everybody. And he comes to the point where he has to tell some people, if not most people, what to do. Those are the things he can't handle. So I think everybody can trust Tony not to be a a con man and a shyster and a crook and, you That's know, manipulating meant, people. But the reason why you can't trust Tony is because he's too nice and too trustworthy. He won't hurt anybody's feelings. He won't fucking talk badly to a friend, even if it's business. You can't trust him to do anything because he's scared to either make these guys mad or they won't like him anymore, or he just doesn't, he's not a person that likes confrontation. I know this may come as a surprise, but you have to kind of like a little bit of confrontation to be in the wrestling business. Or at least be able to manage it. Yes. And and that's why you can't really trust Tony, not because he's evil or has anybody's worst interest at heart or trying to take advantage of somebody. It's because he's in over his head and cannot manage all of this. And so you can't trust him to do the right thing because he may just chicken out and just say, well, have one of the lawyers talk to whoever. I I don't want to talk to him because it it won't be fun. See, I think that's the real story. There's going to be no punk coming back to AEW unless punk and Tony Khan are on the same page. And we don't know what's the status of that relationship right now, but everyone in AEW, it's based around Tony Khan. And this is the biggest star AEW has ever had. It's all going to be about that relationship. And if that relationship is okay right now, and again, I don't know, I don't know what the status is. But you brought up another thing. We also don't know how much longer the Bucks and Omega will be there. So if you're Tony Khan and you're looking at your future, you got to look at who you think will be there in the future. The guy under contract or the guys who aren't under contract. Well, and and even if there wasn't a track record of uh, one guy outdoing the other guys when it comes to drawing and business, yeah, because if he just signed Punk, what was it? I don't I don't know if they ever determined the length of Punk's contract, but he hasn't been back more than a little over a year now, right? So he's still got some time to go, and he certainly has not worn out his welcome to the point where the other three have. But that's, you know, unfortunately, that's what we're going to find out. If, if Tony Khan has the nerve and the balls to do what's right, Tell those other three, hey, you fucked me royally, and you've started this whole goddamn thing, and it's your fucking fault that it all came out in public, so you go to that guy and make him feel welcome, regardless of whatever you have to do. Kenny, fucking treat him like a bushy. Make him welcome. I got Punk would probably down, turn down the bushy treatment from Kenny, but nevertheless... <laughs> And if they wouldn't do it, then say, okay, well, then in that case, then I'm just going to send you guys home and pay you out for the rest of the year. Here's the thing. Where are they going to fucking go? Kenny will go back to Japan. Jackson's will go back to fucking Cucamonga. Because if the WWE knows and is fully aware that Tony don't want him anymore, they wouldn't try to hire him. They only tried to hire him before to keep the billionaire's son from having access to them when he was starting a wrestling promotion the content and quality of which they had no idea of at that point now that they've seen it and they've seen what's going on and these guys have stellar records at running tv viewers away and people rolling their eyes at their indulgent trampoline routines you think the wwe is going to offer them anywhere near the amount of money they're making now when if they were to know that aew wasn't even going to try what the fuck why would they do that here, here's something that the other guys that can compete with our budget don't want and nobody else can afford to come anywhere close to, so we're going to give them a big contract? Fuck. And it's a tryout thing in a sense. I don't mean like it's a tryout like a guy at a taping, but we've also never, ever seen if the Young Bucks can work under the confines of someone else's rules. No, they can't. They can't, they, and they will refuse to. That's their whole thing, killing the business. That's the name of their company that they started. That's the name of their book. 
they can't do it the way anybody else tells them to do it or the way everybody else does it. They have to do their own shit. That's the only way they get over. And the only time that they were allowed to do their own shit, it leads to the fucking downfall of the rest of the company because it makes it impossible for anybody to take the rest of the programming from that company seriously when you got these two little jokers running around. So so that that that's the point I'm trying to make is the only reason they got offers before is because they the WWE didn't want the billionaire's son to have access to anything. If they were to be on the outs with Tony, they would be worthless in the wrestling business except to go to Japan. Kenny'd be back on top over there, and the Bucks would be back jerking the curtain with the junior heavyweight tag belts. And that's where else they're going to go. All right, speaking of scary, there's some scary things being said. Apparently, while I was taking a, a sabbatical of a couple of days from the outside world, Uncle Dave, the house organ for AEW, or would he be the house mouth organ? Maybe for AEW, uh, has lit up our friend Punk again, as well as some of the things that they have done or actions they have taken on television this past Wednesday night. And Punk had a response, which we don't hear from him often. It's only when it seems like that there might be some movement that he might be returning that then somehow Uncle Dave comes up with a thing like, well, we think that Punk's trying to get back in like he's there knocking on the door. Tony, let me back in, please. And then statements get made that Punk has to come out and inflame everybody's taint with by telling the truth. And then that seems like that would, to the outside viewer looking in, would knock back the return time of said punk to wrestling, which seems like that's what the power drunk EVPs in that fucking flea market company want to see happen. So uh, uh, try to, uh, can, do you have the, the chronology of events here from who ran whose dick liquor first that Punk had to respond to? Well, let's first talk about the bigger issue, which is Punk's ready to come back based on what we know about his injuries, right, from way back. Tony Khan right. definitely wants CM Punk back. But I think one of the big issues with all this is Tony Khan just, he never makes a situation better. Whenever he has a chance, Tony Khan never makes the situation better. But what happened, apparently, it started a few days ago. CM Punk wrote a comment on Instagram about the new Steve Kern biography. Steve Kern, from the Fabulous Ones, or uh, Skinner, put out a biography. Oh, come on now, it wasn't his fault. Well, he was on national TV, though, so people know it. Yeah. He wrote a biography with Ian Douglas, who's written several good wrestling books. Punk wrote one of the forwards to the book. In the comments on Instagram, he wrote, Best book about a fascinating man in a strange business since Brett wrote his book. Great story about Gator and Coco fighting in the locker room, and then Lawler drags them into the office the next day, and they squash it. Fascinating. And that was the comment. So why don't we start there, just because you were probably there when Coco and uh, Steve Curran had their issue, I would guess. Well, I, I didn't witness it. I think I was on the buttermilk run at that. I was in the other town in front of no people. But what happened was um, the fabulous ones, Lane and Kern, were Jerry Jarrett's handmade gimmick to replicate the success of the fabulous Fargo brothers as a team, but as baby faces. And he, in those days, Everybody, as we mentioned, didn't have music. And everybody didn't just go out and have the entrance they wanted to have. You go to the fucking ring, right? Well, he told the fabs, go out, go around the ring, hug the girls. The girls loved them. You've seen the rock and roll do the same thing. Seen the Fantastics do the same thing. That was the gimmick of that rock and roll MTV style tag team. Go around the ring, hug the fans, hug the kids, hug the girls. Well, then they switch Coco Ware 
Uh, I can't remember whether he'd been a heel or, but he, that's when he became either Stagger Lee. I th- it was Stagger Lee because then he got music. And he just decided one night in Memphis or whatever, he was going to go around the ring and do the Fabs deal where he shook hands and hugged all the people and blah, blah, blah. And then Kern walked in the locker room at a spot show a night or two later when he saw him and took exception to Coco doing the fucking Fabs thing. And they got in a fight about it. But then, you know, the next day or whenever it was, that nobody got called in the office because he would have had to go to Jerry Jarrett's house. That's where the office was. But they got called in the fucking room at the next building. And his lawler is, hey, are we going to be fucking doing this? We want both of you here, but are we going to be doing this? We're going to make money. Okay, sorry. Boom, done. If you took a, uh, if, if you took a pin and you marked off from every wrestling card held in the world, if through recorded history, every name of every person that had ever either had a physical fight with, threatened a physical fight with, or fucking wanted to goddamn have a physical fight with and loudly proclaimed that, another motherfucker in the wrestling business, you'd have never had a fucking show. So that, you know, that was nothing unusual, but go ahead. Well, that was it with CM Punk's quote. Yeah, inflammatory words there. More appropriately, his post on Instagram. What followed that, apparently, is Dave Meltzer went on his website's radio show. People pay for subscriptions and they get access to various things, including different radio shows. So they got a paywall over there. They got a paywall. People pay them for a number of things, including the ability to go on a message board and say all sorts of things. We'll we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But he apparently went on a show and referenced this comment about the Steve Kern book, which again, he wrote the, CM Punk wrote the forward for, and said this is a sign that CM Punk wants to come back, that he really wants to come back, and in order to do so, he needs to apologize to the whole locker room. What? Yes. Oh, boy. Well, and Dave knows that Tony's talking to Punk. So when he says Punk wants to come back, Dave knows that Tony is talking to Punk. And this is the way it is. But but again, it's not like, oh, Mr. Khan, please bring me. But don't you think, honestly, since Punk is sitting at home getting a check for multiple tens of thousands of dollars every week. I don't I don't know how to do that kind of math. um, With a calculator. Well, but you know what I'm saying. I don't know how much giant fucking money he's getting every week to sit at home and be no benefit to the company whatsoever by their choice. And so it's like he's he he's not begging for his check back. He's not begging for his money. He's not begging. The, the injury, which is the recovery time, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, we're pretty good. And if anybody thinks that, well, it's been reported that they have talked. It's been fightful. And the folks at Inside the Ropes have said that they've had several conversations between Tony Khan and CM Punk. So one would think that there was something that was going to move out of that, that all of a sudden another detrimental story comes up. Because the one thing that the EVPs and their little buckaroos no, is that if they tell Uncle Dave something, he will believe them wholeheartedly because he's a sap, and he will repeat it. It's not just it. the EVPs. Well, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And he will repeat it, and then it will inflame CM Punk and poke the bear because he's not a person who likes to be disrespected or have all of this shit said about him in public when he doesn't do the same thing. And that's how this all started. And- the, uh, that's, and that's the c- continuing, that's what started it, that's what's continued this whole thing. Every time it looks like that maybe they're on the verge, Tony and Punk might be on the verge of doing some business, then the fucking little ragtag lollipop guild that runs his television has to do something on TV, like they did Wednesday night, by the way, when they had a shot of the production truck in the parking lot, they lean tables and cardboard up over Punk's face on the side of the truck for the camera shot. 
only person, just conveniently. Or a story like that comes out that it now makes Punk's response, which we'll get to in a second, makes more sense of some inexplicable shit that they did on TV quite a while back. But he has to come out and defend himself because he's not the one slandering these other fuckers in public. He's apparently being professional and not talking to people about this, whereas they're feeding everything they can feed to the fucking guys that are willingly lapping it up and then spitting it back out. And it pisses him off, and he fucking fires back, and then they can say, oh, well, Tony, look, he's goddamn, he's, he's still mad. There's a, a bunch of fucking idiots around here. And he's the Tony only Khan, one we don't hear from. You know, can I say something? Because this is something I want to make sure is said. Yeah. Because I've reported about a lot of this stuff, and someone show me where I've been wrong. I've got good sources, and I know how to gather information. I've never spoken to CM Punk. I've never heard from CM Punk. I've never heard from anyone that I know of that's in CM Punk's, whatever you want to call it, camp, or wrestlers that are really close with him. Everything I've said has been from the point of view of someone who's actually just tried to figure out the story. Observation. So the other day you brought up his comment, we'll talk about it in a minute, but when I tweeted out that it was nice to see him finally fight back, that's really what I meant, because I've seen all sorts of shit, whether it's in The Observer or just coming right out of Dave Meltzer's mouth or in various other places, that I know is a spin that is wrong based on everything I know from what's been going on and what's happened. And that's through never hearing about anything from the punk camp. I hope he talks out more. I hope he either confirms or says we're wrong about things. You say he, you know, lashed out and then people said, oh, he's mad again. This is the first time we've heard anything from him about this, really. He made a joke at that combat show he did commentary on, but we never hear from punk. We never do. And the stories that we constantly see out there or sometimes in a lot of cases, half the story. And I'm not even talking about punk, but it'll be like, oh, this person did this, and they have this issue with punk, and then the story ends, not, and then punk was gone, and this person had issues with someone else. That part is never really part of it, but there are certain wrestlers that get some protection from over there in The Observer. But I just wanted to point that out. I never hear from CM Punk about any of the things I report, and people accuse me of being someone getting stuff from punk just because what I report says that punk isn't the devil of professional wrestling. Well, and then again, there's a lot that you can di not divulge, but a lot that you can glean from just looking at what the fuck's going on and that this should have already been settled long ago. They need talent over there bad as this past Wednesday night's TV program showed, but nevertheless, so punk commented on Kern's biography Dave starts going on about, well, if he wants to come back, he wants to come back, but he's going to have to apologize to everybody. For what? For having his space invaded and being bum-rushed by a bunch of fucking EVPs, employees of the company, but nevertheless... Yeah, where's the apology Dave's, from the good Christian boys? Well, you know, they, they forgive and forget over there. Yeah. And, and all that stuff. Some people pretend they're religious, but when you really look at their fucking lives and the way they behave and the way they do things, it has nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus Christ at all. All right, but nevertheless, so now <laughs> that the story is out that, oh, he's going to have to apologize and he wants to come back, but they, they covered his face up on TV. What happened next, oh, great Brian Last? That's where Mr. Punk had to make a few things clear. Well, no, that's not what happened no, next. No, that's not what net. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed a step. Again, going back to Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez's message board, a message board that people pay a membership to have access to, and then they can anonymously put whatever they want up there, and uh, typically these things are left up. It's very interesting. But Dave went on there in a thread about all this punk stuff and his face being covered up on Dynamite, and said, Do you know why they didn't advertise Punk versus Moxley longer? and why it had a short build? Because Punk agreed to it, then AEW got a legal letter saying he wasn't down with it, and wasn't doing it, and they didn't know if he'd come until Tony put his foot down. <laughs> there are a lot of nice things I can say about him, and you can 
absolutely argue his position on Moxley was correct, but you can't argue he willingly did what he was asked in that scenario. Okay. So that specifically, and I don't think you knew that or saw that, but that specific. No, I, I don't read. I don't read Dave's tricklings anymore. But again, that was the the TV episode, like a week or two before the pay per view, where it was going to be Moxley and Punk, but then suddenly we got Moxley and Punk, and Moxley beat the shit out of him in like three minutes. And then a week or two later, they have the pay-per-view match, and that's where Punk won, but in the process, hurt himself. So, And we couldn't figure out at the time, what in the flying fuck is Tony thinking? Or why would you do this? What's going on? Apparently, now we have more insight in it from what Punk says Moxley's reaction was and how this whole thing came up. But let's just remind everyone what Dave Meltzer is saying is that the reason the match didn't happen was because Punk agreed to it and then had his lawyer send in a letter and refused to do it until Tony put his foot down and made him do it. CM Punk responded on Instagram briefly in a post that was taken down. Sigh. <laughs> Sigh. I wasn't cleared to come back to wrestle yet. Then, plan was to wrestle at the pay-per-view. I sat and listened to Moxley's Rocky Three idea. I explained how I'd never seen a Rocky movie <laughs> and thought the idea sucked, but if the boss wanted to do it, whatever. He said he wouldn't lose to me. I'd never experienced someone refusing to lose to me. I just laughed. I asked Tony if this is what he wanted. He said yes. He's the boss, so I said okay, but I need to be cleared first. They kept saying it could just be a squash, so I didn't need to be cleared. <laughs> wait, wait, you don't need to be medically cleared for a squash, Matt. If you're the one taking the fucking bumps, you probably do. They kept saying it could just be a squash, so I didn't need to be cleared. I scoffed at that. My health is more important. Dave Meltzer is a liar. Jericho is a liar and a stooge. Boy, now I'll tell you, right there, when you're a liar, that's one thing. But if you're a liar and a stooge, well, you're just in a sad fucking state. There were plans, but plans always change. But I'll never put a company above my health ever again. So again, we never hear anything from CM Punk. There's CM Punk finally defending himself for once. Explain to me what the fuck about what they did had anything to do with Rocky Three. In Rocky, th I think this is what it would be. Now, I've seen Rocky Three. It's been a while, but explain to me how there was similarities there. I can't say about similarities, but in Rocky Three, Rocky gets destroyed in a squash match against Clubber Lang, Mr. T. Then he has to go train with Apollo Creed and learn a new way to fight. And then he comes back and ultimately gets a victory, destroying his opponent, Clubber Lang. Okay, well, yes. But first of all, remember we talked about how what a rotten position that Tony had put himself and his company and Punk in because he didn't have a strong heel for Punk to come back and defeat to not only as the interim champion to defeat and reunify the titles and blah, blah, blah. Moxley was allegedly a baby face at that point too. Besides the fact that did Clubber Lang, did they already have a match between Clubber and Rocky booked and, and were selling tickets to it when 10 days ahead of time, they said, wait a minute, let's do this fucking fight in front of people at a press conference and have a sanctioned fight and then Clubber will win that one and then 10 days later and remember Rocky Moxley come back and, and remember Moxley was the interim champion wasn't he? Yes wasn't it a match to unify the two belts? Yes so it again it wasn't like oh they we're having this and wasn't the original Rocky and Clubber fight was that some kind of charitable situation they were doing or no, something? No. I'm, I'm conflating that with Thunderlips. That with Thunderlips was a charitable uh, exhibition. Yeah, but regardless, if, if, if the problem is Moxley thinks he's fucking Clubber. The problem is Moxley thinks he's a fucking wrestler. 
But now we know that it wasn't Tony Khan being just weird and a bad booker and crazy. It was Moxley basically saying, well, I, I got to fucking beat him first or else I'm not going to put him over. And so they shoehorned that deal in <laughs> because Moxley had to have it. Remember I said, look, when he came out on the pay-per-view, I said, it looks like he's got job face on. And he had job face even though he just fucking beat the guy two weeks beforehand. And this is the kind of shit that Tony thinks is not only good ideas, but then allows this stuff to be used to slander the biggest star that he's got who's not been on his television in seven months. And then Punk has to set the record straight again because he's being slandered in the press with the whisper campaign and the little things that they do to prick him on television. And it sets back Tony's talks because Tony has no balls as we've come to find out and will not put his foot down, will not make any decisions about anything. And he allows this shit to go on. Yeah. Tony is the problem. Tony's the one person there who can actually squash everything. Tony's the one person there who could have, prevented all this from happening. And that's one of the reasons why they're going to, I'm positive they'll find a way to settle with Punk one way or the other, because the last thing they want is people talking about Tony's behavior throughout this thing. Well, the last thing that they, the, the, the last first thing, thing they want, the first thing they ought to want is a name back on the television program. The last thing that they ought to want is anybody talking about how anybody in that company is conducting themselves in any positions of, responsibility being revealed to the public, both just in terms of how stupid it makes everybody look and potential liabilities for things. <laughs> but that's uh, again, you know what, even though Tony is, is the boss. And I say this in name only, even though he's the boss, he owns everything. He pays everybody. He doesn't have to go through a corporate infrastructure. He doesn't have to go through all of the various shit that, publicly traded companies do or the Sinclair when they bought Ring of Honor. You remember I told you a story about Adam Pierce and the merchandise weasel. And it was the same it's the wrestling business. It's the same thing as the Steve Kern Coco Ware story, except it ended differently because in today's time we have either lawyers or human resources or corporate fucking structures in place in the wrestling business. But when Sinclair bought Ring of Honor, the first announced team was set to be Adam Pierce and Kevin Kelly. Dear old Adam from the WWE beleaguered manager role now. And I was told that there was problems. I knew that there had been problems between Adam and the previous Ring of Honor office, and basically the guy that was still there was Ross Abrams, the merchandise weasel, the guy that went to the shows and sold the goddamn rags, paper, and pens, as Sputnik would say, and filled fucking envelopes for mail orders at the office in Bristol. The kind of guy you find on one of these message boards. The kind of guy you find on one of these message boards, and with a fucking tube of Clearasil in one hand and a goddamn fucking keyboard in the other one. So Delirious and I went to Ross. And we brought him over in the corner very respectfully. We said, we want to let you know. I know you've had some problems in the past with Adam Pierce. Well, he's coming in. He's going to be the new color guy. And I've talked to Adam. And he's willing to shake your hand and apologize for the previous interaction between you guys. I'll tell you what it was. I haven't said that. They fucking argued. And Adam Pierce yelled at Ross and said, the next time I see you, I'm going to beat the fuck out of you. Because I think it was over the phone, right? That's it. He just said, fuck you. You're a no good piece of shit. I'm going to beat the fuck out of you. That's, com the that's commonplace in the text messages of AEW personnel. Well, I'm talking about it's the wrestling business, right? Even if they had said fucking beat the fuck out of each other, well, Adam would have beat the fuck out of him. But you know what I'm saying? Dude, Ross Abrams wasn't kicking anyone's ass ever. Well, I know. I ever. Anyway. <laughs> But we went to him, we said, Adam said he'll either shake his hand, shake your hand and apologize to you and y'all can work together, or he'll be glad to ignore you if you don't feel comfortable with that, whichever, because your, your merchandise, he's going to be TV. You'll be in the same building, but you don't have to interact. So we wanted to give you a courtesy heads up here. This is what's going on. 
and decide what response you would like from Adam and, and we'll go from there, but nothing bad's going to happen and nobody's going to beat you up. Okay. As far as I was concerned, done, right? So then I get the fucking phone call from gutless Gary Jester, who whenever a situation was bad, he could be counted on to make it worse by going to Starbucks and hiding and then saying, oh, well, it'll be okay. <laughs> and he said, well, Ross Abrams went over Joe Coff's head and called human relations at Sinclair Broadcasting. Human resources. You, whatever the fuck. He's never had any human relations, Ross Abrams. And... I said, what the fuck? Easy, I complained about Adam Pierce. I said, well, fine, fuck him then. We can get anybody to goddamn sell the merchandise. It's not that, oh, no, no. I said, what, what? No, they're not going to fire him. I said, why wouldn't you fucking fire He not only, we told him what was going to happen and that we would take care of him. Nothing's going to, bad's going to happen to him, but we were, gave him a courtesy talk. He's now gone over Joe Coff's head and called Sinclair when he's only worked for this company for fucking four weeks or whatever. And we're not going to fire his fucking little Weasley ass? Oh, goddamn, I'll goddamn make him fucking hang himself in his closet by the time I get finished telling him what I think of him and everybody in his fucking family and everybody he's ever known, this motherfucker. Now he's goddamn fucking up my TV show. I was going to go through the goddamn phone line. And he said, no, no, he'll call human relations on you. And it will all be in trouble. I said, we are going to let this fucking dickless pussy hold us goddamn hostage and determine the color commentator of the television program because of human relations at Sinclair. And everybody was so scared. They've just bought the company. It'll be a big problem. They'll think they're going to get sued. So this fucking pimply faced piece of shit with a dick the size of a fucking half of Vienna sausage leached two years of salary off of him before they finally fired him for cause because he was stealing from the company, taking merchandise from the warehouse and selling it mail order, using his own goddamn home address as the return address on the stolen merchandise. But nevertheless, he did that twice, blocked Adam Pierce, because it's not the wrestling business anymore. It's a bunch of fucking sensitive, soft little pussies that want to whine and cry and complain to human resources or get their lawyer involved or whatever the fuck. And this is the, it's, it, it's, I guarantee you that the buckaroos, when they were around Ring of Honor the first time, he was gone by the second time, were probably one of Ross's favorites because they're similar people, whiny little gutless pussies, won't stand up for themselves face to face. Anyway, it's just, you know, again, it all comes back to Tony Khan. Tony Khan made all of this worse every chance he got. And that wasn't his intention, but it says more about Tony Khan and his management skills and his interpersonal skills and his decision making ability. And it's ridiculous. And we hear so many things since the very beginning, since before the beginning, about Tony. Good and bad. His love of wrestling and how he really wants to do this. And then you see the finished product. And then you see his behavior. And then you just hear story after story after story. You could ask everyone in the world to sign an NDA. It's not going to prevent stories of wackiness from getting out. And, you know, you said it way back about the all-out scrum, which, did, again, that didn't even start it. It seems like there were guys who had a grudge against Punk from day one. Again, go watch that Bobby Fish match. Yeah. And then the Colt Cabana shit. A guy who is, even if you're his biggest fan, come on, completely useless in 2023 on major wrestling television. Meaningless. All of a sudden, that stuff started. This stuff is happening with Moxley. Before anyone thinks John Moxley's some, you know, just some innocent, nice guy who got swept up in this mean Phil Brooks stuff. Has Moxley ever pulled this kind of shit before or since? Where all of a sudden he wants to do things his way and he's refusing to lose? That's a question that needs to be asked. But I guess only Tony Khan can answer that. And we know Tony's very selective in what he says. But Punk had to deal with all this stuff. You said it about All Out. He's sitting there saying these things. You don't think he's been saying these things to Tony Khan? 
You don't think Tony's heard them? Tony didn't have the, oh my God, where'd this come from face. He had the, oh shit, I've heard this before face. I don't think anyone goes out there and says that stuff if he doesn't think his boss agrees with him. That's different than he's heard it before. So, Does Tony agree with whoever he's in the room with because he's scared not to? Who knows? Tony's the issue here. Tony's management or lack of management is the issue here. And he's made all this worse. And now it's ridiculous. Because now, if Punk comes back, who's he going to work with? I have to admit, they've kind of gone up and down in terms of people wanting to see him against the elite. I think we've seen so much of the we've seen so much of the elite here lately. Does anybody want to see any more of them to begin with? I was cheering when they carried the buckaroos out in the meat wagon at the opening of the program. I'm like, yes, we can avoid that. And then they gave us everything else that we wouldn't want to see. If you're a wrestler who keeps to himself and just wants to do his thing and have every segment be good, which is everything we've heard about CM Punk, do you want to return to the drama factory? Because that's what it is. It's Tony Khan's drama factory. And there are certain people, certain cliques, they happen to be from Cucamonga, but it's, a, it's an extended clique who have caused drama time after time after time. And I understand because a lot of people are silent about it. A lot of people are afraid to talk about these things. It's natural. People are working there. They don't want to getting out, oh, this person said this about this person. But to a man, if you talk to people there about who causes the problems, has Phil Brooks made employees there cry? Or have the elite ever made employees there cry from their behavior? I'll ask that question. And for those of you who think I just ask these things out of the blue, I usually ask questions I know the answer to. So everyone wants to point to Punk. He doesn't defend himself. He's a whatever you want to say, a singular man out there in a political world of wrestling where you have to be friends with everyone and go along with everything. If you know the other participants or if you know enough from everyone around the other participants like Tony Khan and the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega, and there's a lot more we could say about that, and even Moxley, then it becomes a little ridiculous, the whole idea that it's just bad guy Phil Brooks. I'm not saying I agree with everything he did. I'm not saying I would have done things the same way. I'm not saying I wouldn't have gone even further, quite frankly, than him. If those guys all bum rush my fucking room. But the idea that because people like these other guys, they're willing to ignore the facts of any of this is ridiculous. And a lot of stuff hasn't been out there publicly, and it's a shame. I put on Twitter the other day some of the AEW employee playbook which specifically I saw, I saw that, by the way. Did they rip that off from football? Because they keep saying team in a lot of it. Well, again, it's, it's Mega. She's the attorney for this. She's the attorney for that. She's, she's, she's an attorney without term, terminology. Tony, I, would, I wouldn't understand Tony Khan as well as I do if I didn't go through Jeff Wilpon running the Mets because his father <laughs> let him run the Mets for years. I'm, I'm not even joking. I'm not saying that as a joke. No, it, I remember that. And there was a member of the Wilpon family that a couple guys in the business, what, about 10 or 12 years ago, were stupid enough to think was going to start this big promotion and give them, give them all insurance and benefits and everything. And that went far. He has to apologize to the locker room. I'm sorry that so many of you don't understand what kind of business you're in and you think you're still at the romper room. Can I ask you a question? A very serious question. Yes. If you're Dave Meltzer... And let's just say that Dave recognizes, and I'm not sure he does, but let's just say for this example, Dave recognizes that he's being a little used by certain people. And while that may have always been the case, and everyone uses everyone when it comes to wrestling journalism, now it's affecting things like this. Do you reassess the way you're conducting yourself and doing things? Because at this point, Almost all of this punk, elite, AEW drama, the two sources at the very front aren't even the elite and punk. It's Tony Khan for letting all this happen and Dave Meltzer for constantly fanning the flames, even if he doesn't mean to. Well, because he's Tokyo Rose. He's the propagandist because he, th he has decided which side of a 
completely diametrically opposed conflict between two sides. He's decided which side he's on because that's the side that's nice to him and the side that puts him over and the side that makes him feel good. And also, that's, to be honest, the side that most of his readers are on because of the contraction of the wrestling business and the shrinking of it and the you know, the fucking fan base that's left, they like a lot of the shit that he likes, and he's pleasing his readers and speaking to them, and they have a crossover with his readers who have, obviously, cartoon minds and a lot of time on their hands now, and the fucking cartoon wrestlers. And so it's it's very synergistic amongst that. So he's the supposedly independent journalist that's actually a house organ uh, unwillingly and 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 people are saying oh dave's on the payroll no he's not he's doing this because he genuinely thinks these motherfuckers are his friends just like tony is paying all these fucking guys huge sums of money because he thinks they're his friends and dave is doing this to protect his friends and his fucking business his readership by keeping the only ones that's stupid enough yet to believe his goddamn seven-star drivel about Twinkle Toes and the whole rest of this thing, it, he's he's exposed himself. It's so over the top. If you heard that, oh, the goddamn buckaroos drove over an old lady and three fucking orphans outside an orphanage in the street, well, they were crossing against the light, according to Meltzer. All of a sudden, he doesn't critique matches over there. He'll say the things he likes, I read the House Show report about the Britt Baker Anna J match. Not one word of this was an epic disaster that people were laughing at. Not one word of this clip went viral because these people were terrible in the ring. He hasn't criticized any bad Jericho segments ever. There are certain people that get protected. Jericho, over there. Jericho gets upset when he's called names. Yeah. Now we know that. And by the way, if Punk goes back, that's going to be the first guy that's going to try to work with Punk. Calling that one right now, Jericho. Well, yeah, because he wants to be in the main event of the fucking match is going to draw some money. Listen, man, everyone knows I called you a cancer. Why don't we play on this? We can get Susan G. Coleman involved. Can't, no, Punk won't go for that. He thinks they're phony, too, I bet you. But the problem is, you know, and I've been reading The Observer a long time, and Dave talks a lot about Frank DeFord. There's a different sports journalist I'm starting to think of with The Observer. At the very end, Dick Young, who was a writer <laughs> here in New York, started getting fed stuff by M. Donald Grant the chairman of the board of the Mets, they ran Tom Seaver out of New York. The franchise of the Mets, they ran him out of New York. Started planting things in the press about his wife being jealous of Nolan Ryan's wife and the money they're getting. All these stories, they ran the best player in team history out of New York. Dave's becoming like Dick Young at the end. And anyone who knows baseball in New York knows what I'm talking about. That's and now what remember, becoming. folks... He, it's not that Brian last called Dave Meltzer a young dick. It's that he called him Dick Young. Dick Young at the end. At the end of his dick. And I guess that makes Jericho M. Donald Grant. I don't know. Jim, let's focus on some of the other things going on in and around the world of professional wrestling. I have audio here that a lot of listeners have sent in. A lot of people have wanted to get your take on. The first batch of audio, Dave Meltzer. No, <laughs> Apparently now, went now, on. Now, now, wait, now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Hold on here. We're going to play Dave Meltzer's audio from one of his programs. Can we get sued for this? Well, no, we're reviewing it. It's fair use. We're actually going to talk about what's said, and we're going to talk about our thoughts on what's being said. So we are in no, the No, no, no. I'm not talking about Dave suing us. I'm talking about English teachers across America suing us. Why would they sue us? For the way Dave speaks, as, as Aunt Lola used to say, is he going to go around his elbow to get to his wrist before he makes a point on this? I know, I know the words he uses are English. I've heard them used individually before, but never in the order in which they come out of his mouth. I think we're safe from that lawsuit. I could be wrong. I have to check with Stephen P. New, but I believe we are safe. All right. Well, is he going to make a point? I don't know. You see, <laughs> no, because here's the thing. A lot of people got in touch with me the other day. Uh, right before the drive through came out. Was it the drive through No, this is the drive through Right before the experience came out. Yeah. And they said Dave went on his show, and I heard different things from different people. Dave apologized. I heard there's a lot of 
hand wringing going on. Different people have different takes on these things. I figured, let me hear it. Jace Nakarado went through. Jace Nakarado sent me notes. I couldn't make rhyme or reason out of them. And it's not Jace's fault. So we have a little bit of audio. Let's hear what this is. But this is going to be Dave and his co host slash partner, Brian Alvarez, a business partner, Brian Alvarez. Now, wait, 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 wait. Now, how- I don't mean anything funny there. I meant business partner. I just said partner. Well, why does your mind automatically go into sexual thing that's not where my mind is going here but let's go to this and then we'll come back and and try to tell you what they actually said after you hear what they said that's right let's go to this anything new on cm punk today no nothing new today no um as far as um you know it's like this is twice that like i i went through freaking guilt trip because the first time if you recall was when he did the thing, he did quote in Sports Illustrated, and he's like, the Young Bucks called Dave Meltzer and blah, blah, blah about whatever, which was a couple weeks before the big blow up. And so I thought, you know, I, I just, oh, uh, whatever, whatever he said. And then everything happened there. And you all know that, like, I, like, I thought that it's like, man, I should have just told him that the Young Bucks had nothing to do with it. Now, do I really believe anything would happen differently? Probably not, but it's like, he, well, let me stop. Okay, well, yeah, I, I was. Been, we're supposed to be doing our job as reviewers and or commentators commenting on. I don't. I haven't yet understood what the fuck. I know the subject he's talking about, and I still don't know what he's trying to fucking say. Well, one thing he did say there is, looking back now, he should have gone to CM Punk a year ago or whatever it was, <laughs> and said, "I just want you to know the Young Bucks were not my source." for, I guess, the Colt Cabana story originally. Well, yeah, I guess we should have prefaced this because nobody would have been able to figure it out. There's all kinds of drama been going on. We talked about some of it on the last show with Punk having to refute things that Dave brought up out of basically the ether because his sources told him these things when it appeared that it might be getting close to Punk coming back to work. So they went to stir shit up, and Dave went along with it and printed it. We talked about that on the last program, where upon, at that point, Punk came back and said, no, Moxley wanted to do Rocky Three and this, that, and the other thing. And now Dave is apparently saying he feels bad and is trying to somehow apologize for being in the midst, starting all of this shit to begin with. Is that a clear summation? And I don't even know what no. I just said. No, it's not a clear summation, but I think to even try to make it more clear or less clear, we'll see how this goes. What he's referencing here is the previous time. This time now that got Punk on Instagram to comment wasn't in print. This was on his message board. That's the ah. difference. Ah. But let's go back. Let's hear a little bit more from Dave about this. Just don't know. And it's like, I kind of feel like I was, it wasn't my job to do it, but it kind of was. You know, I'm not kind of job, but I just, I just felt really bad and real guilty about like, I just said, like, these guys had nothing to do with this, but whatever. So then this time, you know, it's like I did a, a, a message board post that I really wish I never did because so much has happened since then, you know, in, in so many destructive ways, not, not just him, but, um, let me stop there. That's interesting. That's interesting. Because so many people have jumped on Dave's behavior in the last several years, specifically on Twitter, where I don't know what you would call it, and I'm sure he may see it differently than other people perceive it, but rudeness, snarkiness, condescension, talking down to people, insulting people, you know. Well, but, but I mean, and not even, it's like not even people that are going after him or, or, or people with a platform. It's just everybody that says something that contradicts an an opinion that he has given or written, he will search them out, find them, argue it down to the goddamn nub, or if he gets on, like when he got on my bandwagon there for a while, where it was like, hey, Dave, what'd you have for lunch? Well, Cornette doesn't know. Just apropos of nothing. Yeah, whatever. And he just... This is a guy that writes tens of thousands of words a week and does these podcasts and 
obviously watches a lot of fucking modern wrestling. And he has the time to argue with people on Twitter that have three followers that tweet him that they don't like the fucking buckaroos or whatever. And he will beat him to death with it. It's, does he ever sleep? Is that the problem? He's not sleeping. Well, we'll talk about Helix in a little bit. But that's kind of the point, too. He behaves one way on Twitter. And a lot of people have pointed to it and said it's a strategy. Dave has said that this has gotten me more, I don't know, subscribers, I guess would be the word. So obviously there is a business aspect to it. But his message board is a little different. That's not a big open forum. That is something that people pay to get into. There are people who subscribe to their website, him and Brian Alvarez, and the message board is a feature that they pay for. So behind that paywall, you even get a different Dave. Remember, so much of the drama that he stirred up with you started because we started getting people sending us things from his message board that he was saying in private at the same time he was emailing you all sorts <laughs> of pleasantries all the time and compliments on the show. Pleasantries. Yes, you are correct. And, and then his insidious nature came to light and he wouldn't fucking leave it alone but that again that's this message board that he's got this is where he writes this stuff this is where his most devoted fans are because they have to pay to read it and to participate in it and that's where this latest inflammatory business came uh came up that punk then had to jump on and respond to. And now Dave feel, I think he said he feels bad. He should have never wrote it. Well, maybe you should have asked somebody else besides whoever it is you're talking to for you did write it. Maybe you should think twice before anything you put on social media, Dave, but let's go back to the audio. You know, somebody just going, Oh, you know, like, you know, one thing we can say for us, like it was all smooth as far as the, uh, you know, the, the match that he lost to Moxley, the real quick match before he beat him for the title. And I just, you know, kind of said it's, you know, wasn't it really wasn't that smooth because it really wasn't. There was a lot going on. And, um, you know, there was a, there was drama and everything. And when I said it, you know, I mean, it wasn't writing a, a news story or anything like that. But when I said it, I never said, you know, a lot of it had to do with his injury. And it did. You know, it's like in his in his defense, he was coming back from a broken foot. Um, and it was a serious injury. Let's stop it right there. That's exactly right. You yeah. told one perspective of the story, completely leaving out his defense, as you put it, which was that he had a broken foot. He had a broken foot. <laughs> and that the, the people that wanted to squash him were saying he didn't need to be medically cleared to participate in a squash. To which point I responded, you do if you're the one taking the fucking bumps. Yeah, and 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 now we now we find out. And remember, uh, as several people pointed it out on Twitter, also remember I said in that pay per view match, it looked like Moxley came out with job face, and apparently, because Tony was so Tony Khan was so out of control of his locker room that he's got Moxley, who's the interim champion, wrestling without a contract at all. He's got Punk, who's not medically cleared to come back and get the belt back, that Moxley doesn't want to put Punk over until Punk puts him over because of Rocky Three, the Rocky Three defense. And, <laughs> and, and Tony can't make... Moxley do anything because he's not under contract. And it, but here in the meantime, your big fucking baby face star is coming back from injury and he can't fucking win the title back that he never lost to begin with unless he does a squash job for this delusional fucking plumber that you've got working for you under no contract that could go anywhere he wanted at any time he wanted. What the, what kind of fucking... Booker of the year. Jesus H. Christ. Go ahead. Well, Dave didn't put any of that in his uh, post on the message board as well, but let's go back to the audio. And, you know, that played into it, you know, as far as, you know, when he was going to be ready and it, you know, like the, the angle, whatever you think of the angle, 
I mean, the angle could have worked. Or, 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 I, 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 you know, the, I mean, the way the angle was, and it's like the whole Rocky Three thing. It's like if you had more time, the angle probably would have. Well, it would have been better if you had more time. But because of the injury, you didn't have more time. And, yeah, they could have. There's things they could have done. But the whole point. So. So in Rocky three, what was, <laughs> let me get this in, in Rocky three was clubber Lang, the interim champion and everybody's called uh, drawing all these parallels to Rocky three. No, no, it's not. No, there's not. I don't see any. The one question I have now coming out of this, there was a spectacular segment with Punk and Ace Steel. Remember that? Where Ace Steel yes. was in the ring and then Punk came out and he slapped Punk in the face? Yeah. Was that part of the Rocky Three storyline? Because remember, in Rocky Three. Well, that, there, there, was, there was the uh, surrogate Mickey. Well, Mickey dies in Rocky Three. Clubber Lang yeah. causes his heart attack in the back. Was Ace Steel going to die at AEW TV? <laughs> <laughs> like, where, where's the story? You know, Apparently, what's the Rocky if Moxley had his way, no, the whole thing at Clubber Lang is an awful monster heel. He's not a fucking baby face like Moxley was. Remember, that's why we said the whole thing's fucked up. Punk, the baby face champion, coming back to win the title that he never lost in the ring against another baby face. And then we found out that the, fuck, that the baby face doesn't want to do a job for punk unless punk does a job for him first in a squash well boy that that's a revolutionary angle hey bef before i put you over i'm gonna beat you in about two minutes flat in the middle of the ring people won't see that coming no they sure didn't and i refuse to do it any other way yeah there's no similarities but it, with rocky three otherwise than in the deluded mind of John Moxley, who maybe has been down under that sink sniffing the fucking liquid plumber too much. Well, it's nice to think an episode of AEW could have ended with CM Punk and Carl Weathers uh, fighting it out at the end. But let's go back to some more audio from Dave. The point is, is that like, I, it's, it's like a, a, a message board post that I didn't need to make. And I didn't mention, you know, the, the fact that the injury was part of it in the fact that there was drama, which there was. So it's just like, you know, there was. And so I kind of, I feel really bad about it. And then, you know, he goes and like, I, it's it's not like, um, oh, you know, like him saying, oh, Dave Meltzer's a liar. I mean, that's not, that's just, you know, I hear stuff like that on a daily basis. And it's, you know, I, tr I try never to do that. But, you know, it's like, whatever. It's like, I felt like, you know what, I wasn't really thinking i didn't really tell the whole story and and that's the thing and then everything happens from there and it so i mean basically and i think he's trying i actually think dave's doing for dave as good he's trying as hard as he can to say he's sorry <laughs> i thought that's what you were gonna say he's trying as hard as he can to be clear he's trying to be aware of his behavior it sounds like and whether well, he is or hey, isn't hey you know if he hits that awareness mode and maybe his whole world will change. <laughs> well, let's get away from Raycon and let's get back to Dave Con here. Any thoughts on this? I still don't know what the fuck he's saying. <laughs> this is, he speaks at colleges. Apparently, let's hear a little bit more of his speaking. It's, uh, you know, and again, it's almost the same thing because it's like, you know, okay. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's funny how different people take, take what I call the shrapnel. Because I remember one time, you know, somebody was mad at me and I go, what are you mad at? And then they said, you know, it's like, well, Brian said, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I'm not Brian. And, and by the way, and it wasn't fair to what you said either, but whatever, that has nothing to do with it. And so then it's like, what the fuck? you know, I he kind of blasted uh, Moxley to a bit and certainly blasted Jericho. And it's like, this was, you know, at the time when everyone is trying to you know, see if you can make up and make this thing work and do the best thing for the company. And and you were used as is, a tool to get the drama out there. Is everybody trying or is one side trying and the other side is, is getting using tools to get drama out? You know, the other thing, too, and, you know, we'll talk more about this because we have John Moxley audio to play, too. So I may say this a few times. This all comes back to Tony Khan. 
This all comes back to from the very beginning of CM Punk getting there. He has managed things wrong, even while things were going right. And if you can look at the Bobby Fish match, if there was or wasn't an element that wanted CM Punk there, if you're the boss, you're the one that needs to snuff that out or needs to figure out what you're going to do. But all of the drama, I actually think, if you really think about it, Punk and the Bucks and Omega and Moxley and Jericho, they're all pawns in this fucking game. The drama's been allowed to happen because of Tony Khan, and in a lot of cases, it's been spread because of Dave. And also, it, a lot of people are still not getting the, the picture of Jericho's involvement in this when, no, he wasn't in the fight, and he wasn't in the press scrum. He didn't, you know, have any part in the press scrum or whatever, but have you noticed that <laughs> any time that Punk fires back at what he perceives to be people on a slander campaign against him, people trying to get people to call him a cancer in the locker room, the people that are behind it. Jericho always gets mentioned. And you know, a lot of times when somebody is engaging in a slander campaign against you at your workplace, you might know that they are doing it, but the general public doesn't. So they might not Understand why you would mention somebody like that, but you know who the fuck's putting the mouth on you behind your back, as Dennis Corluzzo used to say. And so I find it interesting that Jericho adopts this, oh, I'm so innocent, I'm above all, I don't want to get involved in this, but he's always the one mentioned when somebody fires back from the other side. Because he's always involved. Let's go to hear some more yeah. audio. Then this happens, which just... You know, how that how it's going to turn out, who the hell knows, but it certainly is never a good time to do that. And Jericho had absolutely nothing to do with this message post, nor did Moxley, you know, and it's just. So let's right now, let's circle around that real quick. This oh, message yeah, board post, he's already said the Bucks from previously had nothing to do with it. Moxley had nothing to do with it. Jericho had nothing to do with it. If we're going to assume that Punk had nothing to do with it, considering it wasn't favorable to him. Then somebody not related to anything involved in this told him something, and he didn't ask anybody that was involved in it before he talked about it. Or it's Tony Khan. Let's go to more audio. Just like, whatever. Now it's like, oh, God, you know, I just I just didn't like this. I'm just really sad that it, it, it happened this way. Um, you know, I want the best thing for the business, both companies. I'm happy WWE is doing great. And I'm, I was happy, shoot, I was really happy watching, uh, you know, Wednesday and seeing AEW get the good rating and the good rating pattern. Which this is the weirdest he was, apology. Yet. He was throbbing happy over that. Well, I mean, there's, there's a little bit more. I'm looking through the notes here. Brian Alvarez yells, don't pull me into this. He doesn't want to be involved. <laughs> but Dave, I mean, the, the recurring message over and over again is he's sorry for a message board post he shouldn't have made or he didn't have to make. He phrased it a few different ways. The question is, does Dave accept his role in stirring up all the drama over the last year and a half? I don't, I don't hear that. I hear him talking about this particular incident. I don't hear him. I don't hear him grasping the whole full concept of what the fuck's been going on because then he would be saying the same thing we are. Look how far Tony Khan has let all this shit slide down the hill. You know, that's to me still the big thing because for everyone that looks at the drama publicly being displayed or talked about now, this is not new. We've talked about it on this show going back several years now. We talked about the problems with Tony's management. We talked about drama backstage. There's a reason Cody's not there anymore, ladies and gentlemen. And until people can say, Tony is the problem, because Tony is not a boss. Tony's not a good manager, and Tony's not a good booker. He may be an okay owner and promoter, but look at what's happening with his hands all over this shit. And we'll talk about Moxley again in a little bit, but this is all because Tony doesn't know what he's doing, and he's not capable of it. He's got the money and none of the skills. But until people say that, until people want to stop pretending that Tony, well, you know, booking was better last year than it is. You know, the booking's been shit from the beginning. <laughs> it's just they were more successful when they had bigger stars main eventing a pay-per-view. 
But until people can actually say that all of these problems, if this was Vince McMahon's locker room, it would have been snuffed out. It wouldn't have gotten to this point. It wouldn't have gotten to the point a year ago. It all comes back to Tony Khan. Comments. Oh, I thought we were going to play some more fucking audio of uh, Uncle Dave and Cousin Drooplip analyzing this well, let's situation. Give it, let's give it a second or two. Let's see if they add anything new. It's a really good story, you know, like it's like it's it's the the match worked. You kind of made a star in one night. You know, we talked about that was a phenomenal match. So everything was kind of looking, you know, there's always ups and downs, but that was like a real up. And then now, you know, who the hell knows what's what's going on? I don't know what's, <laughs> what, what I, I am. I am. God, don't, to, don't pull me into it. I, have to pull I you do into not. It. I do not. No, you're involved in it. Don't say don't pull me into it, Brian. You're involved in all this. Oh, my God. I, I think that that clip you should you should uh, save of Uncle Uncle Dave just going, I don't know what's going on. And I, I want to say something, too. And I always got along with Brian Alvarez. I haven't talked to him in many years. And beyond the issues that come at us since AEW, I never had a problem with Dave Meltzer. But they've complained, or I've heard Brian Alvarez, I think, make a comment, and other people in wrestling about the Cornet fans, whatever you want to call them, the cult of Cornet, the Cornet fans, the biggest listenership in the history of professional wrestling audio. And like any fan base, we've got some nutty fans. Most are harmless, but every now and then there's a nutty fan who says something so, stupid. So, some people anywhere that you go in the world are, are nuttier than squirrel shit. And we get a few of them. And you know what? We don't typically embrace that. Remember, there was a guy a while back in, I think, Miami, jumped the rail at AEW. Almost got to Jericho. He said on Twitter that he did it. He was a member of the Cult of Cornette. We both denounced him and blocked him. And even Jericho came out to his credit and said, Jim Cornette would have never wanted you to do that. Not a real fan of his. And then come to find out that he also, I think, claimed he did it for a few more people. He was trying to hit everybody's fan base. But where we can and where we see things, we jump in there and correct stuff. We have a Facebook group right now. It's got over 6,700 people in there right now with tens of thousands trying to get in. I was about to say, and we're, we're trying, folks. We're trying to get those doors open. And with a small group of moderators, we do our very best to keep this thing civil, keep the conversations good, keep the laughter up, keep the information coming in, and we've done a pretty good job. Brian Alvarez and Dave Meltzer have a message board where, like you said, the most devoted of the Wrestling Observer newsletter readers go. Not every Observer reader. It's a very small group that's on there. But it exists for a reason. Because they know it's a selling point to get people to use that message board. People want to pay for that right. Maybe you interact with Dave or Brian Alvarez. So for anyone who wants to say anything about the Cult of Cornette, which is an incredibly large audience, and every now and then we get a few loose nuts and we try to do what we can to correct them. And it's not just people, you hear people like, oh, he's parroting Jim Cornette. Listen, it's the way fucking pop culture works. When Chevy Chase took off and people started stealing his line, no one said, you're parroting Chevy Chase. <laughs> it's just the way things work when things are popular. But for anyone to point their finger at the cult of Cornette, we do our best to regulate and keep people in line. That may not mean they like the wrestling you like, but we do what we can. They charge admission. We don't charge admission. What you do on Twitter and Facebook, we do what we can. They charge a fee to enter the gate for people to go there and post all sorts of shit. The other day, it was sent to me, and I went and looked, because I've been a member since it's first started. I've known Brian Alvarez from back then. He used to send me my OVW tapes, actually, funny enough. <laughs> Wait a minute. Where was he getting them from? Son of a bitch, bootlegging? Ah, oh, go ahead. Well, he was sending me my OVW tapes, which I was very happy for, because that was the m and period. It was a great period of time there. But someone in one of the posts called me a bigot and a racist. You know, this is in the conversation of me not liking their wrestlers and me talking about stuff on these shows, honestly, because I don't care if I'm friends with wrestlers. I'm going to tell you the truth. Someone on that board, some nut, probably lonely, hiding behind an alias, said I'm a bigot and a racist. If that was on the Cult of Cornet Facebook group, that comment would have been taken down. That person probably would have been thrown out if that was about Dave Meltzer or Brian Alvarez, because it's ridiculous. 
Well, but now, but, but wait a minute. These are the same people that wished us aggressive ass cancer and named the next great punk band in the process. So you mean to tell me that over there on the message board at uh, that, that Alvarez and Meltzer are operating, that they're charging people to be a part of, that they're actually allowing people to go on there and slander other people, call them horrible names, and not even trying to moderate them in any way, shape, or form? Well, they have moderators there, but these comments are left up. And I know we know that because we've now put together a giant file of horrible things that have been said. That's the point. If you want to say, oh, Jim Cornette's awful because he hates the wrestling I like, or he doesn't like Japanese women wrestling. If you think he's horrible for that, that's fine. Everyone's entitled to be a boob. Have fun hey. with that. I'm not saying you are. I'm saying they are. Will you relax? Oh, I've, I lost you around the far turn. You are entitled to be a boob if you want, Jim. Well, I'm, I'm entitled. <laughs> And do you like boobs a lot, boobs a lot, boobs a lot? But for people to pay a fee to go on their branded message board and say stuff like that because we disagree about the wrestling. And again, Dave's been on that message board. Dave started this punk drama again on that message board. Dave was running his mouth about Jim on that message board behind a paywall, hiding. So I don't want to hear any more shit about the Jim Cornette audience. The only thing you need to know about our audience it's much bigger than yours. Yeah. But don't blame us. We don't charge them a fee. And every to once come in a while, shit. a blue vein shows up on the edge of it. But again, just to reiterate once again, don't say anything bad about this audience. It's bigger than yours. We've got less nuts than yours. What does that say? Yeah. A lot of things happening in the world of professional wrestling, and seemingly in the last couple of days, one of the reasons we're recording this update. A lot happening around the world of CM Punk and AEW once again. Here we go again. I guess it starts with a report yesterday came out from Fightful Select, I believe it was Sean Ross Sapp, reporting that CM Punk has been in talks with AEW. He's eager to come back to AEW. They're trying to get him to sit down with Chris Jericho to hash things out. And he's willing to do business with whoever, the Bucks, Omega, I don't know about Jericho, we'll see. But the Bucks and Omega and the people that you think he would have a natural conflict with because of everything that happened behind the scenes. So why don't we start with that? The report that seemingly a punk return is imminent with some reports saying that it's coming up at an upcoming AEW show in Chicago. What are your thoughts on all this coming out? Well, but we've, this is not really, when you think about it, new news because we've heard a few times that there's been conversations between Tony Khan and CM Punk. And every time we hear that, then the propaganda arm of the EVPs out there in Campbell by the Sea, California, you know, does anybody, even the impartial observers now, let's say, does anybody not think that Uncle Dave is the Jerry Mahoney to the EVPs, Paul Winchell? And Google it, kids, it's going to be hilarious. But he's the living he, point lookout, Paul Winchell. He it, and that's the thing is that every time that there is some public indication, some report that Tony and CM Punk had a long talk, or that this is coming closer to fruition, then immediately something comes out from Uncle Dave's side on behalf of the EVPs that is it meant to either inflame Punk to defend himself, and rightfully so, like he did a, a week or two ago when the fucking plumber was running his pie hole, or, as we, we talked about a few weeks ago, it, they start having a preemptive strike by putting out, well, oh, well, as long as Punk's willing to apologize, apologize for what? Not suing Tony Khan and his company under the fucking... <laughs> courthouse is that what he has to apologize for here's a guy who probably because he's proud doesn't want to go out of the wrestling business like this where because of the children he worked with people think he's a cancer because he's not one that runs his mouth in public he all the other fucking side does that so they've buried him and buried him when he defends himself people are saying oh see there you can't fucking trust Punk. He's going to, you know, get mad and cause an issue. Yeah, he's going to get mad when people are lying about him. So 
every time that it looks like that Tony has done the right thing, because Punk is not wanting to fucking leave wrestling like that, with that kind of reputation, but also, I think what everybody overlooks is Punk is getting a check every week or every two weeks, whatever their pay cycle is, for what amounts to more than seven figures a year, right? Or in the seven figures a year, to do nothing. To sit at home, he's he had an injury that's been seven months ago. I bet you he's probably okay by now. But now it comes down to the fucking cowardly, gutless, ballless. If you took all six of the balls that the EVPs allegedly possess and rolled them at a fucking drinking straw, it looked like six kernels of corn rolling into a storm drain. They're so scared he's going to beat them up again or he's going to fucking show them up or he's going to outdraw them or outwork them or whatever they're so scared about him. Every time it looks like there's movement for Tony Khan to get some return on his investment of seven figures a year, sending this guy a check to sit at home because his fucking EVPs are butthurt, then something gets out to where it to stir things up and muddy the water and screw up Tony Khan's business and his dealings. He's trying to make a deal to either get some value for the fucking money that he's spending or to get some fucking closure with the open-ended situation he's got with Punk. He's under contract. He has to pay him, play him, or cut him. And this guy's willing to be a professional, come back and earn his money. And the other guys are running from him like their heads are on fire. Because they're afraid either he's going to beat them up for real or he's going to beat them up in the fucking ratings. So it shouldn't surprise anybody by now that every time it looks like this might be worked out to AEW's benefit, Tony Khan's benefit, how would you like, Brian, to be writing a check to somebody for over a million dollars a year and then just... just them sit home and cash it when it comes in the mail. When they're willing to come back and fulfill their part of the bargain, but uh, Pansy Dan and his fucking two friends are scared. They're scared. You know what? As Ernie Ladd used to say, if you're scared, say you're scared. If you're a mouse, squeak. Right, and the other thing is, if you're Tony Khan, you can't be happy that every time you think you have a compromise and a solution, Something happens that seems to poison the well. But he, he, he can't be too unhappy because he won't blister and, and discipline the people that are causing it. Look, at the very end, if you're someone in the Bucks camp who thinks it's all Punk's fault, and if you're someone who's in the Punk camp and you think it's all the Bucks and Omega's fault, you're all wrong. It's Tony Khan's fault yeah. that it got to this point and that it's still happening. He still hasn't been able to stop this. This is still happening. It, he can't say, you blithering simpletons, I'm paying this guy a fortune. He said he'll work with you. You don't want to work with him? Fuck you. I won't pay you anymore. Because he drew me more money than you ever have. That's what I want to talk to you about. The idea that Punk is willing to work with whoever it may be that's best for, I, I hate to use the term because it's such a cliche now, best for business. Whether it's Omega, whether it's the Bucks whatever it may be. We're hearing that the feeling may not necessarily be reciprocated from the other side. So to look at it from the other side, if the Bucks and Omega simply refuse to work with CM Punk, should that be said instead of this constant back and forth, he's willing to do this, they don't know if they want to? Like It kind of has to be settled. Well, and do you think... Is there any problem with that with someone saying they don't want to work with someone else? Again, they stormed into his locker room before he threw the first punch. But is there a problem with a wrestler saying, I don't want to work, or multiple wrestlers in this case, three guys, potentially saying, I don't want to work with this guy? Okay, there are a number of reasons, and especially a main event wrestler, should be taken seriously when they say, I don't want to work with somebody. Whether it was when Steve Austin didn't want to work with Brock Lesnar because they were fucking with Steve and he knew it, but also he knew that Steve Austin versus Brock Lesnar is a pay-per-view match. We're not doing it on free Raw. And he went home and he said since then, he handled it wrong. He shouldn't have just gone home. He wasn't going to do the match, but he should have handled, handled it differently. But that's an, a, an example 
of a guy saying, I won't work with somebody for the right reason. You're giving it away. We could all make money with this. I don't believe in it. Or conversely, if you've got a mate, when Brock Lester just said, yeah, fuck you. I'll work with Bray Wyatt. He's, you know, what's that going to do to my career? And he's the shits. That's another good legitimate reason because Sometimes a guy might say that, and it might not be true. In this case, it was true. It would have probably damaged Brock's reputation to work with Bray Wyatt. So he said no. That's a legitimate reason for a top guy to turn something down. And there's also a, re a top guy that somebody might say, well, we want you to work with, you know, Johnny Dipshit and put him over in five minutes. And then it's the old, that don't work for me, brother, because if you're a big star and it's a nobody, whatever... That's a, I, that's a palatable reason. But examine this. They're in the wrestling business to make money. People have fucking fights and have since the dawn of fucking time in wrestling and in all sports, football players, basketball players. You see it all at the bench clearing and baseball. What happens when those guys that were on the opposite sides of that bench clearer end up on the same team? They still going to fight or are they going to work together? One guy's going to fucking hit the ball. The other guy's going to catch it, whatever the case, because that's their job. And it, it, it doesn't, there's no danger that the one guy's going to take a bat and finish the job from five years beforehand when they were on different teams. They're professionals. They had a fucking fight because they're athletes. That's the problem. Again, to use a line from Bill Watts, if the Bucks or Kenny, we're in a men's locker room in wrestling 20 years ago or in any probably professional sport, maybe even still to this day, they'd be whistling stranger in paradise. This is, they think it's all, it's fun and games and everybody dances and plays together. Cause this is community theater. No motherfucker. You want to play a pro wrestler. You want to play a pro athlete on TV. Then you got to put up with things happen between pro athletes. They have fights, they get over it and they fucking agree to work together, and move on. So that's the, issue here is that one guy says i'm in the wrestling business and shit happens and now we have an opportunity to capitalize on it with the potential biggest money drawing match that aew has ever been able to put together they did a million dollars with punk and fucking page they did a million dollars with punk and mjf imagine what they could do with and i believe a couple other people are amenable to this match also punk and ftr versus the buckaroos and kenny and you'd get all the aew fans that would buy it anyway and then you get the fucking fans that buy it because punk's back and then you get the people that say you know what even though i don't really like that promotion and want to watch their pay-per-views somebody might go off and punch somebody in the face for real and i probably need to see that live that's called taking advantage of fucking reality in a working fashion to draw money in a wrestling business. And that's what it seems like that the EVPs, for their own selfish interests, don't want to make Tony any of his money back that he's been paying them in punk. And you think that fucking Kenny Olivier versus El Hijo del Vikingo would outdraw a six-man between the EVPs and Punk and FTR on pay-per-view with this fucking history. Fuck you. No, the match that people are pitching is Kenny Omega versus Will Ospreay. Oh, it's the same thing with a fucking shorter name. Who gives two flying shits? It's, it's a, a mark match for the, the audience that already watches and buys everything they do. And most wrestling fans are going, here we got another goddamn case of competitive parkour. Do you think the Bucks and Omega would dismiss this, turn this down, refuse it, whatever it may be, if there weren't guaranteed contracts in AEW? Now, of course, everyone wants to be guaranteed they're going to make money. WWE has their downside guarantee. But if you're guaranteed a flat amount of money, besides merchandise, you don't have to care about if this house will do good or not. You're still going to get paid the no. same thing. Yeah. Which is really what led to 
a lot of guys malaise in the wrestling business when they first came in a while back, but in this uh, 30 years ago, you know, guys automatically, especially in WCW, were like, Vince had the right idea. I'll give you a minimum, but you can make more than that if you fucking get the spot and work hard. Whereas everybody in WCW knew we're just going to make our salary, so we'll just fucking manipulate this to our own purposes. But with, again... I honestly think that all three of those fucking knuckleheads would take less money if they get their entrance music and their custom-made belts so that they can have championship titles with their friends and do their matches with their kids they like. I think they'd take less money. Of course, they've never told Tony that. But think about this. He's paid these three more money than they've ever seen in their lives and hired family members and friends as well. Oh, yeah. If family members and friends of every single one of them. <laughs> That's right. And for that, they get a chance to actually be part of what may be the biggest money match they could put together, but they're scared that he's going to beat them up for real, and they know they can't do anything about it again. And they're and they're pissed and they're hurt. Their feelings are hurt. Their feelings are hurt. They're so hurt. Fuck your fucking feelings. If I'm paying you a million dollars or whatever the fuck, I don't give a fuck about your feelings. Your feelings are being soothed by my million dollars. Well, Jim, before we go too much further, I should bring this up because this is again how shit gets going. Deadspin put up an article earlier today. CM Punk is gaslighting AEW. What? This article was retweeted by Brandon Cutler, who, oh, wrote, oh, oh, okay. who wrote, Someone Gets It. So here you have someone who is only in AEW because he's the longtime stooge or friend, whatever you want to call it. He's their stooge. He always has he been. He went to grade school with them. Not even high school. He went to grade school with them. Brandon Cutlet has a job on a national television wrestling promotion because he went to school with some of the guys. And he was the guy who, on their behalf, attacked Jim Ross a few years ago when he made a comment about all the dives, and here he is. Yeah. Apparently this tweet has already been taken down. <clears throat> Boy, I'm, I'm glad all these some bitches know how to take their tweets down. I don't really know how to do that. I just... Let them hang out there. But they, they get bad feelings about him real quick. Let's talk about Dave Meltzer and his role in all this because a ton of listeners have been sending me audio and I've heard a little bit of it. We'll play some of it here on the show. We'll review it. But Dave Meltzer, as soon as this news came out from Fightful, that CM Punk, a return is imminent, discussions are underway. Dave Meltzer had some comments on it. I'm going to play you. These are from the uh, Meltzer said what Twitter account. <laughs> Which apparently follows the travels and travails and travails of Dave Meltzer. I will start with this one. Let me see if I can play this and if you can hear it, Jim. You know, if you just go in there and make amends, I mean, there's always ways to do it if you really want to do it. Going, doing it this way tells me that it's still a power play of trying to make other people look bad, you know, in the little game. You know, and the thing with the end of the game is... All right, let me stop it here, because apparently this is not the beginning of it. There's a lot of audio here. Let me start. Let me go to this. This one should... We'll come back to that other one. I'm already gobsmacked. Well, what's the latest on Punk and FTR? You tell me what's the latest. How come I have to tell you? Because you know more than me. Well, I mean, I don't know if I know more than you. Okay, no, I'm not going to listen to that one either. Let's go back okay. over here. <laughs> I'm over here now. Let's go to this one again. You know... If you just go in there and make amends, I mean, there's always ways to do it if you really want to do it. Going, doing it this way tells me that it's still a power play of trying to make other people look bad, you know, in the little game. You know, and the thing with the end of the game is, is that I, I don't believe that they want to work with them as much as they want to get rid of them, you know, and... He's saying that who now too many pronouns, pal. CM Punk and FTR are not truly interested in working with the Bucks and Omega. This is all a plot to drive them out of AEW. <laughs> By making them no, look bad. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me make a kind. Number one, we couldn't possibly be that lucky. <laughs> Number two, drive them out of AEW. Where are they going to go? They're going to sit out in the parking lot and sell pencils out of a tin cup until somebody lets them back in the building. He's saying talking about making amends and blah blah blah. 
I didn't see anywhere where Punk said, maybe he has, I don't know. He said, oh, I'd love to apologize to those guys. For what? He has said, and it's been reported publicly, he has said to Tony Khan, he's willing to come back to work and he's willing to work with these people. He didn't say he was willing to come back and be their friends. He has nothing to apologize for. If he wanted to, that'd be a bonus. But what is all this apologizing bullshit? When a guy owns a company and he's paying people this much money and they've had a fight, he sits them down and he says, okay, I need everybody here. But... Who's willing to work with each other and who's not? The guy that's willing to work with everybody? Okay, I'll take you. You guys don't want to? Well, good. See you later. What the fuck? It's up to them to make that decision. If they say, okay, we'll be professional too, we're not going to apologize to him either, but we'll work together and we won't try to fucking break anybody's neck. Well, then that's fine too. I don't want them to be friends if I'm the boss. I don't care about their personal life. I want them to earn the money I'm paying them and draw me some money. And then it comes down to who's willing to do that and who's not. And nobody said they were trying to run them out of AEW, although that would be a wonderful fucking side effect. But it's ridiculous, the drama from these childlike minds and when anything that might potentially make them look like they're not the king shit of all starts coming to pass. They try to poison it. I'm sorry, go ahead. Let's hear more from Dave about the unprofessional power play by CM Punk and uh, and apparently just Dax Harwood. I'm looking here what Meltzer said what had to say about this. Let's go to this. Like the idea of doing this. If they really want to work with them, you know all they got to do is, is they got to go up to them and if they see them every week at TV and just go, dude, you know, let's, let's work together. You know, and <laughs> how can we work <laughs> that's all it takes dude let's work together well they don't see him every week at tv anyway because punk ain't been to tv since september i don't yeah, even know who he's working. talking about he's talking about ftr but let's go back to this we do do we put you over do we what can we you know can we do an angle um what do we got to do what do we got to do to make amends to all be team players okay wait a minute okay but and why does ftr if, have to make amends to anybody they got jacked out of the fucking belts from the fucking little whiny bastards when they decided to do their six-man thing. They never did the rubber match to put all the belts on FTR that was set up. Yeah, when they so, didn't want to do the money match last year. They didn't want to do the money <laughs> match last year because it would have made them look like they weren't the greatest tag team in the world, which in their minds they are. So they left FTR standing there with their Johnson in their fucking hands and didn't draw money for Tony with that big man and help FTR get all the belts so that they would have that run successfully. And they're having those matches with the Briscoes and they're getting all the attention. They were a valuable commodity for AEW. That's why apparently they were never on AEW television and never put in a prominent position because they got so much conversation that the buckaroos were just jelly as they say, and had to stop that. So why should FTR go up and say, Hey dude, Hey, we're sorry. You want to work together? Fuck you. First thing he said was, hey, you know, what can we do? Can we put you over? That was the yes, first thing he no, said. No. <laughs> they did that before when they shouldn't have. Why would they do it again? Well, let's go back to Dave's thoughts on what FTR and CM Punk can do to make everyone else happy. And they do it in the right way. In time, you know, it'll work. In time. If they go and do it in a way where everyone goes like, you know, you're not really looking at doing it, you're looking at making the other people look bad, then it's only digging the hole deeper. And they know that, and everyone knows that, and that's why it's like so... That's why Brandon Cutler shouldn't have put that tweet up earlier. That's exactly why. <laughs> of course. You know, watching this, it's like, you know, you see through this stuff, and so... Um, you know, and, and it's going to keep going probably like that until well, they I think basically also the all issue... get together. Well, let me stop it there for a second. Dave, obviously jumping to assumptions here. You see through it all. It's clear that this is what Punk and FTR are trying to do. It's, it's clear as day, Brian Alvarez, what my buddies told me that I've never talked to anybody on the other side, but it doesn't matter because I know what they'd say. So, yeah, let's can FTR and CM Punk come in and do valet parking and mow everybody's lawn and wash everybody's car 
and make amends for all the shit that other people did to them. You know what's going to end up being? Punk's going to have to work with someone else, and the Bucks are going to agree to work with FTR as long as FTR put him over in Wembley. But let's go back to this. Even so much, you know, will will the Bucks work with FTR? The issue here is the the uh, you know the claim that CM Punk is willing to work with the Elite. Well, of course, well, of CM course. Punk is willing well, to work with the Elite. That's is. not the issue. The issue is, do the Elite want to work with CM Punk? <laughs> and it's not Wait just a, a matter. Minute. Wait a minute. Hold on here, Alvarez. You little train monkey. Hey. What the, uh, how is he saying, of course, punk like it's an honor, like working with Kenny and the Buckaroos or like working with Fez and Briscoe and Ganya. Punk is a bigger star, has made more money, has accomplished more, has been more places than all three of them put together. It's not an honor to be in the ring with them for him. It's not like that they drew more money or bigger ratings than he did when they were all in the same company together. How would that make it an honor for him to, oh, these big stars, it'll help me draw. If there is no benefit or pleasure or honor for CM Punk to get in the ring with any of these three except to play off the real-life angle. That's the only reason they're valuable in this scenario. Elsewise, he wouldn't even want to work with them to begin with because... He didn't work with him before because he knew he couldn't make any money or have a good match with him. Now, the good match may still not be possible, but making money because of the real-life situation may be possible. That is why it is palatable, if not attractive, for CM Punk to get in the ring with either Kenny or Matty or Nikki. So I don't know what the fuck Alvarez is thinking, but maybe, you know, 140-fucking-something-pound gymnasts think alike. Hey, you know, I want to work with these guys, and they're they're unprofessional. Not want to work but with me. But that's the whole game. That's the game. I mean, there was a the, there was a situation the game, here. That's the game they're trying to play. Is like where you know he's willing to work with them. They're the you know it's it's a game for you know like they're the ones unprofessional, not me. You know, and it's just like well, you know, I I mean if, if the if whole I, thing starts. It's a game. How it's is just it unprofessional game. if he's like, okay, I'll work with him, and he will, and they won't? How is the guy that will be an unprofessional? Because Riddle it was... Me that. Uh, is he saying it's unprofessional because it was said? Because Dax said something publicly that they're willing to do this? Because Punk hasn't said anything. So it's all puzzling, but let's... Uh, a little more audio here. Things started because somebody was unprofessional. And, I mean, and if you want to argue that the whole thing started because Hangman was unprofessional, which I'm sure would be their side, well, that's fine. Yeah, but, but that's, you know, that's that has nothing to do. With, that has nothing to do with the young the, bucks. the issue that happened at All Out was CM Punk being unprofessional. So you know, before it's, that, it's, uh, before that, the the, the, the it real okay, like little things happened, but the big thing was the promo on Adam Page, which was totally unprofessional, and, and there's no defending it. But because he was never punished which is one of the problems with this, is because he was never punished for it, it created a lot of uh, heat that got worse and worse and worse. If he had been told, if like he had done that promo, and Tony would have said, dude, you know, you're going against the script, you're going to sit out for a couple of weeks. I think that at that point, either, you know, you know, he would have pouted and quit and gone home, or he would have not pouted and quit and gone home, and maybe this thing would have been alleviated. I got, I got another option. What if Paige, who did it first, had been disciplined or talked to or dressed down or chastened or sent home or sent to a Tibetan monastery, fucking observe a vow of silence for a year, whatever the case, then would Punk have done the unprofessional thing that Dave is whining and needs his pussy powdered about here in this case? One was brought about by the other. so. Why did Dave decide that Punk should have been punished for what he said about Hangnail when Hangnail wasn't punished for starting the whole thing on live television with the guy in front of him? And again, the Bobby Fish incident, the Bucks camp leaking all the stuff about Colt Cabana yeah. to Dave and Dave running with it. All these different things, it all, everyone who played it's a part in it campaign. points to Punk. <laughs> since since Tony signed Punk and Punk came in and sold out the the fucking building in Chicago and drew the fucking giant 
rating for Rampage that they've never even approached since, and then was on top for the first couple of million-dollar gates they ever drew. The campaign has never ceased from the whiny little bitch set over there from Rancho Cucamonga to drive him away by pissing him off because they know that he will go off. And the problem was he went off on their face. But I guess it's probably not the first time that Matt or Nick have had somebody go off on their face. And, but it didn't happen that way. So it got worse and worse and worse. <laughs> and so now we're at this situation where, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, I mean, obviously he's probably going to be back. And, um, you know, if they want to work. And he- They're all this upset about this. Wait until he still comes back with them. <laughs> he's going to be back. There's ways to do it, you know. Um, but going in there and trying to make the other people look unprofessional is is probably the worst way to do it unless is that exactly what they've done here is they've done everything they can to leak stuff to make it look unprofessional for over a year now yes and and i must admit that dave has done a wonderful job of being their house organ or mouth organ or two lips on an organ whatever the case Even though he can barely speak English these days and get a coherent sentence out, he's lost half his vocabulary, he's been able to see things from every perspective from the start of this, as long as every perspective comes from Cucamonga. Trying to just kind of like pressure them out of the company. If that's the (laughs) idea, you know, then we'll, you know, again, we'll have to wait and see how it all turns out. It's a really, you know, but but I like to extend like, like, this is clearly not good faith because it was good faith. Um, we wouldn't hear anything about it. They would settle it. They would settle it. And we would see an angle out of nowhere that would shock everyone, or at least even, or maybe we would talk about it or whatever and know the angle was coming. And if that happens, that's fine. But as long as they're talking about it, it tells me that, um, number one, they have no deal to do. Who's they? Who's they that's talking about it? Well, the audio uh, stopped here. It appears that Twitter has stopped. And I want to say well, something. Well, no, but but I'm I'm just saying, who's the they he's talking about that keeps talking about it? They they wouldn't, if they were really going to do business, they wouldn't be talking about it. They'd just shoot an angle or whatever. Well, who's the they that's talking about it? FTR. Everybody involved with the EVPs. That's who that, so he's just saying they wouldn't be, t- well, they're unprofessional because they're talking about it, spilling the beans, trying to fucking screw the deal trying to send it sideways because they don't want the guy around. They think Punk's trying to drive them out of the company. I guarantee you CM Punk does not want to become an executive in that company for the rest of his life. He probably wants to wrestle another year, year and a half, whatever this contract is, and get away from these fucking nutty people one time. Like Jerry Jarrett said to me when he quit the wrestling business at, at... in the 90s, he said, I didn't hate the wrestling business. I just hated the people I was in the wrestling business with. So Punk wants to wrestle and get the fuck out and go home and play with Larry. These weasels want to be there for the rest of their lives to sap Tony Khan of his fucking funds. So I don't see why they think he's trying to run them. Maybe run them out in the eyes of the public, make them immaterial, diminish their reputation simply because he's bigger. That might be possible, but... I don't think he wants to replace them. I don't see CM Punk becoming an executive vice president. I want to get your final thoughts on Dave and Brian Alvarez's comments on all this, but let me just say one thing because it involves me. Dave's jumping to a lot of assumptions here. And you heard him basically say it. This means this. This is happening, so this. Without a direct line. It's just Dave. And Dave, to the best of my knowledge, does not have cosmic consciousness. It is Dave just jumping to assumptions. It doesn't sound any more like he's got consciousness. You know, when Punk put up his Instagram thing to respond to Dave, must have been two months ago now, I don't even know. I put up the next day after Punk took it down, some of the sections from the AEW talent playbook. Because I thought it was important contextually for people to understand there actually are rules and barometers in AEW. Yes, and and if people didn't see your tweet, it it was the basically the code of conduct for AEW talent in media and interviews, which looks like, because the word team was mentioned a lot, it looks like it may have been cribbed from the Jacksonville Jaguars section of the empire. 
Well, I put that up and it got a lot of reaction. Someone brought this to my attention and I went and checked it out and there it was on Dave's message board. It always comes back to that fucking message board. <laughs> Dave wrote that the AEW talent playbook stuff that I put out was leaked because someone was mad that Punk had to take down his tweet. That is absolutely false. And I say that as the person who tweeted the talent playbook, which I've had on my desk since late last year. It had nothing. I didn't hear from Punk or anyone involved with Punk who said, put that up. We're mad about it. And I didn't give a shit. I don't care if Punk tweets it or not. It was out there in the ether already. Dave jumped to an assumption. He has my phone number. He has my email address. He could have said, Brian, why did you put this up? Where did you get it? Anything. Didn't hear a word. Instead, he puts on his message board that it was leaked by someone who was mad that Punk had to take down his tweet. It was and, leaked, and, to, me. And, and, it was leaked also, to me in 2022, you moron. Well, yeah, well, besides that, just the way he phrases it, it was leaked because sounds like somebody anonymous source put it out in the middle of the night. You tweeted it with your name on the fucking Twitter account because it's your Twitter account and said here in your capacity as operator and manipulator of the wrestling news, since this is in the news. Here's why that Punk may have had to take that down because it did violate when he answered the accusations of the fucking balding plumber and everybody else. It did violate their terms and policies. That's why the other cowards and dickless fucking pussies only do with a whisper campaign and nothing is ever attributed to them except for Moxley. He just, he talks like most people fart, just at random out of the blue and it usually stinks so he said whatever the fuck but i don't think he can read so they didn't really have him on the code of conduct anyway but that you didn't leak anything you put no. it out there with your name on it i put it out there and the reason i put it out there was everyone was saying why did punk take down his tweet so quickly and my point was well actually AEW prevents these guys from doing this kind of thing here it is in writing from their playbook and i put it up Dave jumped to an assumption. He's completely wrong. I'm sure he won't apologize, but Dave should apologize because he made a wrong statement about me, even though he didn't. Could you me. guys work together? Do you think you could work? I mean, there's some way that it could be done. Of course, you'd have to, you know, go up to him and say, hey, Dave, can I put you over? I want to challenge Dave to a match at the Garden. The Olive Garden. <laughs> no, uh, but then it end I just want to say, because a funny little ending to this, everything I put up on Twitter from that playbook ended up verbatim in the Observer without any credit to where it came from. The talent playbook somehow got out this week. Somehow, the great Brian Last put it out, you fucking dope. So that's what I want to hey, say. Hey, don't call him a dope. Dave's jumping to assumptions on a lot of things. I just witnessed firsthand to me, he jumped to an assumption about why I tweeted something. He very easily could have asked me if he was concerned. And by the way, Dave, if you want a copy of the playbook, let me know. You know, you could, you could autograph those like I did the Russo restraining order. We'd give the money to charity. Charity begins at home, you know, sometimes. That, that's a great idea. Final thoughts on Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez's comments about, again, another apparent attempt from Tony Khan and CM Punk to iron things out, get things together, get the team back together, or start some sort of process, and here we go again. If I wish I had final thoughts on Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez, meaning I'd never have any more, but unfortunately I have a feeling they're going to come up from time to time. But again, these children have never been in the wrestling business. They've been in their little bubble of their indie world where people thought that they were the shit with no S at the end and were lining up to smell their farts. And suddenly they get in the real world in over their heads with guys that outdraw them, guys that can outwork them, guys that can outtalk them, and guys that can outfight them. And they don't know how to handle it because everybody's told them how great they are. And they are to a certain section of the populace. They love that competitive tumbling and aggressive parkour and combative Cirque du Soleil. But to most people, out of the 10 million that used to watch wrestling every fucking Monday night, now we've got a couple million left and a third of that watches their program. To most people... Their little acrobatics and their little sissy ass fucking bullshit is offensive because it's not wrestling. 
And it's not even goddamn pro athletics. It's community theater is in their minds. They're in the real world now. And if they're going to get make big boy money, they ought to have to put their big boy pants on and get in there and work with people that they don't like and aren't friends with and didn't get their jobs for them so that those people will do everything but lick their taint to keep the EVPs happy because they would have never gotten a fucking high paying job in wrestling if it wasn't for being friends with them. And Tony fell for all of that. Nakazawa, Cutlet. With the, I mean, the list goes on. We've been talking about them for four years and all of their various relationships and stoogification. So, Jungle Stooge. Jungle Stooge. It's up to Tony to decide whether he is running a professional sports franchise or a goddamn daycare center where everybody's supposed to be friends. And you know what? If you get in a match with a fucking guy you don't like and he potatoes you, give him a receipt. Unless you're afraid he's going to kick the shit out of you then and know that he can, in which case, take your fucking potato and swallow it. Yeah, the Bulldogs and the Rougeaus worked that Survivor Series match in 88, the last match of the Bulldogs, because the Bulldogs wanted to be paid. They knew if they fucked around, they weren't going to get money. Yeah. The problem is everyone knows you're going to get money if you stay home. You're going to get money if you wrestle. You're going to get money if you only wrestle your friends. You're going to get money if you refuse all creative. <laughs> you just get sent home. If it, oh, in, in one specific case, if you tell the boss, no, I won't punch another one of the boys as soon as I see him, and then you fucking go and see him, and you punch him as soon as you see him, and then you tell people, well, I just told Tony that so he wouldn't <laughs> keep me home. And then Tony said, well, I'm not going to fire you if you punch that guy. I'll just send you home and continue sending you your check. Boy, for that deal, I've, there wouldn't have been a son of a bitch conscious in some locker rooms <laughs> I've been in if they had that deal. You mean I can punch that guy and you're just going to send me home and pay me? Why, he'd have hit the floor quicker than fucking you could hiccup. There's the show. Turn the cameras on in the locker room and institute that rule. Just... <laughs> Chaos would be great. That's the thing. And and I'll 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 wrap it up in a bow with this. I hate to say I told you so, but since I'm right so often, I have to. We've been saying this for four years now. These indie-minded children cannot handle the big leagues or the big time, and they can't get over for the big audience to make the big money, and they're all gonna have nervous breakdowns. And look at what's going on and has been going on. So there you got another case of there you are. Before we wrap up all the CM Punk talk, one more thing, because one of the stories that came out this past week was that Tony Khan wanted CM Punk and Chris Jericho to sit down and talk, hash things out, and find out if there's any way either they can work together or just coexist together. Let me get your thoughts on this initial story. Well, and I believe that because if, you, if you're Tony Khan and you're bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, you know, uh, lollipop guild won't work with your biggest star then who are you going to get to work with your biggest star well the next guy with the next biggest name is chris jericho so maybe there's some attraction there pay-per-view match punk jericho but as you'll recall there's been some ill will between them as well not only I think uh, there's some issues stemming back to when they were in the WWE, but more specifically, as soon as this whole thing happened in September, Jericho immediately tried to side with the kids because, hey, fellow kids, he's become a kid himself. He wanted Punk fired, and then he, he called want, him a oh, cancer. Yeah. yeah, cancer, and you got to be fired. You got to go because he was the Punk. Being there was the guy that was keeping Jericho from being the biggest name. And Punk being there was the guy that was keeping Jericho from not only having the pick of all of the top baby faces that he could work with and drink the adre adrenochrome of and sap the strength of, but also he could never be in the position. And now he's got, a, what, a 10-year contract? Because he was right there to help pick up the pieces and pat Tony on the back and say, don't worry, Tony, Punk screwed you around, but I'll always be here as long as you pay me millions of dollars a year, for the next 10 years until I'm 60-something, I'll be here for you. And just make sure you pay me more then than you do now. So now if Tony is thinking, hey, okay, I'm going to bring Punk back, 
Cape have him against the EVPs, so maybe Punk and Jericho. Well, but now there's trouble. But Jericho, being as he's been in the real wrestling business, and ego it means more to him than feelings. And if he gets in a main event with Punk at a stadium show, that might also draw one of the bigger uh, gates on pay per view that they will ever have. Well, that would just be lovely because all the attention would be on Chris Jericho. And, you know, so, yes, yeah, so he he will be, I'm sure, Jericho more than happy to cross his fingers, put him behind his back, and say, oh, I never meant anything, and come to me, my melancholy baby, and give me a hug, and let's go make money. And I'm sure he'll be willing to, because he's, with him, it's more about ego and also taking care of that 10-year contract at this point than it is the other fucking clown's ego where they don't want to be involved with the guy. Jericho, in his mind, thinks he can hang with Punk and he can be as big a star as Punk, and that might be just wonderful, but I don't know. This might be one of those things. Does Punk think he needs to work with Jericho at this point? So that might be some, uh, some convincing on that side, but I'm sure Jericho would be all for it. See, here's the thing. Jericho has been a major problem in any program that he works with anyone who is young or coming off a period where they're really hot, the fans are really into them. Jericho has a track record over and over again of sapping everything that they had going for them. It's just gone. By the end of it, you're not even dealing with Jericho. You're dealing with Jake Hager and his fucking hat. Yeah. He can't pull that shit with CM Punk. And I've been saying it the last few weeks. Chris Jericho, if he didn't control his own creative, There's something to be done there. And to be very honest, if you need someone in that company to be on the mic, if you're you're going to do something where it's CM Punk playing on all this, it's CM Punk versus the locker room or CM Punk versus the people there who don't like him. And you can't ignore it. You have to play into that. Jericho will be better on the mic than the Bucks and Omega at delivering the argument against Punk. As long as he doesn't get silly, as long as it doesn't turn into a skit this week and a skit next week. And I don't think that would happen with CM Punk. But it would benefit Jericho, sure. But when you really look at the big picture, it may, as long as Jericho is not in charge of the booking, it may be the best thing. But now think about this also, because they've still never told anybody on television where all those guys went or where Punk has That's been true. since. That's actually a very good point. That's so thank- thankfully for them, the entire AEW audience that they have lived their life on the internet and is smart. And I will actually know we proved that when we got eyewitness reports from a couple of the tapings a few weeks after the media scrum, they didn't know why Punk wasn't there. So even their entire audience is not plugged into the internet. Yeah, they still have his merch. His merch is still being sold. But yeah, of course, because, you know, he's a star and they sell his merchandise. He's under contract. He's getting some of that money too. But they would only have to do a very elemental storytelling session to... To bring the shoot that happened to the rest of the world and they could make some money on that punk and jericho haven't had a shoot yet and there would so while their promos would be wonderful against each other and it is two big names still the intrigue of they might really have a fight and you think, and i know jericho leg dive goldberg one time or whatever but do you think he he don't want to fight at this stage of his life i don't blame him i don't think punk really wants to fight either so they're not going to get in a shoot in the middle of the ring but some people may still believe that it'd be too good of an opportunity to pass up for punk to just ground and pound one of the jacksons into a fucking pile of jelly and might just lose himself and do that i'd pay double for that pay-per-view but I, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But they got to tell some kind of story anyway when all these people come back and get involved with each other if they do. A Twitter account, The Pro Wrestling World, tweeted out yesterday, Chris Jericho, and they tagged him, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've always been willing to work with everyone and you always do what's best for business. People are foolish to suggest otherwise. And as a picture of Jericho next to CM Punk on commentary on Rampage, Jericho responded, not everyone. (laughs) 
So what do you think of that? He's willing to work with everyone. Here's a picture of him and Punk, and he responds, quote tweets it, not everyone. Well, yeah, because he's not sure that he'll be able to talk all the uh, involved parties into putting this together, and he doesn't want to make people think that it's going to happen until it's going to happen, and then he wants people to think that it's his idea, and he wants it. There was a separate topic here, but we can go back to all this in a second, but you brought it up, so I want to ask you a question about the Brandon Cutler incident. Brandon Cutler retweeted a Deadspin article, you called it a hit piece, on CM Punk, and wrote, somebody gets it. That tweet wasn't up too long, and he took it down. After everything that's happened, from the very beginning of CM Punk getting there, and some of the issues, of course, involving Colt Cabana, who, in the general scheme of things, means nothing to professional wrestling in 2023, let alone to AEW's business in 2023. Here you have Brandon Cutler doing this. Like we've said and joked about, but it's true, he's only there because he's the Young Bucks bitch. And now this guy is going out there and tweeting something like this. Wasn't this the perfect opportunity for Tony Khan to show people that the games are over? If Tony Khan had fired him for that, because we know it's in violation of the AEW talent playbook, if Tony Khan had said, you know what, you right now, have made this situation worse. I'm sorry, we can't have you here. Would that have helped the situation? Because it would have indicated that Tony's going to finally not be so hands-off? Or would it have hurt the situation? Well, I mean, anything that you do to chastise or penalize or slap on the wrist or punish for their actions, you know, Maddie and Nikki and Kenny, it's going to make the situation worse on their part because they believe that, you know, they're in fantasy land and think that not only are they big stars and important EVPs, but that they're the big shit in that company and that they do no wrong. It, it, I, obviously, Brandon Cutler should be fired on general principle. He should, never should have been hired in the first place. If they could figure out what he does, maybe they could ask him to stop doing it, but nobody really even knows that. But the bigger thing is he wouldn't have done that had he not been instructed to by his, you know, executives, his bosses. He doesn't work for Tony Khan. He works for his grade school friends, Maddie and Nikki. And they couldn't do it, but he could do it. And then they could say, well, we'll make him take it down later. But he got the point across. And Tony allows this to go on. And if you read the, the article, I've known neighbors having a property line dispute that spoke nicer to each other than this alleged author who has nothing to do with the company and so therefore shouldn't really have any inside information because he's not anybody in wrestling. He's just some mark that writes on a site. If he's mad at punk. Maybe his girlfriend had a crush on punk. I don't know what the personal issue is or maybe he's mad because he's got a crush on maddie or nikki whoever wrote this thing i don't know there's some romance involved somewhere for a, a spurned lover to sound like this so that's a, a, yes cutler should be fired because he potentially threw another monkey wrench in tony khan's efforts to bring the biggest star in his company back to work and try, draw some money over the summer. But if Cutlet should be fired, then also Maddie or Nikki or both should be as well because they're obviously the ones that told him to do it because they, th they think, well, well, we'll cover for you. We won't let you get too much heat with Tony. We just can't do it ourselves because it'd be too obvious. We have a little bit of news that's coming out as we're getting ready to release this show, Jim. Should we just talk nonstop and news will break constantly and we never end the program and people can just tune in the live stream until we die? My plan is for us to back ourselves into a daily morning show that'll go for four hours a day. But breaking news. Yeah, I'll, I'll back up on you on that one, but go ahead. Break breaking the news. news. Well, I don't even know if we can call it news, but this is going around right now. With all the talk about CM Punk returning to AEW, and a potential Chicago date and everything else, and a potential Saturday show, AEW Collision, word has now come out that apparently CM Punk 
being included in the new Saturday show was a major part of the picture for Warner Brothers Discovery. Oh. They wanted CM Punk, and Dave Meltzer did some math on his own. And again, wait, wait, wait a minute. Is, have they left him alone again? He's supposed to have somebody with him. That last accident. Well, he wrote this only in Mackerel. He wrote this in the Observer. Well, they had. I'll have you know they had to use Bon Ami on the bathroom floor last time they left him alone. But go ahead. He wrote this about the new show, the new uh, Saturday show. If AEW only makes what Discovery has been paying for first run shows as a general rule, which is five hundred thousand dollars per hour in general, is what they're paying for first run programming. That's fifty two million dollars per year. And that's a game-changing financial deal for AEW. Jesus Christ, $52 million a year to give them a program with CM Punk on it. The $52 million man, CM Punk. Well, now, wait a minute. Hold on here a second. Now, it seems like that now that that little piece of information is being bandied around in the public, well, I think that besides the fact that CM Punk has had a long vacation and that vacation should come to an end for the good of AEW's business for the good of Punk's business should he n I think that that torn peck ought to start bothering him a little bit unless he gets his contract renegotiated cuz they're going to give Tony Khan's AEW 52 million dollars a year for a show contingent on CM Punk being on it and after all the public mudslinging and the fact that Punk, is, his name has been drugged through the mud after he was physically assaulted and his space invaded by the childish and petulant EVPs, shouldn't that be worth a 15% uh, finder's fee on that $52 million? Who's handling his business these days? Years ago, I think it was Mickey Mantle, although I've seen the quote attributed to different people, but I believe Mickey Mantle was asked, once the era of free agency started, once players in baseball started making all that money, they said, what would it be like for you if at your peak, when you played for the New York Yankees, you had to negotiate your contract with George Steinbrenner, considering the kind of years you had and how much money they're paying people today and the value of players? And he said, I'd walk in there and I'd shake his hand. I'd say, hello, partner. <laughs> you got to know your value sometimes, even if it pisses people off. Okay, and, and so coming back down to earth, and I mean, that might be a, a thing that Punk's thinking about at this point, but coming back down to earth, that makes a little bit more sense now with the reports that they were trying to or wanting to or thinking about splitting the roster and putting Punk on, you know, one show or whatever the other guys. I mean, they still, the, the EVPs want to be away from him because they're cowardly little sots and they're all scared of him. But now it comes out that they have not only been sabotaging Tony Khan's efforts to bring back a big star in the wrestling business that may or may not, depending on your viewpoint, have brought significantly larger television viewing numbers to their program or uh, sold a few more pay-per-views or a few more live event tickets or whatever. Now we find out that they have been trying to sabotage the efforts to bring back the one guy that the network stipulates they want to be involved in a new program. So is that not more, I mean, I know that the little buckaroos, little Maddie and Nikki, are right-wing zealots, but uh, are they taking a class in insurrectionism here? Hasn't that, now we find out that what they've been doing with every time that the, we talked about it, what, just on the last program we did, every time that they get wind, I'm sure they get wind even before we get wind, that there's conversations between Tony and Punk or intent to bring him back or some opening of communications. Then all of a sudden something gets leaked from their side or Blandon Cutlet tweets something or agrees with something that inflames the talks and sets them back because they don't want him back. But apparently not only do three or 400,000 of the television viewers want him back, but now the network wants him back for a program that they could gross, that company could gross $50 million in a year on. If I was Tony Khan, I would be telling 
Kenny and Maddie and Nikki to grab their knee pads and fucking do some squats because they're going to be on their knees in front of punk for a long time, whether they need to beg or plead or blow or whatever they need to do to get that man to agree to come back and do whatever the fuck the network wants him to do for $50 million. And if they don't like it, they can hit the fucking bricks. How, how far is this going to go? And by the way, he could still sue for the executives led by the Bucks and Omega and Mega from the number two in the company and the executive vice president storming into the dressing room. There's still plenty that can be done over that, so they just keep playing games, it seems like. Do you, is, is anybody at the network actually following this shit show to understand that the people that work directly under Tony have been the ones trying to run the guy that they want on the program out of the company? Is anybody even paying attention over there? Listen, when AEW started, there were several people that Tony Khan wanted working for him. You know that as well as I do. CM Punk. I'm not, I'm not allowed to say. I carefully crafted my phrase there, but CM Punk was one of those guys. And CM Punk, for whatever reason, said, no, I want to sit back and see how this plays out. So whatever investment mentally the Bucks and Omega and Cody and whoever made in the early days, Punk didn't see it that way. He saw it as something to sit back and let's see how this plays out. Let's monitor the situation. Eventually he comes back and all of these guys that were big deals in their own little world, all of a sudden they're not selling the most merch. All of a sudden their segments aren't getting over the way they used to. Never forget that Young Bucks segment where the fans started chanting FTR. That was game over for FTR, that segment right there. But CM Punk came in there, did all these things, as Tony Khan himself has said, boosted the business, and kept to himself. He didn't go hang out in their locker room or dressing room, whatever you want to call it. Kept to himself. Now, some guys would go and spend time with him. But this is what happens when you don't go and play the game that everyone else is playing backstage. And if a Saturday show, again, it's not as good as Wednesday nights, as you've said several times, but if a Saturday show means a fresh start for some of that crew, where they're not going to have to put up with the backstage games and the drama and the children, then that's a good thing. Who's going to book it? That's the problem. <laughs> the problem, no, and again, and I've even heard some people be complimentary of the new Ring of Honor under Tony. Now, we haven't seen it, but I've heard some people say, how come Dynamite's not as good as that? Which is funny that people would be saying that. But if Tony Well, here's the thing. He has... I'm, I'll, I'll let you finish your thought in a second, but with Ring of Honor, even if it's more complimentary, it's just because he probably has fewer people in Ring of Honor that he will listen to, and at least it's something coming from basically one person instead of a bunch of people that he listens to in AEW doing their own shit, which doesn't fucking match with any of the other shit. Go ahead. So even if Tony's doing a good job at Ring of Honor, which we haven't seen, and we see what Dynamite is, and that's not a good job in any way, but a lot of guys who are strong-willed, or at least will play the game, get their ideas on that show, maybe with some touches of Tony Khan that he thinks, because he thinks he's a booking genius, that he sprinkles on their <laughs> ideas. If the Saturday show is still that, but it's CM Punk in charge of CM Punk segments, if it's maybe FTR not being used like goofs, who knows? CM Punk, though, uh, the one thing to say about his run in AEW, it's a track record now. One year, great segments, great matches, real emotion, fans invested in things. Serious segments in the world of professional wrestling. That's exactly what I think wrestling should be right now. So I'm optimistic for CM Punk because he's proven it for one year that no matter what damage Tony Khan does to the rest of that program, his segments, he's not going to allow the shenanigans. It, it just, that's the problem is that if you have a program with shenanigans, except in one great segment, uh, I just, uh, I think you should have a program with uh, great segments and no shenanigans. And that's not going to happen with Tony Khan. If he's getting a brand new two hour program, if he, if he wants to put a talent roster on that program with CM Punk 
in charge, how about then giving, or the top star giving CM Punk the right to pick two or three people that he might uh, think or believe in that company uh, that he could entrust with putting together a proper television format and letting it be independent of the other program, and then you've got a fair way to see you know, which one is more successful. If it's just, if it's Wednesday night, here is the Wednesday night shit, and Saturday night it's the same kind of, same looking shit as Wednesday night, just with a few different people, but it's still booked by Tony except for the CM Punk segment, which will be good, then <laughs> it needs to be its own program. If it's going to have different talent, it needs to have a different look and a different outlook and different presentation. Different and commentators. Different, and different announcers, yes. That's a big deal. Because well, and Sockface will do everything he can to tank anything that is opposed to the Buckaroos outlook on wrestling, because the only reason that he's the only reason he owns a television now, much less is on television is because of Maddie and Nikki, his childhood friends. I started pro wrestling gorilla. Yeah, of course he did. Yeah. But just cause your breath smells like cheetahs, ain't no sign you're Tarzan. Pal. Oh. Uh, so you can't have an announcer that's going to try to, or wouldn't even understand how, if he was trying to do a good job, he wouldn't understand how to do a wrestling program. He only understands how to do VHS commentary in the basement. So uh, there's a lot of things that need to be worked out for that $50 million. And with that, we end part one of Jim Cornette's CM Punk and AEW Volume 2 Year 2 Omnibus. Go to the next video, the next artwork, the next thumbnail, whatever it may be, and start part two right now.